Section 36 of England, read for LibriVox.org, by Thomas Peter. England, Part 6, Stories of the Age of Richard the Lionhearted, Historical Note. The ideal gentleman of the Middle Ages was the knight. To attain this eminence, a man must as a rule be well born, and he must, as page and squire, be carefully educated in the use of arms, and riding, music, and courtesy. Having completed this course of instruction, he was made a knight with much ceremony, and was then sent out into the world with a blessing of the priest, having vowed to succor all women in distress, to right wrongs, and to maintain and defend the church. There were numerous jousts, or combats, between two, but the great joy of the knight, who wished to show his prowess and do honour to his lady love, was a tournament, or combat between two parties of knights. The invitations were given far in advance, and elaborate preparations were made. When the moment had come, the heralds called out, Come forth, knights, come forth! Then followed a contest with as many rules as the most intricate system of etiquette could furnish. Prizes were given, and the day closed with a ball wherein not the man of highest rank, but he who had shown most valour in the contest, was the hero of the hour. It is for these reasons that the name of Richard I has been surrounded with a blaze of glory. He rebelled against his father, he sold most offices in the gift of the crown, and even freed, for a large sum of money, the Scottish king from his obligations of fealty. He spent a very small portion of his reign in England, but when he went on a crusade and was taken prisoner, his English subjects willingly paid his large ransom, for was he not their idol? A very parfait gentle knight. End of section thirty six. This recording is in the public domain. Section thirty seven of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 9, edited by Eva March Tapton, Section 37, The Tournament of Ashby de la Zouche, about 1194, by Sir Walter Scott. The scene was singularly romantic on the verge of a wood which approached to within a mile of the town of ashby was an extensive meadow of the finest and most beautiful green turf surrounded on one side by the forest and fringed on the other by straggling oak trees some of which had grown to an immense size the ground as if fashioned on purpose for the martial display which was intended sloped gradually down on all sides to a level bottom which was enclosed for the lists with strong palisades forming a space of a quarter of a mile in length and about half as broad the form of the enclosure was an oblong square save that the corners were considerably rounded off in order to afford more convenience for the spectators the openings for the entry of the combatants were at the northern and southern extremities of the lists accessible by strong wooden gates each wide enough to admit two horsemen riding abreast at each of these portals were stationed two heralds attended by six trumpets as many per suivants and a strong body of men-at-arms for maintaining order and ascertaining the quality of the knights who proposed to engage in this martial game on a platform beyond the southern entrance formed by a natural elevation of the ground were pitched five magnificent pavilions adorned with pennons of russet and black the chosen colours of the five knights challengers the cords of the tents were of the same colour before each pavilion was suspended the shield of the knight by whom it was occupied and beside it stood his squire quaintly disguised as a salvage or a sylvan man or in some other fantastic dress according to the taste of his master and the character he was pleased to assume during the game the central pavilion as the place of honour had been assigned to brian de bois gilbert whose renown in all games of chivalry no less than his connection with the knights who had undertaken this passage of arms had occasioned him to be eagerly received into the company of the challengers 
and even adopted as their chief and leader though he had so recently joined them on one side of his tent were pitched those of reginald Front de boeuf and philippe de malvoisin and on the other was the pavilion of hugh de grand Masnil, a noble baron in the vicinity whose ancestor had been lord high steward of england in the time of the conqueror and his son william rufus ralph de vipon a knight of st john of jerusalem who had some ancient possessions at a place called heather near ashby de la azouche occupied the fifth pavilion from the entrance into the lists a gently sloping passage ten yards in breadth led up to the platform on which the tents were pitched it was strongly secured by a palisade on each side and was the esplanade in front of the pavilions and the whole was guarded by men-at-arms the northern access to the list terminated in a similar entrance of thirty feet in breadth at the extremity of which was a large enclosed space for such knights as might be disposed to enter the lists with the challengers behind which were placed tents containing refreshments of every kind for their accommodation with armourers farriers and other attendants in readiness to give their services wherever they might be necessary the exterior of the lists was in part occupied by temporary galleries spread with tapestry and carpets and accommodated with cushions for the convenience of those ladies and nobles who were expected to attend the tournament a narrow space betwixt these galleries and the lists gave accommodation for yeomanry and spectators of a better degree than the mere vulgar and might be compared to the pit of a theatre the promiscuous multitude arranged themselves upon large banks of turf prepared for the purpose which aided by the natural elevation of the ground enabled them to overlook the galleries and obtain a fair view into the lists besides the accommodation which these stations afforded many hundreds had perched themselves on the branches of the trees which surrounded the meadow and even the steeple of a country church at some distance was crowded with spectators it only remains to notice respecting the general arrangement of one gallery in the very centre of the eastern side of the lists and consequently exactly opposite to the spot where the shock of the combat was to take place was raised higher than the others more richly decorated and graced by a sort of throne and canopy on which the royal arms were emblazoned squires pages and yeomen in rich liveries waited around this place of honour which was designed for prince john and his attendants opposite to this royal gallery was another elevated to the same height on the western side of the lists and more gaily if less sumptuously decorated than that destined for the prince himself a train of pages and of young maidens the most beautiful who could be selected gaily dressed in fancy habits of green and pink surrounded a throne decorated in the same colours among pennons and flags bearing wounded hearts burning hearts bleeding hearts bows and quivers and all the commonplace emblems of the triumphs of cupid a blazoned inscription informed the spectators that this seat of honour was designed for la ronde de la beauté et des amours but who was to represent the queen of beauty and of love on the present occasion no one was prepared to guess meanwhile spectators of every description thronged forward to occupy their respective stations and not without many quarrels concerning those which they were entitled to hold some of these were settled by the men-at-arms with brief ceremony the shafts of their battle-axes and pummels of their swords being readily employed as arguments to convince the more refractory others which involved the rival claims of more elevated persons were determined by the heralds or by the two marshals of the field william de Weevil and stephen de martival who armed at all points rode up and down the list to enforce and preserve good order among the spectators gradually the galleries became filled with knights and nobles in their robes of peace whose long and rich tinted mantles were contrasted with the gayer and more splendid habits of the ladies who in a greater proportion than even the men themselves thronged to witness a sport which one would have thought too bloody and dangerous to afford their sex much pleasure the lower and interior space was soon filled by substantial yeomen and burghers and such of the lesser gentry as from modesty poverty or dubious title durst not assume any higher place after the arrival of prince john the herald proclaimed the laws of the tournament which were as follows first the five challengers were to undertake all comers secondly any knight proposing to combat might 
if he pleased select a special antagonist from among the challengers by touching his shield if he did so with the reverse of his lance the trial of skill was made with what were called the arms of courtesy that is with lances at whose extremity a piece of round flat board was fixed so that no danger was encountered save from the shock of the horses and riders but if the shield was touched with the sharp end of the lance the combat was understood to be at outrance that is the knights were to fight with sharp weapons as in actual battle thirdly when the knights present had accomplished their vow by each of them breaking five lances the prince was to declare the victor in the first day's tourney who should receive as prize a war-horse of exquisite beauty and matchless strength and in addition to this reward of valour it was now declared he should have the peculiar honour of naming the queen of love and beauty by whom the prize should be given on the ensuing day fourthly it was announced that on the second day there should be a general tournament in which all the knights present who were desirous to win praise might take part and being divided into two bands of equal numbers might fight it out manfully until the signal was given by prince john to cease the combat the elected queen of love and beauty was then to crown the knight whom the prince should adjudge to have borne himself best in this second day with a coronet composed of thin gold plate cut into the shape of a laurel crown on this second day the knightly games ceased but on that which was to follow feats of archery of bull baiting and other popular amusements were to be practised for the more immediate amusement of the populace in this manner did prince john endeavour to lay the foundation of a popularity which he was perpetually throwing down by some inconsiderate act of wanton aggression upon the feelings and prejudices of the people the lists now presented a most splendid spectacle the sloping galleries were crowded with all that was noble great wealthy and beautiful in the northern and midland parts of england and the contrast of the various dresses of these dignified spectators rendered the view as gay as it was rich while the interior and lower space filled with the substantial burgesses and yeomen of merry england formed in their more plain attire a dark fringe or border around this circle of brilliant embroidery relieving and at the same time setting off its splendour the heralds finished their proclamation with their usual cry of largesse largesse gallant knights and gold and silver pieces were showered on them from the galleries it being a high point of chivalry to exhibit liberality towards those whom the age accounted as once the secretaries and the historians of honour the bounty of the spectators was acknowledged by the customary shouts of love of ladies death of champions honour to the generous glory to the brave to which the more humble spectators added their acclamations and a numerous band of trumpeters the flourish of their martial instruments when these sounds had ceased the heralds withdrew from the lists in gay and glittering procession and none remained within them save the marshals of the field who armed cap a pie sat on horseback motionless as statues at the opposite ends of the lists meantime the enclosed space at the northern extremity of the lists large as it was was now completely crowded with knights desirous to prove their skill against the challengers and when viewed from the galleries presented the appearance of a sea of waving plumage intermixed with glistening helmets and tall lances to the extremities of which were in many cases attached small pennants of about a span's breadth which fluttering in the air as the breeze caught them joined with the restless motion of the feathers to add liveliness to the scene at length the barriers were opened and five knights chosen by lot advanced slowly into the area a single champion riding in front and the other four following in pairs all were splendidly armed and my saxon authority in the wardour manuscript records at great length their devices their colours and the embroidery of their horse trappings it is unnecessary to be particular on these subjects to borrow lines from a contemporary poet who has written but too little the knights are dust and their good swords are rust their souls are with the saints we trust their escutcheons have long moulded from the walls of their castles their castles themselves are but green mounds and shattered ruins the place that once knew them knows them no more nay many a race since theirs has died out and been forgotten in the very land which they occupied with all the authority of feudal proprietors and feudal lords what then would it avail the reader to know their names or the evanescent symbols of their martial rank now however no whit anticipating the oblivion which awaited their names and feats the champions advanced through the lists restraining their fiery steeds and compelling them to move slowly while at the same time they exhibited their paces together with the grace and dexterity of the riders as the procession entered the lists the sound 
of a wild barbaric music was heard from behind the tents of the challengers where the performers were concealed it was of eastern origin having been brought from the holy land and the mixture of the cymbals and bells seemed to bid welcome at once and defiance to the knights as they advanced with the eyes of an immense concourse of spectators fixed upon them the five knights advanced up the platform upon which the tents of the challengers stood and there separating themselves each touched slightly and with the reverse of his lance the shield of the antagonist to whom he wished to oppose himself the lower order of spectators in general nay many of the higher class and it is even said several of the ladies were rather disappointed at the champions choosing the arms of courtesy for the same sort of persons who in the present day applaud most highly the deepest tragedies were then interested in a tournament exactly in proportion to the danger incurred by the champions engaged having intimated their more pacific purpose the champions retreated to the extremity of the lists where they remained drawn up in a line while the challengers selling each from his pavilion mounted their horses and headed by brian de bois gilbert descended from the platform and opposed themselves individually to the knights who had touched their respective shields at the flourish of clarions and trumpets they started out against each other at full gallop and such was the superior dexterity or good fortune of the challengers that those opposed to bois gilbert malvoisin and franc de Berf rolled on the ground the antagonist of grand mesnil instead of bearing his lance point fair against the crest or the shield of his enemy swerved so much from the direct line as to break the weapon athwart the person of his opponent a circumstance which was accounted more disgraceful than that of being actually unhorsed because the latter might happen from accident whereas the former evinced awkwardness and want of management of the weapon and of the horse the fifth knight alone maintained the honour of his party and parted fairly with the knight of st john both splintering their lances without advantage on either side the shouts of the multitude together with the acclamations of the heralds and the clangour of the trumpets announced the triumph of the victors and the defeat of the vanquished the former retreated to their pavilions and the latter gathering themselves up as they could withdrew from the lists in disgrace and dejection to agree with their victors concerning the redemption of their arms and their horses which according to the laws of the tournament they had forfeited the fifth of their number alone tarried in the lists long enough to be greeted by the applauses of the spectators amongst whom he retreated to the aggravation doubtless of his companions mortification a second and a third party of knights took the field and although they had various success yet upon the whole the advantage decidedly remained with the challengers not one of whom lost his seat or swerved from his charge misfortunes which befell one or two of their antagonists in each encounter the spirits therefore of those opposed to them seemed to be considerably damped by their continued success three knights only appeared on the fourth entry who avoiding the shields of bois gilbert and Fond de Berf, contented themselves with touching those of the three other knights who had not altogether manifested the same strength and dexterity this politic selection did not alter the fortune of the field the challengers were still successful one of their antagonists was overthrown and both the others failed in the attaint that is in striking the helmet and shield of their antagonist firmly and strongly with the lance held in a direct line so that the weapon might break unless the champion was overthrown after this fourth encounter there was a considerable pause nor did it appear that any one was very desirous of renewing the contest the spectators murmured among themselves for among the challengers malvoisin and franc de Berf were unpopular from their characters and the others except grand mesnil were disliked as strangers and foreigners the pause in the tournament was still uninterrupted excepting by the voices of the heralds exclaiming love of ladies splintering of lances stand forth gallant knights fair eyes look upon your deeds the music also of the challengers breathed from time to time wild bursts expressive of triumph or defiance while the clowns grudged a holiday which seemed to pass away in inactivity and old knights and nobles lamented in whispers the decay of martial spirit spoke of the triumphs of their younger days but agreed that the land did not now supply dames of such transcendent beauty as had animated the jousts of former times prince john began to talk to his attendants about making ready the banquet and the necessity of adjudging the prize to brian de bois gilbert who had with a single spear overthrown two knights and foiled a third at length as the saracenic music of the challengers concluded one of those long and high flourishes with which they had broken the silence of the lists it was answered by a solitary trumpet which breathed a note of defiance from the northern extremity all eyes were turned to see the new champion 
which these sounds announced and no sooner were the barriers opened than he paced into the lists as far as could be judged of a man sheathed in armour the new adventurer did not greatly exceed the middle size and seemed to be rather slender than strongly made his suit of armour was formed of steel richly inlaid with gold and the device on his shield was a young oak tree pulled up by the roots with the spanish word destichado signifying disinherited he was mounted on a gallant black horse and as he passed through the lists he gracefully saluted the prince and the ladies by lowering his lance the dexterity with which he managed his steed and something of youthful grace which he displayed in his manner won him the favour of the multitude which some of the lower classes expressed by calling out touch ralph de vipon's shield touch the hospitaller's shield he has the least sure seat he is your cheapest bargain the champion moving onward amid these well-meant hints ascended the platform by the sloping alley which led to it from the lists and to the astonishment of all present riding straight up to the central pavilion struck with the sharp end of his spear the shield of bryant de bois gilbert until it rang again all stood astonished at his presumption but none more than the redoubted knight whom he had thus defied to mortal combat and who little expecting so rude a challenge was standing carelessly at the door of the pavilion have you confessed yourself brother said the templar and have you heard mass this morning that you peril your life so frankly i am fitter to meet death than thou art answered the disinherited knight for by this name the stranger had recorded himself in the books of the tourney then take your place in the lists said bois gilbert and look your last upon the sun for this night thou shalt sleep in paradise gramercy for thy courtesy replied the disinherited knight and to requite it i advise thee to take a fresh horse and a new lance for by my honour you will need both having expressed himself thus confidently he reined his horse backward down the slope which he had ascended and compelled him in the same manner to move backward through the lists till he reached the northern extremity where he remained stationary in expectation of his antagonist this feat of horsemanship again attracted the applause of the multitude however incensed at his adversary for the precautions which he recommended brian de bois gilbert did not neglect his advice for his honour was too nearly concerned to permit his neglecting any means which might ensure victory over his presumptuous opponent he changed his horse for a proved and fresh one of great strength and spirit he chose a new and tough spear lest the wood of the former might have been strained in the previous encounters he had sustained lastly he laid aside his shield which had received some little damage and received another from his squires his first had only borne the general device of his rider representing two knights riding upon one horse an emblem expressive of the original humility and poverty of the templars qualities which they had since exchanged for the arrogance and wealth that finally occasioned their suppression bois gilbert's new shield bore a raven in full flight holding in its claws a skull and bearing the motto gare le corbeau when the two champions stood opposed to each other at the two extremities of the lists the public expectation was strained to the highest pitch few augured the possibility that the encounter could terminate well for the disinherited knight yet his courage and gallantry secured the general good wishes of the spectators the trumpets had no sooner given the signal than the champions vanished from their posts with the speed of lightning and closed in the centre of the lists with the shock of a thunderbolt the lances burst into shivers up to the very grasp and it seemed at the moment that both knights had fallen for the shock had made each horse recoil backwards upon its haunches the address of the riders recovered their steeds by use of the bridle and spur and having glared on each other for an instant with eyes which seemed to flash fire through the bars of their visors each made a demi volta and retiring to the extremity of the list received a fresh lance from attendants a loud shout from the spectators waving of scarfs and handkerchiefs and general acclamations attested the interest taken by the spectators in this encounter the most equal as well as the best performed which had graced the day but no sooner had the knights resumed their station than the clamour of applause was hushed into a silence so deep and so dead that it seemed the multitude were afraid even to breathe a few minutes pause having been allowed that the combatants and their horses might recover breath prince john with his truncheon signed to the trumpets to sound the onset the champions a second time sprung from their stations and closed in the centre of the lists with the same speed the same dexterity the same violence but not the same equal fortune as before in this second encounter the templar aimed at the centre of his antagonist's shield 
and struck it so fair and forcibly that his spear went to shivers and the disinherited knight reeled in his saddle on the other hand that champion had in the beginning of his career directed the point of his lance toward bois gilbert's shield but changing his aim almost in the moment of encounter he addressed it to the helmet a mark more difficult to hit but which if attained rendered the shock more irresistible fair and true he hit the norman on the visor where his lance's point kept hold of the bars yet even at this disadvantage the templar sustained his high reputation and had not the girths of his saddle burst he might not have been unhorsed as it chanced however saddle horse and man rolled on the ground under a cloud of dust to extricate himself from the stirrups and fallen steed was to the templar scarce the work of a moment and stung with madness both at his disgrace and at the acclamations with which it was hailed by the spectators he drew his sword and waved it in defiance of his conqueror the disinherited knight sprung from his steed and also unsheathed his sword the marshals of the field however spurred their horses between them and reminded them that the laws of the tournament did not on the present occasion permit this species of encounter we shall meet again i trust said the templar casting a resentful glance at his antagonist and where there are none to separate us if we do not said the disinherited knight the fault shall not be mine on foot or horseback with spear with axe or with sword i am alike ready to encounter thee more and angrier words would have been exchanged but the marshals crossing their lances betwixt them compelled them to separate the disinherited knight returned to his first station and bois gilbert to his tent where he remained for the rest of the day in an agony of despair without alighting from his horse the conqueror called for a bowl of wine and opening the beaver or lower part of his helmet announced that he quaffed it to all true english hearts and to the confusion of foreign tyrants he then commanded his trumpet to sound a defiance to the challengers and desired a herald to announce to them that he should make no election but was willing to encounter them in the order in which they pleased to advance against him the gigantic font de boeuf armed in sable armour was the first who took the field he bore on a white shield a black bull's head half defaced by the numerous encounters which he had undergone and bearing the arrogant motto kawe adsun over this champion the disinherited knight obtained a slight but decisive advantage both knights broke their lances fairly but font de boeuf who lost a stirrup in the encounter was adjudged to have the disadvantage in the stranger's third encounter with sir philip malvoisin he was equally successful striking that baron so forcibly on the cask that the laces of the helmet broke and malvoisin only safe from falling by being unhelmeted was declared vanquished like his companions in his fourth combat with de grand Messinil, the disinherited knight showed as much courtesy as he had hitherto evinced courage and dexterity de grand Mesnil's horse which was young and violent reared and plunged in the course of the career so as to disturb the rider's aim and the stranger declining to take the advantage which this accident afforded him raised his lance and passing his antagonist without touching him wheeled his horse and rode back again to his own end of the lists offering his antagonist by a herald the chance of a second encounter this de grand Mesnil declined avowing himself vanquished as much by the courtesy as by the address of his opponent ralph de Vipon summed up the list of the stranger's triumphs being hurled to the ground with such force that the blood gushed from his nose and his mouth and he was borne senseless from the lists the acclamations of thousands applauded the unanimous award of the prince and marshals announcing that day's honours to the disinherited knight End of section thirty seven this recording is in the public domain section thirty eight of england this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by april six zero nine zero california united states of america the world's story volume nine england edited by eva march tappan section thirty eight the archery contest about eleven ninety four by sir walter scott locksley is the famous outlaw robin hood who has come in disguise to witness the great tournament at ashby de la juche the editor the sound of the trumpets soon recalled those spectators who had already begun to leave the field and proclamation was made that prince john suddenly called by high and peremptory public duties held himself obliged to discontinue 
the entertainments of tomorrow's festival nevertheless that unwilling so many good yeomen should depart without a trial of skill he was pleased to appoint them before leaving the ground presently to execute the competition of archery intended for the morrow to the best archer a prize was to be awarded being a bugle-horn mounted with silver and a silken baldric richly ornamented with the medallion of st hubert the patron of sylvan sport more than thirty yeomen at first presented themselves as competitors several of whom were rangers and underkeepers in the royal forests of needwood and charnwood when however the archers understood with whom they were to be matched upwards of twenty withdrew themselves from the contest unwilling to encounter the dishonour of almost certain defeat for in those days the skill of each celebrated marksman was as well known for many miles round him as the qualities of a horse trained at new market are familiar to those who frequent that well-known meeting the diminished list of competitors for sylvan fame still amounted to eight prince john stepped from his royal seat to view more nearly the persons of these chosen yeomen several of whom wore the royal livery having satisfied his curiosity by this investigation he looked for the object of his resentment whom he observed standing on the same spot and with the same composed countenance which he had exhibited upon the preceding day fellow said prince john i guessed by the insolent babble thou wert no true lover of the longbow and i see thou darest not adventure thy skill among such merry men as stand yonder under favour sir replied the yeoman i have another reason for refraining to shoot besides the fearing discomfiture and disgrace and what is thy other reason said prince john who for some cause which perhaps he could not himself have explained felt a painful curiosity respecting this individual because replied the woodsman i know not if these yeomen and i are used to shoot at the same marks and because moreover i know not how your grace might relish the winning of a third prize by one who has unwittingly fallen under your displeasure prince john coloured as he put the question what is thy name yeoman locksley answered the yeoman then locksley said prince john thou shalt shoot in thy turn when these yeomen have displayed their skill if thou carriest the prize i will add to it twenty nobles but if thou loses it thou shalt be stripped of thy lincoln green and scourged out of the lists with bowstrings for a wordy and insolent braggart and how if i refuse to shoot on such a wager said the yeoman your grace is power supported as it is by so many men-at-arms may indeed easily strip and scourge me but cannot compel me to bend or to draw my bow if thou refusest my fair proffer said the prince the provost of the lists shall cut thy bowstring break thy bow and arrows and expel thee from the presence of as a faint-hearted craven this is no fair chance you put on me proud prince said the yeoman to compel me to peril myself against the best archers of leicestershire and staffordshire under the penalty of infamy if they should overshoot me nevertheless i will obey your pleasure look to him close men-at-arms said prince john his heart is sinking i am jealous lest he attempt to escape the trial and do you good fellows shoot boldly round a buck and a butt of wine are ready for your refreshment in yonder tent when the prize is won a target was placed at the upper end of the southern avenue which led to the lists the contending archers took their station in turn at the bottom of the southern access the distance between that station and the mark allowing full distance for what was called a shot at rovers the archers having previously determined by lot their order of precedence were to shoot each three shafts in succession the sports were regulated by an officer of inferior rank termed the provost of the games for the high rank of the marshals of the lists would have been degraded had they condescended to superintend the sport of the yeomanry one by one the archers stepping forward delivered their shafts yeoman-like and bravely of twenty-four arrows shot in succession ten were fixed in the target and the others ranged so near it that considering the distance of the mark it was accounted good archery 
of the ten shafts which hit the target two within the inner ring were shot by hubert a forester in the service of malvoisin who was accordingly pronounced victorious now locksley said prince john to the bold yeoman with a bitter smile wilt thou try conclusions with hubert or wilt thou yield up bow baldric and quiver to the provost of the sports sith it be no better said locksley i am content to try my fortune on condition that when i have shot two shafts at yonder mark of hubert's he shall be bound to shoot one at that which i shall propose that is but fair answered prince john and it shall not be refused thee if thou dost beat this braggart hubert i will fill the bugle with silver pennies for thee a man can but do his best answered hubert but my grandsire drew a long bow at hastings and i trust not to dishonor his memory the former target was now removed and a fresh one of the same size placed in its room hubert too as victor in the first trial of skill had the right to shoot first took his aim with great deliberation long measuring the distance with his eye while he held in his hand his bended bow with the arrow placed on the string at length he made a step forward and raising the bow at the full stretch of his left arm till the centre or grasping place was nigh level with his face he drew his bowstring to his ear the arrow whistled through the air and lighted within the inner ring of the target but not exactly in the centre you have not allowed for the wind hubert said his antagonist bending his bow or that had been a better shot so saying and without showing the least anxiety to pause upon his aim locksley stepped to the appointed station and shot his arrow as carelessly in appearance as if he had not even looked at the mark he was speaking almost at the instant that the shaft left the bowstring yet it alighted in the target two inches nearer to the white spot which marked the centre than that of hubert by the light of heaven said prince john to hubert and thou suffer that runagut knave to overcome thee thou art worthy of the gallows hubert had but one set speech for all occasions and your highness were to hang me he said a man can but do his best nevertheless my grandsire drew a good bow the foul fiends on thy grandsire and all his generations interrupted john shoot knave and shoot thy best or it shall be the worst for thee thus exhorted hubert resumed his place and not neglecting the caution which he had received from his adversary he made the necessary allowance for a very light air of wind which had just arisen and shot so successfully that his arrow alighted in the very centre of the target a hubert a hubert shouted the populace more interested in a known person than in a stranger in the clout in the clout a hubert for ever thou canst not mend that shot locksley said the prince with an insulting smile i will not to shaft for him however replied locksley and letting his arrow fly with a little more precaution than before it lighted right upon that of his competitor which it split to shivers the people who stood around were so astonished at his wonderful dexterity that they could not even give vent to their surprise in their usual clamour this must be the devil and no man of flesh and blood whispered the yeomen to each other such archery was never seen since a bow was first bent in britain and now said locksley i will crave your grace's permission to plant such a mark as it is used in the north country and welcome every brave yeoman who shall try a shot at it to win a smile from the bonny lass he loves best he then turned to leave the lists let your guards attend me he said if you please i go but to cut a rod from the next willow bush prince john made a signal that some attendants should follow him in case of his escape but the cry of shame shame which burst from the multitude induced him to alter his ungenerous purpose locksley returned almost instantly with a willow wand about six feet in length perfectly straight and rather thicker than a man's thumb he began to peel this with great composure observing at the same time that to ask a good woodsman to shoot at a target so broad as had hitherto been used was to put shame upon his skill for his own part he said and in the land where he is bred men would as soon take for their mark king arthur's round table which held sixty knights around it a child of seven years old he said might hit yonder target with a headless shaft but 
said he walking deliberately to the other end of the lists and sticking the willow wand upright in the ground he that hits that rod at five score yards i call him an archer fit to bear both bow and quiver before he came and it were the stout king richard himself my grandsire said hubert drew a good bow at the battle of hastings and never shot at such a mark in his life and neither will i if this yeoman can cleave that rod i give him the bucklers or rather i yield to the devil that is in his jerkin and not to any human skill a man can but do his best and i will not shoot where i am sure to miss i might as well shoot at the edge of our parson's whittle or at a weed of straw or at a sunbeam as at a twinkling white streak which i can hardly see cowardly dog said prince john sir loxley do thou shoot but if thou hittest such a mark i will say thou art the first men ever did so however it be thou shalt not crow over us with a mere show of superior skill i will do my best as hubert says answered locksley no man can do more so saying he again bent his bow but on the present occasion looked with attention to his weapon and changed the string which he thought was no longer truly round having been frayed a little by the two former shots he then took his aim with some deliberation and the multitude awaited the event in breathless silence the archer vindicated their opinion of his skill his arrow split the willow rod against which it was aimed a jubilee of acclamations followed and even prince john in admiration of locksley's skill lost for an instant his dislike to his person these twenty nobles he said which with the bugle thou hast fairly won are thine own we will make them fifty if thou wilt take livery and service with us as a yeoman of our bodyguard and be near to our person for never did so strong a hand bend a bow or so true an eye direct a shaft pardon me noble prince said locksley but i have vowed that if ever i take service it should be with your royal brother king richard these twenty nobles i leave to hubert who has this day drawn as brave a bow as his grandsire did at hastings had his modesty not refused the trial he would have hit the wand as well as i hubert shook his head as he received with reluctance the bounty of the stranger and locksley anxious to escape further observation mixed with the crowd and was seen no more end of section thirty eight this recording is in the public domain section thirty nine of england this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world's story volume nine england edited by eva march tappan section thirty nine a trial by single combat about eleven ninety four by sir walter scott the jewish maiden rebecca has been accused of witchcraft and condemned to be burned at the stake her one chance of escape is that some one shall act as her champion and win in single contest there was nothing unusual in this decision for trial by combat was a customary method of deciding questions of guilt or innocence another method was the ordeal one form of which was the bearing of hot irons in the naked hands a certain number of paces the accepted belief was that god would grant safety to the innocent the editor at length the drawbridge fell the gates opened and a knight bearing the great standard of the order sallied from the castle preceded by six trumpets and followed by the knight's preceptors two and two the grand master coming last mounted on a stately horse whose furniture was of the simplest kind behind him came brian de bois gilbert armed cap a pied in bright armour but without his lance shield and sword which were borne by his two esquires behind him his face though partly hidden by a long plume which floated down from his barret cap bore a strong and mingled expression of passion in which pride seemed to contend with irresolution he looked ghastly pale 
as if he had not slept for several nights, yet reined his pawing war-horse with the habitual ease and grace proper to the best lance of the Order of the Temple. His general appearance was grand and commanding, but, looking at him with attention, men read that in his dark features from which they willingly withdrew their eyes. On either side rode Conrad of Montfichet and Albert de Malvoisin, who acted as godfathers to the champion. They were in their robes of peace, the white dress of the order. Behind them followed other companions of the temple, with a long train of esquires and pages clad in black, aspirants to the honour of being one day knights of the order. After these neophytes came a guard of warders on foot, in the same sable livery amidst whose partisans might be seen the pale form of the accused, moving with a slow but undismayed step towards the scene of her fate. She was stripped of all her ornaments, lest perchance there should be among them some of those amulets which Satan was supposed to bestow upon his victims, to deprive them of the power of confession, even when under the torture. A coarse white dress of the simplest form had been substituted for her oriental garments. Yet there was such an exquisite mixture of courage and resignation in her look, that even in this garb, and with no other ornament than her long black tresses, each eye wept that looked upon her, and the most hardened bigot regretted the fate that had converted a creature so goodly into a vessel of wrath, and a waged slave of the devil. A crowd of inferior personages belonging to the preceptory followed the victim, all moving with the utmost order, with arms folded, and looks bent upon the ground. This slow procession moved up the gentle eminence, on the summit of which was the tilt-yard, and, entering the lists, marched once around them from right to left, and when they had completed the circle, made a halt. There was then a momentary bustle, while the Grand Master and all his attendants, excepting the champion and his godfathers, dismounted from their horses, which were immediately removed out of the lists by the esquires who were in attendance for that purpose. The unfortunate Rebecca was conducted to the black chair, placed near the pile. On her first glance at the terrible spot where preparations were making for a death alike dismaying to the mind and painful to the body, she was observed to shudder and shut her eyes, praying internally, doubtless, for her lips moved, though no speech was heard. In the space of a minute she opened her eyes, looked fixedly on the pile as if to familiarise her mind with the object, and then slowly and naturally turned away her head. Meanwhile, the Grand Master had assumed his seat, and when the chivalry of his order was placed around and behind him, each in his due rank, a loud and long flourish of the trumpets announced that the court was seated for judgment. Malvoisin, then acting as godfather of the champion, stepped forward and laid the glove of the Jewess, which was the pledge of battle, at the feet of the Grand Master. Valorous lord and reverend father, said he, here standeth the good knight, Brian de Bois-Gilbert, knight preceptor of the Order of the Temple, who, by accepting the pledge of battle which I now lay at your reverence's feet, hath become bound to do his devoir in combat this day, to maintain that this Jewish maiden, by name Rebecca, hath justly deserved the doom passed upon her in a chapter of this most holy order of the Temple of Zion, condemning her to die as a sorceress. Here, I say, he standeth, such battle to do, knightly and honourable, if such be your noble and sanctified pleasure. 
Hath he made oath, said the Grand Master, that his quarrel is just and honourable? Bring forward the crucifix and the te idito. Footnote. Thou, therefore. A book of religious service upon which oaths were taken. End of footnote. Sir and most reverend father, answered Malvoisin readily, our brother here present hath already sworn to the truth of his accusation in the hand of the good knight, Conrad de Montfichet, and otherwise he ought not to be sworn, seeing that his adversary is an unbeliever and may take no oath. This explanation was satisfactory to Albert's great joy, for the wily knight had foreseen the great difficulty, or rather impossibility, of prevailing upon Brian de Bois Gilbert to take such an oath before the assembly, and had invented this excuse to escape the necessity of his doing so. The Grand Master, having allowed the apology of Albert Malvoisin, commanded the herald to stand forth and do his devoir. The trumpets then again flourished, and a herald, stepping forward, proclaimed aloud, Oye, 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 here standeth the good knight, Sir Brian de Bois-Gilbert, ready to do battle with any knight of free blood who will sustain the quarrel allowed and allotted to the Jewess Rebecca to try by champion in respect of lawful essoin of her own body, and to such champion the reverend and valorous Grand Master here present allows a fair field, and equal partition of sun and wind, and whatever else appertains to a fair combat. The trumpets again sounded, and there was a dead pause of many minutes. No champion appears for the appellant, said the Grand Master. Go, Herald, and ask her whether she expects any one to do battle for her in this, her cause. The Herald went to the chair in which Rebecca was seated, and Bois Gilbert, suddenly turning his horse's head toward that end of the lists, in spite of hints on either side from Malvoisin and Montfichet, was by the side of Rebecca's chair as soon as the Herald. Is this regular? and according to the law of combat, said Malvoisin, looking to the Grand Master. Albert de Malvoisin, it is, answered Beau Manoir, for in this appeal to the judgment of God, we may not prohibit parties from having that communication with each other, which may best tend to bring forth the truth of the quarrel. In the meantime, the herald spoke to Rebecca in these terms. Damsel, the Honourable and Reverend the Grand Master demands of thee, if thou art prepared with a champion, to do battle this day in thy behalf, or if thou dost yield thee as one justly condemned to a deserved doom. Say to the Grand Master, replied Rebecca, that I maintain my innocence, and do not yield me as justly condemned, lest I become guilty of mine own blood. Say to him that I challenge such delay as his forms will permit, to see if God, whose opportunity is in man's extremity, will raise me up a deliverer, and when such uttermost space is past, may his holy will be done. The herald retired to carry this answer to the Grand Master. God forbid, said Lucas Beaumanoir, that Jew or pagan should impeach us of injustice. Until the shadows be cast from the west to the eastward, will we wait to see if a champion shall appear for this unfortunate woman. When the day is so far past, let her prepare for death. The herald communicated the words of the Grand Master to Rebecca, who bowed her head submissively, folded her arms, and looking up towards heaven, seemed to expect that aid from above which she could scarce promise herself from man. 
During this awful pause, the voice of Bois Gilbert broke upon her ear. It was but a whisper, yet it startled her more than the summons of the herald had appeared to do. Rebecca, said the Templar, dost thou hear me? I have no portion in thee, cruel, hard-hearted man, said the unfortunate maiden. Aye, but dost thou understand my words, said the Templar, for the sound of my voice is frightful in mine own ears. I scarce know on what ground we stand, or for what purpose they have brought us hither. This listed space, that chair, these faggots, I know their purpose, and yet... It appears to me like something unreal, the fearful picture of a vision which appalls my sense with hideous fantasies, but convinces not my reason. My mind and senses keep touch and time, answered Rebecca, and tell me alike that these faggots are destined to consume my earthly body and open a painful but a brief passage to a better world. Dreams, Rebecca, dreams, answered the Templar. Idle visions rejected by the wisdom of your own wiser Sadducees. Hear me, Rebecca, he said, proceeding with animation. A better chance hast thou for life and liberty than yonder knaves and dotard dream of. Mount thee behind me on my steed, on Zamor, the gallant horse that never failed his rider. I won him in single fight from the soldan of Trebizond. Mount, I say, behind me. In one short hour is pursuit and inquiry far behind. A new world of pleasure opens to thee, to me a new career of fame. Let them speak the doom which I despise and erase the name of Bois-Gilbert from their list of monastic slaves. I will wash out with blood whatever blot they may dare to cast on my scutcheon. Tempter, said Rebecca, be gone. Not in this last extremity canst thou move me one hair's breadth from my resting place, surrounded as I am by foes. I hold thee as my worst and most deadly enemy. Avoid thee in the name of God. Albert Malfoisin, alarmed and impatient at the duration of their conference, now advanced to interrupt it. Hath the maiden acknowledged her guilt? he demanded of Bois Gilbert. Or is she resolute in her denial? She is indeed resolute said Bois Gilbert. Then, said Malvoisin, must thou, noble brother, resume thy place to attend the issue. The shades are changing on the circle of the dial. Come, brave Bois Gilbert, come, thou hope of our holy order, and soon to be its head. As he spoke in this soothing tone, he laid his hand on the knight's bridle, as if to lead him back to his station. False villain, what meanst thou by thy hand on my rein? said Sir Brian angrily. And shaking off his companion's grasp, he rode back to the upper end of the lists. There is yet spirit in him, said Malvoisin apart to Montfichet, were it well directed, but like the Greek fire, it burns whatever approaches it. The judges had now been two hours in the lists, awaiting in vain the appearance of a champion. And reason good, said Friar Tuck, seeing she is a Jewess, and yet by mine order it is hard that so young and beautiful a creature should perish without one blow being struck in her behalf. Were she ten times a witch, Provided she were but the least bit of a Christian, my quarterstaff should ring noon on the steel cap of yonder fierce Templar, ere he carried the matter off thus. It was, however, the general belief 
that no one could or would appear for a Jewess, accused of sorcery. And the knights, instigated by Malvoisin, whispered to each other that it was time to declare the pledge of Rebecca forfeited. At this instant, a knight, urging his horse to speed, appeared on the plain advancing towards the lists. A hundred voices exclaimed, A champion! A champion! And despite the prepossessions and prejudices of the multitude, they shouted unanimously as the knight rode into the tilt-yard. The second glance, however, served to destroy the hope that his timely arrival had excited. His horse, urged for many miles to its utmost speed, appeared to reel from fatigue, and the rider, however undauntedly he presented himself in the lists, either from weakness, weariness, or both, seemed scarce able to support himself in the saddle. To the summons of the herald, who demanded his rank, his name, and purpose, the stranger knight answered readily and boldly, I am a good knight and noble, come hither to sustain with lance and sword the just and lawful quarrel of this damsel, Rebecca, daughter of Isaac of York, to uphold the doom pronounced her to be false and truthless, and to defy Sir Brian de Bois-Gilbert as a traitor, murderer, and liar. As I will prove in this field with my body against his, by the aid of God, of Our Lady, and of Monseigneur St. George, the good knight. The stranger must first show, said Malvoisin, that he is good knight and of honourable lineage. The temple sendeth not forth her champions against nameless men. My name, said the knight, raising his helmet, is better known. My lineage more pure, Malvoisin, than thine own. I am Wilfred of Ivanhoe. I will not fight with thee at present, said the Templar, in a changed and hollow voice. Get thy wounds healed, purvey thee a better horse, and it may be I will hold it worth my while to scourge out of thee this boyish spirit of bravado. Ha! Proud Templar! said Ivanhoe. Hast thou forgotten that twice didst thou fall before this lance? Remember the lists at Acre. Remember the passage of arms at Ashby. Remember thy proud vaunt in the halls of Rotherwood, and the gauge of your gold chain against my reliquary, that thou wouldst do battle with Wilfred of Ivanhoe, and recover the honour thou hadst lost. By that reliquary and the holy relic it contains, I will proclaim thee, Templar, a coward in every court in Europe, in every preceptory of thine order, unless thou do battle without further delay. Poige Wilbert turned his countenance irresolutely towards Rebecca, and then exclaimed, looking fiercely at Ivanhoe, Dog of a Saxon! Take thy lance and prepare for the death thou hast drawn upon thee. Does the Grand Master allow me the combat? said Ivanhoe. I may not deny what thou hast challenged, said the Grand Master, provided the maiden accepts thee as her champion. Yet I would thou wert in better plight to do battle. An enemy of our order hast thou ever been, yet would I have thee honourably met with. Thus, thus I am, and not otherwise, said Ivanhoe. It is the judgment of God. To his keeping I commend myself. Rebecca, said he, riding up to the fatal chair, dost thou accept of me for thy champion? I do, she said, I do fluttered by an emotion which the fear of death had been unable to produce. I do accept thee as the champion whom heaven has sent me, yet, no, no, thy wounds are uncured. Meet not that proud man, 
why shouldst thou perish also? But Ivanhoe was already at his post and had closed his visor and assumed his lance. Why Gilbert did the same, and his esquire remarked as he clasped his visor that his face, which had, notwithstanding the variety of emotions by which he had been agitated, continued during the whole morning of an ashy paleness, was now becoming suddenly very much flushed. The herald then, seeing each champion in his place, uplifted his voice, repeating thrice, Fête for devoir, pre chevalier. Footnote. Do your duty, brave knights. End of footnote. After the third cry, he withdrew to one side of the lists, and again proclaimed that none, on peril of instant death, should dare by word, cry, or action to interfere with or disturb this fair field of combat. The Grand Master, who held in his hand the gauge of battle, Rebecca's glove, now threw it into the lists and pronounced the fatal signal words. Laissez aller! The trumpets sounded, and the knights charged each other in full career. The wearied horse of Ivanhoe and its no less exhausted rider went down, as all had expected, before the well-aimed lance and vigorous steed of the Templar. This issue of the combat all had foreseen. But although the spear of Ivanhoe did but, in comparison, touch the shield of Bois Gilbert, that champion, to the astonishment of all who beheld it, reeled in his saddle, lost his stirrups, and fell in the lists. Ivanhoe, extricating himself from his fallen horse, was soon on foot, hastening to mend his fortune with his sword, but his antagonist arose not. Wilfred, placing his foot on his breast, and the sword's point to his throat, commanded him to yield him or die on the spot. Bois Gilbert returned no answer. Slay him not, Sir Knight, cried the Grand Master, unshriven and unabsolved. Kill not body and soul. We allow him vanquished. He descended into the lists and commanded them to unhelm the conquered champion. His eyes were closed. The dark red flush was still on his brow. As they looked on him in astonishment, the eyes opened, but they were fixed and glazed. The flush passed from his brow and gave way to the pallid hue of death. Unscathed by the lance of his enemy, he had died a victim to the violence of his own contending passions. This is indeed the judgment of God, said the Grand Master, looking upwards. Fiat voluntas tua. Footnote. Thy will be done. End of footnote. When the first moments of surprise were over, Wilfred of Ivanhoe demanded of the Grand Master, as judge of the field, if he had manfully and rightfully done his duty in the combat. Manfully and rightfully hath it been done, said the Grand Master. I pronounce the maiden free and guiltless. The arms and body of the deceased knight are at the will of the victor. End of section 39. Recording by Jane Bennett. Section 40 of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 9, England, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 40, Robin Hood and Little John, latter part of the 12th century. Whether Robin Hood was a real person or not, he figures in English history as a man outlawed for shooting the king's deer. 
He and his friends love the free life of the forest, and they are eager to help those who are in need. The many ballads about Robin and his men and their numerous pranks were composed to please the common folk, and they represent the feelings of the English in the early years of their forced submission to Norman rule. The Editor When Robin Hood was about twenty years old, with a hay down, down and a down, he happened to meet Little John, a jolly brisk blade, right fit for the trade, for he was a lusty young man. Though he was called little, his limbs they were large, and his stature was seven foot high. Wherever he came, they quaked at his name, for soon he would make them to fly. How they came acquainted, I'll tell you in brief, if you will but listen a while. For this very jest, amongst all the rest, I think it may cause you to smile. Bold Robin Hood said to his jolly bowmen, Pray tarry you here in this grove, and see that you all observe well my call, while through the forest I rove. We've had no sport for these fourteen long days, therefore now abroad will I go. Now should I be beat, and cannot retreat, my horn I will presently blow. Then did he shake hands with his merry men all, and bid them at present good-bye. Then, as near a brook his journey he took, a stranger he chanced to espy. They happened to meet on a long narrow bridge, and neither of them would give way. Quoth bold Robin Hood, and sturdily stood, I'll show you right Nottingham play. With that from his quiver an arrow he drew, a broad arrow with a goose wing. The stranger replied, I'll liquor thy hide, if thou offest to touch the string. Quoth bold Robin Hood, thou dost prate like an ass, for were I to bend but my bow, I could send a dart quite through thy proud heart, before thou couldst strike me one blow. Thou talk'st like a coward, the stranger replied, well armed with the long bow you stand, to shoot at my breast while I, I protest, have naught but a staff in my hand. The name of a coward, quoth Robin, I scorn, wherefore my long bow I'll lay by, and now for thy sake a staff will I take, the truth of thy manhood to try. Then Robin Hood stepped to a thicket of trees, and chose him a staff of ground oak. Now this being done, away he did run to the stranger, and merrily spoke. Lo, see my staff, it is lusty and tough. Now here on the bridge we will play. Whoever falls in, the other shall win the battle. And so we'll away. With all my whole heart, the stranger replied, I scorn in the least to give out. This said, they fell to it without more dispute, and their staffs they did flourish about. And first Robin he gave the stranger a bang so hard that it made his bones ring. The stranger, he said, this must be repaid, I'll give you as good as you bring. So long as I'm able to handle my staff, to die in your debt, friend, I scorn. Then two at each goes, and followed their blows, as if they had been threshing of corn. The stranger gave Robin a crack on the crown, which caused the blood to appear. Then Robin, enraged, more fiercely engaged, and followed his blows more severe. So thick and so fast did he lay it on him with a passionate fury and ire. At every stroke he made him to smoke, as if he had been all on fire. Oh, then into fury the stranger he grew, and gave him a damnable look and with it a blow that laid him full low, and tumbled him into the brook. I prithee, good fellow, oh, where art thou now? The stranger in laughter he cried. Quoth bold Robin Hood, good faith, in the flood, and floating along with the tide, I needs must acknowledge thou art a brave soul, with thee I'll no longer contend. For needs must, I say, thou hast got the day, our battle shall be at an end. Then unto the bank he did presently wade, and pulled himself out by a thorn. 
which done at the last he blowed a loud blast straightway on his fine bugle horn the echo of which through the valleys did fly at which his stout bowman appeared all clothed in green most gay to be seen so up to their master they steered oh what's the matter quoth william stutely good master you're wet to the skin no matter quoth he the lad which you see in fighting hath tumbled me in he shall not go scot-free the others replied so straight they were seizing him there to duck him likewise but robin hood cries he's a stout fellow forbear there's no one shall wrong thee friend be not afraid these bowmen upon me do wait there's threescore and nine if thou wilt be mine thou shalt have my livery straight and other accoutrement fit for a man speak up jolly blade never fear i'll teach you also the use of the bow to shoot at the fat fellow deer oh here is my hand the stranger replied i'll serve you with all my whole heart my name is john little a man of good metal ne'er doubt me for i'll play my part his name shall be altered quoth william stutely and i will his godfather be prepare then a feast and none of the least for we will be merry quoth he they presently fetched in a brace of fat does with humming strong liquor likewise they loved what was good so in the green wood this pretty sweet babe they baptize he was i must tell you but seven foot high and maybe an l in the waist a pretty sweet lad much feasting they had bold robin the christening graced with all his bowmen which stood in a ring and were of the nottingham breed brave stutely comes then with seven yeomen and did in this manner proceed this infant was called john little quoth he which name shall be changed anon the words we'll transpose so wherever he goes his name shall be called little john they all with a shout made the elements ring so soon as the office was o'er to feasting they went with true merriment and tippled strong liquor galore then robin he took the pretty sweet babe and clothed him from top to the toe in garments of green most gay to be seen and gave him a curious long bow thou shalt be an archer as well as the best and range in the greenwood with us where we'll not want gold nor silver behold while bishops have aught in their purse we live here like squires or lords of renown without air a foot of free land we feast on good cheer with wine ale and beer and everything at our command then music and dancing did finish the day at length when the sun waxed low then all the whole train the grove did refrain and unto their caves they did go and so ever after as long as he lived although he was proper and tall yet nevertheless the truth to express still little john they did him call end of section 40 read by jane bennett section 41 of england this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia as the narrator. Jim Locke as Hubert. Devora Allen as first executioner. And Thomas Peter as Arthur. The World Story, Volume 9, England. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 41 prince arthur and the keeper hubert about twelve hundred by william shakespeare the following scene from shakespeare's king john shows how one of john's attempts to get rid of his little nephew was foiled by the kindness and daring of the keeper hubert the editor a room in a castle 
enter hubert and executioners heat me these irons hot and look thou stand within the arras when i strike my foot upon the bosom of the ground rush forth and bind the boy which you shall find with me fast to the chair be heedful hence and watch i hope your warrant will bear out the deed uncleanly scruples fear not you look to it exeunt executioners young lad come forth i have to say with you enter arthur good morrow hubert good morrow little prince as little prince having so great a title to be more prince as may be you are sad indeed i have been merrier mercy on me methinks nobody should be sad but i yet i remember when i was in france young gentlemen would be as sad as night only for wantonness by my christendom so i were out of prison and kept sheep i should be as merry as the day is long and so i would be here but that i doubt my uncle practises more harm to me he is afraid of me and i of him is it my fault that i was geoffrey's son no indeed it is not and i would to heaven i were your son so you would love me hubert hubert aside if i talk to him with his innocent prate he will awake my mercy which lies dead therefore i will be sudden and dispatch are you sick hubert you look pale to-day in sooth i would you were a little sick that i might sit all night and watch with you i warrant i love you more than you do me hubert aside his words do take possession of my bosom read here young arthur showing a paper aside how now foolish room turning dispiteous torture out of door i must be brief lest resolution drop out at mine eyes in tender womanish tears can you not read it is it not fair writ too fairly hubert with so foul effect must you with hot irons burn out both mine eyes young boy i must and will you and i will have you the heart when your head did but ache i knit my handkerchief about your brows the best i had a princess wrought at me and i did never ask at you again and with my hand at midnight held your head and like the watchful minutes to the hour still and anon cheered up the heavy time saying what lack you and where lies your grief or what good love may i perform for you many a poor man's son would have lain still and ne'er have spoke a loving word to you but you at your sick service had a prince nay you may think my love was crafty love and call it cunning do and if you will if heaven be pleased that you must use me ill why then you must will you put out mine eyes these eyes that never did nor never shall so much as frown on you i have sworn to do it and with hot irons must i burn them out <sighs> none but in this iron age would do it the iron of itself though heat red hot approaching near these eyes would drink my tears and quench his fiery indignation even in the matter of mine innocence nay after that consume away in rust but for containing fire to harm mine eye are you more stubborn hard than hammered iron and if an angel should have come to me and told me hubert should put out mine eyes i would not have believed him no tongue but hubert's come forth stamps re-enter executioners with a cord irons etc do as i bid you do save me hubert save me my eyes are out even with the fierce looks of these bloody men give me the iron i say and bind him here alas what need you be so boisterous rough i will not struggle i will stand stone still for heaven's sake hubert let me not be bound nay hear me hubert drive these men away and i will sit as quiet as a lamb i will not stir nor wince nor speak a word nor look upon the iron angrily thrust by these men away and i'll forgive you whatever torment you do put me to go stand within 
let me alone with him i am best pleased to be from such a deed exeunt executioners alas i then have chid away my friend he hath a stern look but a gentle heart let him come back that his compassion may give life to yours come boy prepare yourself is there no remedy none but to lose your eyes oh heaven there were but a mote in yours a grain a dust a gnat a wandering hair any annoyance in that precious sense then feeling what small things are boisterous there your vile intent must needs seem horrible is this your promise go to hold your tongue hubert the utterance of a brace of tongues must needs want pleading for a pair of eyes let me not hold my tongue let me not hubert or oh, hubert if you will cut out my tongue so i may keep mine eyes oh, spare mine eyes though to no use but still to look on you though by my troth the instrument is cold and would not harm me i can heed it boy no in good sooth the fire is dead with grief being created for comfort to be used in undeserved extremes see us yourself there is no malice in this burning coal the breath of heaven hath blown his spirit out and strewed repentant ashes on his head but with my breath i can revive it boy and if you do you will but make it blush and glow with shame of your proceedings hubert nay it perchance will sparkle in your eyes and like a dog that is compelled to fight snatch at his master that doth tar him on all things that you should use to do me wrong deny their office only you do lack that mercy which fierce fire and iron extends creatures of note for mercy lacking uses well see to live i will not touch thine eye for all the treasure that thine uncle owes yet am i sworn and i did propose boy with this same very iron to burn them out now you look like hubert all this while you were disguised peace no more adieu your uncle must not know but you are dead i'll fill these dogged spies with false reports and pretty child sleep doubtless and secure that hubert for the wealth of all the world will not offend thee oh heaven i thank you hubert silence no more go closely in with me much danger do i undergo for thee exeunt end of section forty one this recording is in the public domain section forty two of england this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 9, England, edited by Eva March Tappan, Section 42, Friar Bacon's Brazen Head, 13th Century, by Abby Sage Richardson friar bacon was an english scientist and science in the thirteenth century was a dangerous calling whatever men did not understand was looked upon as witchcraft and the punishment for witchcraft was severe and prompt this learned student is believed to have known how to make gunpowder and to have understood the principles of the telescope indeed he was two or three centuries ahead of his times and he was fortunate to have escaped with no worse penalty for his superior knowledge than persecution and imprisonment the making of a brazen head with the power of speech was ascribed to several philosophers of the olden days but the work of friar bacon is most famous of them all the following story is a paraphrase of a play written by robert green the english dramatist the editor in a vast and ancient room whose appliances denoted the abode of the scholar and philosopher sat the learned and famous friar roger bacon 
beside him a dusty table was thickly strewn with scrolls of parchment rich with age and erudition while a large chest heavily barred and bolted was filled with other treasures in manuscript each worth more than its weight in virgin gold at the farther end of the room a vast chimney with smoky furnaces and crucibles containing crude and half smelted ores and all the various properties of the alchemist occupied one side of the apartment in one corner a huge iron mortar shielded by screens of metal from contact with any spark which might fly from the furnaces was filled with an inodorous mixture of brimstone and saltpetre and a black dust which looked like powdered charcoal everywhere on floor and table stood such rude instruments to aid in chemistry and astronomy as the time afforded while all about were such evidences of work and study as made the place seem as much like the work shop of the artisan as the library of the scholar stretched across the upper end of the apartment a heavy green curtain fell in broken folds over some object which it was intended to conceal before this curtain sat the great necromancer of whose art all england spoke in whispered wonder and with bated breath the learned friar bacon of oxford no longer an inmate of the college from whose walls his suspected magic had caused him to be driven forth he dwelt solitary among the surrounding rustics who feared and shunned him and in secret wrought those mysterious works which made him dreaded among men he was now only a little past middle life a man of commanding figure and noble head which seemed heavy with the weight of knowledge it carried and now dropped wearily upon his hands as he sat steeped in thought his reverie was broken by the entrance of his servant miles the only retainer he could keep about him a half-witted faithful fellow who clung gratefully to the hand which fed him i cry you mercy good master said miles hastily entering but i could not stay upon ceremony a lord is without the door asking entrance to you it is a fellow in a scarlet coat and wonderful fine otherwise he declares that he is from oxford and will have speech with you and although i said nobody could enter he will come in whether i will or no at which i fearing he might be the evil one himself took to my heels to tell thee about him let him come in answered the friar roused by the servant's long speech from his deep abstraction it is clement the cardinal the pope's legate to england stay miles throw a cloth over the pile of manuscripts yonder pull out that curtain straight now give me the book of the gospels it is enough show the cardinal hither a moment later and the cardinal clement himself the next successor to the papal throne entered the apartment well friar at last we have found your secret hiding-place it is no easy journey hither and the road is as hard and narrow as that which leads to paradise i am sorry for the trouble your lordship took in coming and should have been happy if it might have been spared you which means so i take it good friar that you are not glad at my coming but believe me i come with no evil intent nor for anything except friendship i know how they have treated thee at oxford and in good earnest i have been always sorry for it learning is not so plenty that it should be put down and from what i know of thy wonderful inventions they are not those that the devil teaches his followers but always of good service to the cause of truth and the true church i pray thee do not distrust my motive i come in friendly guise unattended as thou seest and with no desire but to be instructed in some of thy magic discoveries and see what they may avail to science my discoveries are not answered the friar still keeping up the reserved manner he had worn since the entrance of his visitor thou hast heard of the magic powder which has so frighted the learned magnates of the college that they drove me outside their walls it is but a composition of simple substances which without any magic art when touched with a spark will give forth a semblance of lightning and thunder if thou wishest i can in a few minutes show thee the secret of it no no good friar returned the cardinal shrinking away a little uneasily from the mortar in the corner which bacon approached i trust thy word and i am no fool to believe stories of any wizard's craft but there is another matter of which i come to inquire of thee thou hast a huge head they tell me 
of which thou makest a familiar that tells thee strange secrets and foretells events that can affect the fate of nations tell me of this on the faith of a priest and a gentleman i ask but for love of science and here the priest's voice sank lower thou hast heard that pope urban grows feeble it is in all men's mouths in rome that the cardinal legate of england will be the next high pontiff of the church i trust thy honour in telling this and tell thee also that if clement of narbonne be made the holy father of the church it will be his first mission to do away with the narrow bigotry regarding science and with his own royal hand confer honours on those who make learning their mistress now do you trust my friendship good friar bacon my lord cardinal i do trust you answered bacon whose keen eye had closely scanned the features of the priest while he had spoken but it becometh us men of letters to be mistrustful we remember that many who were not heretics have been invited into the presence of the inquisition and have not returned from thence but i trust your word and i will betray to you my mystery rising hastily the friar drew aside the green curtain which had hitherto concealed some object from the view the cardinal turned to face it and then stepped back awestruck at the sight which the withdrawing of the drapery revealed placed on a rude pedestal which stood several feet above the floor stood a massive brazen head with grand impassive face and an expression of such dignified grandeur such commanding repose that it was as if the haughty features of some grecian god had been revealed to the awestruck gaze of the cardinal as he gazed from the deep-set but luminous eyes true jovine lightning seemed to issue and a deep rumbling sound like distant thunder shook the floor on which they stood the legate involuntarily crossed himself and then looking at bacon who slowly dropped the curtain which concealed the head he asked in a half whisper is this thy work mine and one other cherished brother in science master bungay of oxford answered the monk this is the slow work of seven years my lord cardinal and as thou mayest guess wrought for no common purpose this head is formed with utmost care and skill by direction which i found writ out in parchments more ancient than the church we worship if my work have no flaw when all is done this head will speak and tell me how i may encircle my england with a wall of brass which now and hereafter will hold her invulnerable to the assaults of all enemies think of such a feat said bacon his face glowing with enthusiasm is it not worth my work to leave my name on such a monument to my country's greatness truly good friar answered clement a little coldly i doubt whether it be for the good of our mother church and her power over the nations which are gathered under her wings to have one of her children so walled about but for thy good intentions i do not doubt them and for thy learning i have nothing but respect no doubt thy brazen head if perchance it should ever speak will tell thee other wondrous things thou shalt not repent if thou lettest me have such advantage as may come of its teachings but i confess i should not like to see this little island so girt with brass suppose she might then take it into her head to defy papal authority as armed with such power she might you reckon impossibilities my lord exclaimed bacon in so impious a case the wall which should guard england from enemies would topple down to crush her i pray thee put such a charm as that into thy conjurations good friar said clement rising to depart but whatever betide count on me as thy patron and remember that in telling thee of my ambition i have left my secret in thy keeping as thine lies in my hands fare thee well my son peace remain with thee and with a gesture of blessing the cardinal left the apartment it was night and in friar bacon's study the faint gleam of one solitary rushlight made the deep shadows which lurked in every corner more apparent and more awful the curtains which screened the head were withdrawn and it loomed up in the dimness to a gigantic size bending over the table on which the little candle burned with a manuscript spread out before him sat friar bacon his face worn and pinched as of one who suffers for want of repose and proper nourishment the marks upon the hour-glass beside him showed that it had been turned six times since sunset and the sands of the last hour before midnight were swiftly slipping through the glass ever and anon the friar took up the little timekeeper and shook it gently as if to hasten the passage of the slow hours 
and often amid his watching and study his head sank lower and lower towards the table as if tired nature would assert her rights and steep him in the sweet oblivion of sleep against his own powerful will all at once he started up and striking a cymbal with a little silver hammer he waited till the summons was answered by his servant miles who came in sleepily rubbing his eyes that he might be sufficiently awake to answer his master the friar sat earnestly regarding miles till he had rubbed and stretched himself awake are you ready to do me a great service miles he asked at length when the serving-man's attention had been riveted by his own fixed gaze anything which thou canst ask good master returned miles except it be to go on errands to the evil one that i would rather excuse myself from such service as i require has no such conditions listen miles thou seest the head yonder miles looked cautiously over his shoulder at the awful presence and nodded assent thou knowest that for nine and thirty nights friar bungay and i have watched by day and night waiting to hear that which soon or late its lips are sure to utter if it should speak and its speech be unheeded woe betide the makers and woe betide our hopes of encircling our fair country with a wall which will make her for ever invincible to-night i have waited for friar bungay till my eyelids are heavy and i would fain take a brief rest but i dare not leave the head unguarded lest in my sleep it should utter that which i must heed can i trust you to wait here in my sleep and if the head gives signs of speech to wake me suddenly that i may follow its magical instruction it is but for an hour or two and then i will again resume my watch i will watch here as bravely as if i never knew what fear meant good master answered miles i warrant the head will do me no harm and i will repeat so many aves and paters that not a foul fiend will venture to come near me so good night and to sleep let me but get my trusty stave which sets without that i may arm myself if any one enter to do me any hurt and in a trice i will be here to guard thy wondrous handiwork so saying miles brought in a huge bludgeon which he carried on his shoulder in true soldierly fashion the friar rose and pouring a small glass of strong liquor from a flask he handed it to miles saying drink that it will keep thee from growing timorous in thy watch remember that on thy wakefulness rests all my hopes and that a moment's slumber may wreck them good night and benedicite thus saying the friar who could hardly speak from weariness passed through the door which led into a small inner chamber where he slept miles was doubly brave from the effect of the potent liquor the friar had given him which now seemed to course through his veins like a swift serpent of flame he glanced defiantly at the head which hitherto he had only regarded with profound awe withdrawing himself as far as possible from the mortar in which he knew his master was wont to mix the terrible powder whose production had branded him as one in league with satan he sat down near the brazen image to wait for any event which would break up the tedium of his watch the minutes before midnight moved slowly on and the last sands were dropping through the glass already in the adjoining chamber the heavy breathing of the friar told how quickly sleep had seized upon his weary senses sleep away good master said miles approvingly i will take as good care of matters here as if thou wert broad awake for my own part i see little sense in so much watching of a head which for aught we know was made out of an old kettle or a pair of battered helmets as for my master wise as he is he must have a crack in his headpiece else instead of starving me and himself on bread crusts and spring water he would call to his aid some of the brief spirits his art can command and order good smoking hot meats and wine as good as the king uses and have rich raiment and soft beds instead of a such poor accommodation as he keeps now if thou canst tell him anything to better his conditions good master brazen pate went on miles looking up at the gloomy features which in the dim light seemed to frown upon him do so and i'll set thee up for an oracle as he spoke these last words a low sound of thunder muttered through the room and shook gently the pedestal on which the head rested a single flash of light lit up the immovable features for one brief instant and from the lips a voice scarcely louder than a whisper yet distinctly audible uttered the words time is is that the beginning of your speech old brazen nose said miles coolly regarding the head as if it were the most natural thing in the world for it to speak thus go on i pray thee and let me hear if thou intendest to say anything worth noting 
i will not wake my master for so slight a matter as that thou hast just announced time is forsooth as if that would be news to any such scholar as friar bacon thou hadst best speak sense if thou wouldst have him listen to thee again the thunder muttered but louder than at first again the lightning gleamed over the impassive features and the voice murmured time was on my life said miles scornfully to think that my master and his friend should spend seven good years in making a head which says no more wonderful thing than any fishmonger could tell us time was i am but a fool and i hope i know as much as that why not say something in greek or latin or any of the learned tongues that master bacon knows as well as he knows his breviary or if thou canst speak nothing but common english tell us something more strange than this thus think i shall wake up my master to no better entertainment of conversation than thou hast offered him out upon thee for a braggart that promisest by thy looks more than thy tongue can ever perform for thee while he was speaking a sudden light lit up the head with a brightness like that of day the terrible features wore a frown so dreadful that the glance struck dismay to the heart of the swaggering miles as he stood motionless with awful accent and in a voice of thunder the head cried out time is past then came a lightning flash so vivid that the serving-man fell prone to earth and with a fearful crash the grand head fell a shattered mass of fragments without shape or semblance amidst the dire noise friar bacon started up and rushed to his doorway at his feet was the work of seven years a blasted ruin grovelling among the fragments lay the wretched miles uttering loud screams of fear peace fool commanded the friar raising him to his feet silence and tell me how this happened did the head speak ay sir he spake answered miles blubbering loudly but he said naught worth noting didst thou not say it would utter strange words of learning yet it said at first only two words what words why at first it said time is and i knowing that was no news of consequence waited for something better before i woke thee again it said time was and then with a loud cry it said time is past and toppled over giving my head many a hard bump with the fragments wretch idiot villain cried the friar seizing the frightened man as if he would have strangled him thy foolishness has cost me the work of years the hopes of a lifetime no words can reveal what thy idiocy has lost me but go leave my sight miserable vagabond i could kill myself in shame for having trusted thee and releasing his hold of miles the friar sank into a chair and buried his face in his hands it is the last he murmured henceforth i bid farewell to magic from this moment i will close my study and burn my books hereafter only to religion will i devote myself and dying i shall leave not even my poor name to add to my country's glory End of section forty two Section forty three of England read for LibriVox dot org by Jane Bennett. The Later Plantagenet Kings. Historical note: The Great Charter had done much for the freedom of the English, but the barons and prelates still made up the council. The extravagance and falseness of Henry the Third, twelve sixteen to twelve seventy two brought into life a strong party pledged for popular rights. Earl Simon de Montfort was its leader. In 1265, he forced the king to issue writs for a parliament, to which two knights from each shire, and also two representatives from each city and borough were summoned. This was the first representative parliament, the beginning of the House of Commons. Civil war arose, and in the Battle of Evesham, de Montfort was slain. His ideas, however, lived, and during the following reign, that of Edward I, 1272 to 1307, what was known as the Model Parliament was formed. Edward III, who came to the throne in 1327, laid claim to the crown of France, and thus England became involved in the Hundred Years' War. In order to get money for this war and for the Crusades, many privileges were granted to towns. The scarcity of labour brought about by the Black Death, a terrible plague which is said to have swept away half the population of England, increased its value, 
and the success of the omen in the war showed them the needlessness of their dependence upon the knights for protection. Throughout the land there was dissatisfaction and discontent. There was also a longing for the religious aid and comfort which the prelates of the church had often failed to make manifest. A reformer arose, John Wycliffe. He instituted an order of poor priests, whose work it was to go about through the land, preaching to the poor. Wycliffe's democratic teachings were believed to be responsible in part for the Peasants' Revolt of 1381, which is said to have been punished by the execution of some 1,500 persons. Wycliffe himself died peacefully in 1384, but his followers, the Lollards as they were called, suffered severe persecution. End of section 43. This recording is in the public domain. Section 44 of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 9. England, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 44. The Battle of Evesham, 1265, by G. P. R. James. It was about one o'clock on the 4th of August, 1265, when Simon de Montfort, having the king upon his right hand, with Lord Le Despincet, the high justiciary on the monarch's right, the Earl of Monthermer and Lord Ralph Bassett on his own left, and some four or five and twenty knights and gentlemen following close upon his steps, rode out from the highway leading from Evesham to Alcester upon that ever-renowned plain where the truncheon of power was to be wrested from his grasp for ever. The country was for the most part open, but there was a little wood and some rising ground to the right, a rivulet running along across the patch of common land which the road now traversed, and a cultivated field with its hedgerows on the left. About a quarter of a mile from the point at which the highway issued from between the banks was a stone post, marking the spot where three roads, coming down from some slight hills in front, met and united in the one along which de Montford had marched from Evesham. For nearly the same distance beyond, these roads might be seen crossing the common, and then, plunging amongst woods and hedges, they ascended the gentle slope opposite. The day was not so fine as the preceding one. Clouds were gathering in the sky. The air was heavy and oppressive. The horses, either languid or impatient, and everything announced that the sun would go down in storms. A small advance guard had been sent forward to reconnoitre the country in front, and the head of the column of the army was about a hundred yards behind the general and his companions. But no detachment had been on this, as on the preceding day, thrown out to examine the fields to the left of the line of march. De Montfort's brow was calm and serene. He hoped, ere many hours were over, to unite his forces to those of his eldest son, and then, turning upon his enemy, to terminate the contest at a blow. Ere he had reached the stone at the crossing of the roads, however, three or four horsemen at headlong speed came down from the rising ground in front, and in a moment after the whole advance guard were seen in full retreat. "'What is this?' asked de Montfort, spurring on his horse to meet the first of the men-at-arms who were approaching. What news bring you in such haste? My lord, there is a mighty power coming down upon you, cried the man. We saw them from the edge of the slope beyond. Full twenty thousand men. Did you see their banners? demanded de Montfort. No, answered the messenger. There were banners in plenty, but I marked not what they were. 
You are speedily alarmed, said the earl in a cold tone. Hugh de Montferma, he proceeded, speaking to the young lord who was close behind. Gallop up that hill there to the right and bring us word what your keen eyes can see. I will ride on to the other slope and judge for myself. Hugh was away in a moment, and de Montfort continued, turning in the saddle, My kind friend Montferma, my good lord Ralph, I beseech you, array the men as they issue forth from between the banks. Those that are coming must be the forces of my son from Kenilworth, but it is as well to be prepared. My lord de Despins, I leave you to entertain his majesty. I will be back directly. Some of you gentlemen follow me. And spurring on at full speed, he crossed the little rivulet and ascended the first slope of the ground beyond. He there paused for some minutes, watching attentively the country before him, through which, upon the left-hand road, was advancing a large body of men under numerous banners. At length he seemed satisfied, turned his horse, and rode back at an easy canter to the spot where the old Earl of Montferma and Lord Ralph Bassett were arraying the spearmen, archers, and crossbowmen, who had by this time come forth upon the common, while the men-at-arms were only beginning to appear, taking up a position behind the infantry. It is as well, said de Bontford, speaking as they returned, to one of the gentlemen who had followed him, it is as well to put them in array, for we shall halt here for an hour, while the men refresh themselves. You saw those banners? Yes, my lord, replied the knight. I marked that of your son and that of the Earl of Oxford. We will give them a cheer when they come up, continued de Montford and he rode on to the Earl of Montferma, saying, It is my son Montferma, I see his banner and Oxford's likewise, but here comes your nephew. Who is this he is driving down before him at the point of the lance? A crossbowman, it seems. My lord, my lord, cried Hugh de Montferma as he came up, prepare for instant battle. Prince Edward's army is within a mile, and Mortimer is coming up on the right-hand road. What? To the right? exclaimed de Montfort. How came he there? Well, let them come. They will meet more than they expected. My son is on the left. Advance our wing, my good lord of Montferma, that we may join with him more easily. My lord, you are deceived, said Hugh eagerly. The banners you have seen are not your sons. But, cried de Montford, speak, sirrah, exclaimed Hugh, turning sternly to the crossbowman, whom he had driven down before him. Speak, and let the earl hear the truth. Such bitter tidings should only come from the lips of an enemy. Speak, I say. My lord, this is one of Gloucester's archers. He will tell you more. Let him then, said the earl. Who are these marching against me, sirrah? Prince Edward, Roger Mortimer, and Gilbert de Clare, replied the man. Your son, my lord, kill me if you will, but it is the truth. Your son was surprised in his bed at Kenilworth. His army routed and dispersed. Thirteen barons displaying their own banners were taken, and as many more were slain. The banners you have seen were captured by the prince, and I hung out but to deceive you. And my son? asked de Montford, gazing earnestly into the man's face. What of my son? He escaped, my lord, replied the archer. He escaped and threw himself into the castle. Take him to the rear, said de Montford. Lo, where they come, a mighty power indeed. How orderly, how firm. The boy learnt that from me. Now God have mercy on our souls, for our bodies are Prince Edward's. He added the latter words in a lower voice, but so as to be distinctly heard by the gentlemen around him. A moment after, he raised his head proudly, saying, However, 
He must be met boldly, and we must do our duty as knights and gentlemen. Every one who is willing to do so may this day conquer high renown, if he wins no other prize. But should there be any one who fears to fight and fall with de Montfort, he has full leave to go. For I would not have it said when men shall talk of this glorious, though perhaps disastrous day, that there was one coward amongst all those who did battle at Evesham. Let us make the best of our array, my lord of Montferma. Yonder wood is a point that must be maintained. Hugh, line the edges of that little field with archers. Place me there our stout foresters from Sherwood. It is a point of much importance. Take up your post beyond them there with your men-at-arms. Have some archers and slingers in your front and keep the ground between the farther hedge and those scrubby bushes and hawthorn trees amongst which their horsemen cannot act. I put you in a post of difficulty and danger, young gentleman, but I know you will acquit you well. And now for the rest of our array. The enemy are halting for their own arrangements, but still we must lose no time. Thus saying, he rode slowly along the wood, giving his orders as he went, and ranging his men for battle, while Hugh de Montferma proceeded to execute the commands he had received. Every post was soon filled up, and before two o'clock the adverse armies were completely arrayed facing each other. But alas, that of Prince Edward outnumbering the force opposed to him, in the proportion of two to one. Nearly in the centre of de Montford's line was the Earl of Leicester himself, and at a little distance the weak and false King Henry, cased in complete armour and riding a strong black charger, for on both sides the royal standard was displayed, and in a brief consultation amongst the principal nobles it had been judged necessary, as the king's name was used in all public acts by the Lord's Commissioners, to let the soldiers see him actually in arms on their behalf. Neither had Henry himself appeared in the least unwilling to play this part, for although surrounded by a number of guards, he still entertained the hope of escaping in the hurry and confusion of battle. In the right wing of the same army was placed the gallant young Henry de Montford, a godson of the king, and like Hugh de Montferma, a playfellow of Prince Edward, for in those dire civil wars, as is ever the case, all the sweet relationships of life were torn asunder, and the hearts that loved each other the best were frequently armed for each other's destruction. In the left wing was the banner of Montferma, and under it fought not only the regular retainers of the house, but the yeomen and foresters of Yorkshire and Nottingham. The slingers, as usual, were thrown forward about a hundred and fifty yards before the rest of the army, closely supported by the lighter pikemen, and taking advantage of every bush and brake which might give them shelter, while they discharged their missiles at the enemy. Behind them were some thousands of Welsh foot, who had been engaged as auxiliaries by de Montford and then came the lines of sturdy English archers and regular spearmen, supported by the men-at-arms. It was a fine array to look upon, and stern and firm seemed the front of de Montford's battle. But the vast superiority of the enemy's numbers cast a shadow, as it were, upon the spirits of the soldiery, while in the hearts of the leaders was nothing but the certainty of defeat and death. Had it been any other body, perhaps, that opposed them but an English force, had any other generals commanded the adverse party but Edward and Gloucester, their confidence in their own courage and in their great leader might have taught them to look with hope even to the unequal struggle before them. The troops, however, by whom they were outnumbered were English soldiers, the chiefs who led the enemy were famous for their warlike skill and courage. 
and all were fresh from victory and elated with recent success. Upon the field of battle, the banners which had been assumed to mislead de Montfort were cast by, and those of the different leaders themselves displayed. The troops of Mortimer and the Lord's Marchers were on the right, the division of Gloucester on the left, and the command of Edward himself in the centre. In the army of the Prince, hope and exultation were in every bosom. Confidence was strong, and amongst the foreign favourites of Henry III, who were ranged in that force, the burning thirst for revenge upon him who had overthrown their fortunes and well-nigh driven them from the land, added fierceness to their courage and a savage joy at the thought of the coming vengeance. After the array was complete, a stern and gloomy silence pervaded the whole line of de Montfort. Each man thought of tomorrow, of the home that he might never see again, the children left fatherless, the widowed wife, the promised bride, the sweet, warm relations of domestic life, soon to be torn by the bloody hand of war. Yet none but the auxiliaries thought of flying, not one dreamt of avoiding the fate before him. For each man there arrayed came with a firm conviction of right and justice on his side. Each believed that he was fighting for the deliverance of his country from foreign domination. Each came ready to die for the liberty and the freedom of the people of England. They were determined, resolute, unshaken. But they were without hope, and therefore in stern silence, they awaited the onset of the foe. On the other side, for some time, nothing was heard but cheerful sounds, the leader's shouts, the repeated blasts of the clarion and the trumpet, till at length, amongst them also, a momentary solemn pause succeeded, giving notice that the battle was about to begin. They hung like a thundercloud upon the edge of the slope, and that temporary calm but preceded the breaking forth of the tempest. The heavy masses then for a moment seemed to tremble, and then a few men ran forward from the ranks, slinging, even from a distance at which no effect could be produced, large balls of stone or lead at the front of de Montfort's line. Others followed quick in irregular masses, and then moved on, somewhat more slowly, but in fine and soldierly order, the whole of Edward's overpowering force. A pin might have been heard to drop in the host of de Montfort. So still was the expectant silence with which they awaited the attack of the immense army, which seemed not only about to assail them at once in front, but lapping over at both extremities, to crush either flank under the charge of its numerous cavalry. The skilful dispositions of the great earl, however, had secured them against that danger, and the wood on the right hand, which he had filled with archers and foot spearmen, defended one wing, while the hedges and low hawthorn trees near which he had planted Hugh de Montferma and the bowmen of Sherwood were a protection to the left. Nevertheless, the latter point was one of considerable danger, and Edward marked it as the weakest part of de Montfort's line. Scarcely had the first movement in the prince's army taken place, when a strong body of horse, following close upon a band of crossbowmen, was observed by Hugh de Montferma marching straight against his post, headed by the banner of Bigod, Earl of Norfolk, and leaving his men-at-arms for a moment, he galloped to the spot where his friend Robin stood, saying in a low voice, Here will they make their first attack, Robin, in order to turn our flank. Let them come, replied Robin Hood. We will give a good account of them. We have planted stakes for their horses, my lord, so if you have to charge, mark well the gaps. I see, I see, 
cried Hugh de Montferma. But as it is a great object to put them in disarray, send them a flight from your bowstrings as soon as the arrows will tell. Ours will tell now, said Robin, and at the same time he raised his bow above his head as a signal to his men. At that instant a few balls dropping from the enemy's slingers fell impotent along de Montfort's line. But the next moment a hundred and fifty arrows shot into the air, scattered the crossbowmen in the face of Hugh de Montfermer's band, and even caused considerable disarray amongst the men-at-arms from Norfolk. A whole flight from Edward's army then darkened the air, but reached not the opposite host, and the Earl of Montfermer, distrusting his nephew's impetuosity, rode down to beg him on no account whatever to charge till the battle had really begun. It was not long ere such was the case, however. Onward, with increasing rapidity, came the force of the prince. The arrows and the quarrels on both sides began to work fearful havoc in the ranks, and the men-at-arms might be seen closing the bar d'Aventaille, preparing to enter with each other into deadly strife. The arrows from the Nottingham bows, unmatched throughout all England, did execution of a fearful kind amongst the crossbowmen opposed to them. One went down after another as they hurried forward. Their ranks became thinner and more thin, and at length the men-at-arms behind them, finding that the living as well as the dead and wounding encumbered without serving, called to them loudly to retire that they themselves might advance to charge. Before the retreat of the infantry could well be accomplished, the Earl of Norfolk gave the word, and with levelled lances the horsemen rushed on, though repeated arrows from an unerring hand struck every part of the Earl's own armour as he approached. At the horses! cried the voice of Robin Hood as the men-at-arms drew near and in an instant another flight, point-blank, rattled like hail amongst the advancing cavalry. Five or six charges instantly went down, and others, furious with pain, reeled and plunged, spreading disarray around. Hugh de Montfermot was now about to give the order to advance in order to support the archers and complete what they had done. But at that instant a cry of, They fly! They fly! came from the right and looking up the line he perceived the whole body of Welsh auxiliaries running from the field in rout and disarray. The panic of any large body of an army, we are told, generally communicates itself more or less to the whole, but such was not the case upon the present occasion. A shout of indignant anger burst from the other troops as the Welsh went by, for it was forgotten that they were not fighting for their country's safety or deliverance like the rest of that host, but every one made way for them to pass, and filling up the open space as fast as possible, presented a still sterner face than before to the advancing enemy. One of the chief defences of the centre, however, was now gone. It was like an outwork forced and a charge of men-at-arms taking place on both sides, the whole line was speedily engaged. From the firm front of the Nottingham archers and the terrible unceasing shower of arrows that they kept up, the bands of the Earl of Norfolk turned off in disorder at the very moment he had led them up almost to the stakes. Hugh de Montfermer charging while they were still in confusion, drove them back in complete rout, but the troops of Mortimer sweeping up changed the fortune of the parties, and Hugh, knowing the absolute necessity of keeping firm the post he occupied, retreated unwillingly to his first position. It was now that the Yorkshire spearmen, with the young Franklin at their head, did gallant service to the cause which they espoused. Advancing with their long lances, they kept the enemy at bay, and in spite of charge after charge made by Mortimer and others, maintained their ground against the whole force of the prince's right wing. In other parts of the field, however, 
Numbers were gradually prevailing against all that courage and resolution could do. The Malay had begun in all its fierceness. Night fought with night, man opposed man. Hurry and confusion were seen in all parts of the field, while the clang of arms, the blasts of the trumpet, the shouts of the combatants, the loud voice of the commanders, the galloping of horses, the groans of the dying, and the screams of men receiving agonizing wounds, offered to the ear of heaven a sound only fit for the darkest depth of hell. Charge after charge was poured upon the left wing of de Montfort's army. But Mortimer Bigod and the Earl of Pembroke in vain led down their horse against the gallant band of spearmen and archers. Each time they approached, they were driven back, either by the fierce flights of arrows, the long spears of Pontefract, or the encounter of the men-at-arms. Once only was the line between the hedged field we have mentioned and the hawthorn trees shaken for an instant by overpowering numbers. And then the old Earl of Montferma, seeing his nephew's peril, galloped down at the head of a strong band of men-at-arms and aided to repel the enemy. He paused one moment by his nephew's side ere he left him, saying, It will be very glorious, Hugh, if we can maintain our ground till night. Farewell, my dear boy. Do your devoir. And if we never meet again on earth, God bless you. I beseech you, sir, replied Hugh. Take care of your own invaluable life. Remember, you are as much aimed at by the enmity of the foreigners as even de Montfort. I will never fall alive into their hands, replied the old earl. But I quit not this field so long as there is light to wield the sword. Thus saying, he rode away to a spot where the battle was thickening round the banner of de Montfort itself, and his presence there apparently aided to restore the field, for shortly after the whole force of Prince Edward withdrew for a short space, like a tiger that has been disappointed of its spring, and hung wavering upon the edge of the slope, as if collecting vigour for a new charge. At the same time, the sky overhead which, as I have before said, had been threatening during the whole morning, grew darker and darker, so as to be more like that of a gloomy November evening than the decline of a summer's day. The pause which had taken place seemed a part of Edward's plan for breaking the firm line of his adversary, as it was more than once repeated during the battle, but it was never of long duration. The next instant his trumpets blew the charge, and down came the thundering cavalry pouring at once upon every part of de Montfort's army. On the earl's side, too, after a rapid flight of arrows from the archers, the men-at-arms advanced to meet the coming foe, and again the battle was urged hand to hand. It were vain to attempt a picture of the various deeds that were done that day in different parts of the field for seldom in the annals of warfare has combat taken place in which such acts of prowess and stern determination were displayed on either part. Edward himself, Mortimer, Gloucester, the Earl of Ashby and his son, Bigod and Valence, and a thousand others of noble birth and high renown, fought both as generals and soldiers, with personal exertions and valour, which could only be displayed in a chivalrous system of warfare, while on the other, de Montfort, Montherma, Le Dispenser, Bassett, St. John, Beecham, de Ross, put forth energies almost superhuman to counterbalance the disadvantage of numbers and to wrest a victory from the hand of fate. In one place... Humphrey de Bohun was struck down by one of Edward's men-at-arms, and a peasant with an oussin was preparing to dispatch him ere he could rise, when William de York came to his rescue and slew the foot-soldier. But even as de Bohun rose and regained his horse, his deliverer was killed by a quarrel from a crossbow. 
In another part, the king himself was assailed and wounded by one of his own son's followers, who had even shortened his lance to pin him to the earth as he lay prostrate before him. When, throwing back his avantai, the monarch exclaimed, Out upon thee, traitor! I am Henry of Winchester, thy king! Where is my son? As he spoke, a knight, taller by a head than any man around, and clothed from the crown to the heel in linked mail, sprang to the ground beside him, and thrusting the soldier fiercely back, raised the monarch from the ground, exclaiming, Mount, mount, my father, and away! Come to the rear, and let your wound be searched. Give me your horse's rein. You at least are free, and that is worth a victory. The king sprang on his horse, and Edward led him by the bridle to the rear of his own army. Almost at the same moment, on the left of de Montfort's line, Allure de Ashby and Hugh de Montferma met in full career, the former charging at the well-known shield of Montferma with animosity only the more fierce, perhaps, because he knew that it was unjust. The latter meeting him unwillingly, though compelled by circumstances, to do his knightly devoir. His very reluctance, however, made him more calm and thoughtful than his fiery assailant, and aiming his lance right at the crest of his adversary, in order to cast him from his horse and make him prisoner rather than kill him, he galloped on with a wary eye. The young lord of Ashby's spear, charged well and steadily, struck full upon the shield of his opponent, pierced through the plate of steel and touched the hauberk, but stopped there, without even shaking him in the saddle and broke off in splinters, while Montherma's lance, catching the steel cask just above the aventai, hurled his adversary to the ground, bruised but unwounded. Several of Montherma's followers instantly ran up on foot to seize the discomfited knight and make him prisoner, but a charge of fresh troops drove them back, and Allura de Ashby, remounting his horse, rode away with no light addition to his former hatred for Hugh de Montferma. The momentary retirement of Edward from the field now caused another of those pauses in the battle which have already been mentioned. His forces once more withdrew for a short space, slowly and sullenly, the archers on either side continuing to discharge their arrows, though with but little effect. About the same time, a flash somewhat faint, but blue and ghastly, came across the sky, and then the low muttering of distant thunder. Ha! said Robin Hood, who was standing by the side of Hugh de Montferma at the moment. That trumpet will be but little attended to today. Heaven's voice too rarely is. Too rarely indeed, replied Hugh. Have you lost many men, Robin? Well nigh two score, I fear, answered Robin Hood. Poor Brown was rash and ventured beyond the stakes with his little band of Mansfield men. They are all gone, but we have filled up the gap. Can you still maintain your post? demanded Hugh. With God's will and the help of the Blessed Virgin, we shall do very well here, said Robin. But I fear, my lord, for the centre and the right. Look up there, just in the second line, where there are so many gathering to one spot. Some great man is hurt there. My uncle was there a moment ago, exclaimed Hugh. I fear it is he. No, no, my lord, replied an old knight of the house of Montferma, who was on his horse close by. My lord, your uncle is safe. I have seen him since the last charge, though he seems resolved to lose his life. I do beseech you, Sir John Hardy, said Hugh, if we lose the day, look to my uncle and force him from the battle should it be needful. You stay on the field then, my lord, I suppose, asked the old knight. I do, answered Hugh. Then I stay too, replied Sir John Hardy. 
Nay, that is folly, cried Robin Hood. Let each man fight so long as fighting may avail. But when the day is clearly lost, the brave man, who would spill his best blood to win it, then saves the life that God gave him to do God's service at another time. But see, all the leaders are gathering to that point. You had better go, my lord, and bring us tidings. We will ensure the ground till your return. Command the troop then till I come back, Sir John, said Hugh. And riding along the front of the line, under a shower of arrows from the enemy, he approached the spot, where sheltered from the sight of the adversary's lines by a thick phalanx of foot spearmen and men-at-arms, was collected a group of noblemen of the first rank, seeming to hold a council round the royal standard, which was there erected. When Hugh came near, however, he saw that the occasion was a sadder one. His uncle, the lords of Mandeville, Bassett, Crepigny, Beecham and Le Dispense, were standing dismounted round the famous Earl of Leicester, who was stretched upon the ground with his head and shoulders supported by the knee and arm of a monk. Deep in his breast, piercing through and through the steel hauberk, was buried the head of a broken lance, and in his right shoulder was a cloth-yard arrow. He had just concluded what seemed his confession in extremis, and the good man was murmuring over him in haste the hurried absolution of the field of battle. His countenance was pale, the dull shadow of death was upon it. The lips were colourless, and the nostrils widely expanded, as if it caused an agonising effort to draw his breath. But the eye was still bright and clear, and while the man of God repeated the last words, it rolled thoughtfully over the faces of all around, resting with an anxious gaze upon those with whom he was the most familiar. Draw out the lance, he said, speaking to the surgeon of his household, who stood near. If I do, my lord, replied the leech, you cannot survive ten minutes. That is long enough, said de Montfort. My boy Henry is gone. I saw him fall, and I would not be much behind him. Draw it out, I say. I cannot breathe, and I must needs speak to my friends. The dispenser make him draw it out. I shall have time enough for all I have to do. Unwillingly, and not without a considerable effort, the surgeon tore the head of the lance out of the wound. But contrary to his expectations, very little blood followed. The earl bled inwardly. He seemed to feel instant relief, however, saying, Ah, that is comfort. Keep that steel, my friend, as the instrument that sent de Montfort to heaven. Now mark me, lords and nobles, he continued in a firm voice. Mark me and never forget that at his last hour, going to meet his saviour in judgment, De Montfort declares that those who accuse him of ambition do belie him. I say now, as I have said ever, that my every act and every thought have been for my country's good. I may have been mistaken, doubtless, have been so often, but that my intentions have been pure, I do most fervently call heaven to witness. So much for that, and now my friends, I am fast leaving you. My sun, like yonder orb, is setting rapidly. I forever, he to rise again. He may yet shine brightly on the cause I can no longer support, but it must be upon another field and upon another day. Preserve yourselves for that time, my friends, I exhort, I beseech you. Bassett, Montherma, Le Dispenser, this battle is lost, but you may yet, as night is coming, effect your retreat in safety. It is no dishonour to quit a well-fought but unequal field. Show a firm face to the enemy, gather all our poor soldiers together, retire as orderly as may be till night covers you, 
then disperse and each man make the best of his way to his own stronghold. Montferma, you shake your head. I have sworn to Montford, said his old friend, kneeling down and grasping his hand, not to quit this field so long as there is light in yonder sky to strike a stroke, and I must keep my vow. You are going, my noble friend, said Lord Ralph Bassett. You are going on a journey where you must have companions. I am with you, Lester, and that right soon. Goodbye to Montford, said Lord Le Dispenser. Go on, I will not make you wait. We shall meet again in half an hour. A faint smile came upon the lips of the dying man. Must it be so? he asked. Well then, range your men upon them all together, and let the traitors who have betrayed their country make such a field that Eve Champlain shall be sung and talked of so long as liberty is dear to the hearts of Englishmen. Hark! They are coming, he continued in a faint voice, with his eyes rolling languidly from side to side. No, my lord, that is thunder, said the surgeon. Ha, replied de Montfort vacantly. Thunder, I am very thirsty. Someone ran and brought him a little water from the stream. It seemed to refresh him, and raising himself for an instant upon his arm, he gazed around with a countenance full of stern enthusiasm, exclaiming aloud, Do your devoir! and with those words he fell back into the arms of the priest, a corpse. A dozen voices replied, We will! And each man, springing on his horse, regained the head of his band. Just as Edward's troops were once more in movement to advance, the word was given along the whole of the Confederate line. The trumpets blew to the charge, and the army which had held its firm position up to that hour, rushed forward to meet the adversary like a thundercloud rolling down a hill. The sun at the same moment touched the edge of the horizon, shining out beneath the edge of the stormy canopy that covered the greater part of the sky, and blending its red descending light with the thunder drops, which were now pattering large and thick upon the plain of Evesham. The whole air seemed flooded with gore, and the clouds on the eastern side of the heavens, black and heavy as they were, assumed a lurid glare, harmonising with the whole scheme, except where part of a rainbow crossed the expanse, hanging the banner of hope, light and peace in the midst of strife, destruction and despair. Such was the scene at the moment when the two armies met in the dire shock of battle, and fierce and terrible was the encounter, as soon broken into separate parties they fought hand to hand, dispersed over the plain. In one of these confused groups, leading on a small body of archers with Robin Hood by his side, was the young lord of Montferma. My lord, my lord, said Sir John Hardy, riding up. Your uncle is down, wounded but not dead. Bear him from the field, Sir John, replied Hugh. Robin, I beseech you, look to him. Bear him from the field, bear him from the field. What ho, Montferma, cried a loud voice from a party of spearmen coming at full speed. Down with your lance, surrender to the prince, if the prince can take me, replied Hugh, charging his lance at Edward's shield, and driving his spurs deep into his horse's sides. Hold back, hold back, shouted Edward to his own men. Hold back, every one, upon your lives. And meeting the young lord in full career, both their lances were shivered in a moment as if in some mock combat of the tilt-yard. Hugh de Montferma's sword sprang from the sheath in a moment, while Edward cried, Yield thee, Hugh! Yield thee! But a number of men on foot, 
had run up, and suddenly the young knight received a violent blow from a mallet on the side of his head, while in the same instant his horse, gashed deep in the belly by the broadsword of a crossbowman, staggered and fell prone upon the plain. A dozen spears were at his throat in a moment, but Edward shouted once more to stand back, and, springing to the ground, he bent over the young knight, exclaiming, Now, Hugh, rescue or no rescue? Do you surrender? I have no choice, my lord, replied the other. I am in your hand. Take him to the rear, said Edward, but use him with all kindness as your prince's friend. Now, my lords, he continued, remounting his horse, methinks the field is ours, and there is scarcely light to strike another blow. Well has the fight been fought, and it is but justice to our enemies, to say that never was greater valour, conduct, and chivalry displayed in any land than by them this day. Someone said de Montford is dead. Have the tidings been confirmed? They are certain, my lord, replied one of his attendants. The Lord de Vesky, who is taken sorely wounded, saw him die. He was a great man, said Edward. Now spur on and clear the plain, but be merciful, my friends. Remember, they are brave men and fellow countrymen. Thus speaking, the prince advanced again, and having seen that no party remained in active contention with his forces, but that all were either dead, taken, or dispersed, he caused his standard to be pitched upon the banks of the little rivulet we have mentioned, his trumpets to blow the recall, and thus ended the famous Battle of Eversham. End of section 44 This recording is in the public domain. Section 45 of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 9, England, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section number 45. In the Days of Edward III. 1272-1307 by Eva March Tappan There are three reasons why the reign of Edward III is worth remembering. The first is that before its close he had adopted the ideas of the dead Simon de Montfort and had admitted to his parliament representatives of the townsmen and of the lesser landowners. The second is that he conquered Wales. The Welsh were descendants of the early Britons, whom the Saxons had driven to the west, and although they had often been obliged to pay tribute, they had never really submitted to the rule of an English king, and they had a prophecy that some day their own King Arthur would come back and help them to drive away the invaders. Edward won several victories, and finally obliged the Welsh to acknowledge him as their ruler. Of course, they did this most unwillingly, but matters seemed a little better when Edward told them that he would give them a prince who had been born in their land, and who had never spoken a word of English. Behold, when their prince was presented to them, he was Edward's baby son, who had been born in Wales a few months before, and was too young to speak a word of any language. He was called Prince of Wales, and that is why the eldest son of the English sovereign usually receives that title, though he has no more power over Wales than over any other part of the kingdom. The third reason for remembering the reign of Edward is his attempt to conquer Scotland. This was far more difficult than to subdue Wales. In Scotland there were the descendants of a people called Scots, who had long before come from the north of Ireland, and had given their name to the country. There were descendants of Picts and of Danes, of Englishmen whom William the Conqueror had driven from their homes, also some descendants of Normans. All these people were united in wishing Scotland to be free, 
but they took an unwise step which put them into Edward's power. The Scotch king had died, leaving no children, and thirteen distant relatives claimed the throne. Edward was called a wise ruler, and the Scotch asked him to choose among the thirteen. He replied that the Scotch must first acknowledge him as overlord. They agreed, and he decided in favour of Balliol, though a man named Robert Bruce had a claim that many thought equally good. Soon Edward began to behave so much as if he himself were king of Scotland that even Balliol revolted. Then Edward came with his army, put Balliol from the throne, and subdued the Scotch. When he went home, he carried with him to London a stone upon which the kings of Scotland always sat when they were crowned. It is called the Stone of Schoon, and the people believed that it was the very one that Jacob had for a pillow when he dreamed of the ladder and the angels, and that it had been carried from Bethel to Egypt, Spain, Ireland, and finally to Scotland. Edward put it into a chair in Westminster Abbey, and it is on this stone that the King of England sits at his coronation. The only comfort that the Scotch had in its loss was an old prophecy that wherever the stone was, there the Scotch should rule. Scotland was not conquered. She only waited for a leader, and soon a brave, strong man appeared named William Wallace. He knew that he could not meet the great numbers of English that would come against him, so he planned to starve them out, and when the English were coming, the people would burn what they could not carry, and then run away. After a while, however, the great English army overpowered the few Scotchmen. Wallace was captured and put to death. The heir of Robert Bruce was his grandson, a young man by the same name. Edward had kept him at the English court, but one snowy morning he was missing. There were footprints of horses in the snow, but they pointed towards London, and no one guessed that the wise young man had had the shoes put on reversed. He escaped to Scotland and was crowned. At first he had to hide in the mountains, but he always had faithful friends and he never was discouraged. After a while he began to be successful, and there came a time when no one knew whether he or Edward would conquer. The English king was old and feeble, but he was as resolute as ever, and he set out to subdue Scotland once and for all. Before he was out of England he fell ill and died. His last wishes were that his bones should be wrapped in an ox hide, and that his son, the one who had been the baby Prince of Wales, should carry them at the head of the English army till Scotland should be subdued. This was not done, however, for Edward was buried with his forefathers in Westminster Abbey. About the middle of Edward's reign, he banished the Jews from the kingdom. Thus far, the English kings had allowed them to stay, and had treated them less cruelly than had the kings on the continent. This comparative kindness was not for the benefit of the Jews, however, but simply because they seemed to know how to amass money better than other people, and the kings found it convenient to be able to help themselves from the Jewish horde. When the Jews made loans, it was always doubtful whether they would ever see their money again, and so to make up for this risk, they charged enormous interest. The English now claimed that this high rate of interest was an injury to the country. Then, too, many people never looked at a Jew without thinking of the crucifixion of Christ and fancying that even the Jews of 1,200 years later were to blame for it. At any rate, they were driven out of England, 16,000 of them, and it is possible that no other deed of Edward's reign brought him so much praise as their cruel expulsion. In the two centuries since the Battle of Senlac, the English people had made much progress in freedom of thought. They had also made progress in their manner of expressing their thoughts. 
The French had found it quite worthwhile to know English, and the English had found it convenient to know French. More and more, however, people were looking upon a knowledge of French as an accomplishment, and upon English as the real language of the country. This English had been greatly changed since the days when the minstrels sang of Beowulf, and one of the changes was the result of borrowing words from the French. Words that were nearly alike in both languages were pronounced just as it happened, and as for the spelling, they were spelled in whatever way came to mind first. In order that those who knew but one language might understand, the custom arose of using two words, one from the French and one from the English, meaning the same thing, and that is one reason why our English of today has so many synonyms or pairs of words with nearly the same signification, such as cordial, hearty, desire, wish, act, deed, humble, lowly, confess, acknowledge. No matter how many words English may take from the French or from any other language, it always makes them wear an English dress. For instance, telephone is from the Greek, but we say telephones and telephoning, and the S and the ing are not Greek, but English. The books that were written were chiefly about England and her history. Some of this history is true, and some of it goes back to the half-fabulous days of King Arthur. The unwritten literature, however, is far more attractive. In the days of the weak King Stephen, the cruel barons robbed the people so unmercifully that many abandoned their homes and went to live in the forests. Then it was that men began to make ballads about bold Robin Hood, the merry outlaw who took from the rich and gave to the poor, who played all sorts of pranks on sheriffs and wealthy bishops, but who was always ready to help anyone in trouble. It was a long time before the ballads were written, but they were sung throughout the land. As in the days of Richard, a minstrel might go where he would and always find a hearty greeting, so any man who could sing a ballad was ever a welcome guest. People would gather in groups at any time to listen to him. The ballads were on well-known old stories, or on any recent event that struck the fancy of the singer. He would never try to remember how another man had sung the song, but would sing what chanced to come to his own mind, and make up lines whenever he forgot. The song changed with every singer. The accounts of early England that were written in this century are interesting, but even though the monks that wrote them would have been greatly shocked at the thought that their pages of dignified Latin were not so valuable as the street songs, it is, after all, the ballads that are the real English literature of the century the real voice of the masses of the English people. End of section 45 Read by Jane Bennett Section 46 of England This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 9, England, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 46. The First Expedition of Edward III Against the Scots, 1328, by Sir John Froissart. The Scots are bold, hardy, and much inured to war. When they make their invasions into England, they march from twenty to four and twenty leagues without halting, as well by night as day, for they are all on horseback except the camp followers who are on foot. The knights and esquires are well mounted on large bay horses, the common people on little galloways. They bring no carriages with them on account of the mountains they have to pass in Northumberland, neither do they carry with them any provisions or bread or wine for their habits of sobriety are such, in time of war, that they will live for a long time on flesh half-sodden, without bread, 
and drink the river water without wine. They have, therefore, no occasion for pots or pans, for they dress the flesh of their cattle in the skins after they have taken them off, and being sure to find plenty of them in the country which they invade, they carry none with them. Under the flaps of his saddle, each man carries a broad plate of metal, behind the saddle a little bag of oatmeal. When they have eaten too much of the sodden flesh, and their stomachs appear weak and empty, they place this plate over the fire, mix with water their oatmeal, and when the plate is heated, they put a little of the paste upon it, and make a thin cake like a cracknel or biscuit, which they eat to warm their stomachs. It is therefore no wonder that they perform a longer day's march than other soldiers. In this manner the Scots entered England, destroying and burning everything as they passed. They seized more cattle than they knew what to do with. When the English king and all his host had seen the smoke of the fires which the Scots had made, the alarm was immediately sounded, and everyone ordered to dislodge and follow his banners. They all, therefore, withdrew to the fields, armed for immediate combat. Three battalions of infantry were formed, each battalion having two wings, composed of five hundred men-at-arms, who were to remain on horseback. It was said that there were eight thousand men-at-arms, knights and esquires, and thirty thousand men armed and equipped, half of whom were mounted on small hackneys. The other half were countrymen on foot, sent by the towns and paid by them. There were also twenty-four archers on foot, besides all the crew of followers of the army. Thus being drawn up, they marched in battle array after the Scots, toward the place from whence the smoke came, until it was night. The army halted in a wood by the side of a small river, to rest themselves and to wait for their baggage and provision. The Scots had burnt and pillaged all the country within five leagues of the place where they were, without the English being able to come up with them. At daybreak the next morning, every one was armed, and with banners displayed, marched in good order over mountains and through valleys, but could never approach the Scots who were advanced before them. For there were so many marshes and dangerous places, that it was ordered, under pain of death, that no one should quit his banner except the marshals. When it drew towards night, the cavalry and those who attended the baggage, more especially the infantry, were so fatigued that they could march no further. The lords saw that they followed the Scots to no purpose, and that if the Scots were willing to wait for them, they might post themselves on some mountain or in some dangerous pass, where they could not be attacked but at extreme disadvantage. The king then ordered the marshals to encamp the army there for the night, in order that they might consider what was to be done the next day. The army lay in a wood upon the banks of a small river, and the king was lodged in a poor monastery hard by. The men-at-arms, horses and baggage were much fatigued. When each had chosen a spot of ground to encamp himself on, the lords retired apart to consider what would be the best method to force the Scots to battle, considering the situation of the country in which they were. It appeared to them that the Scots were shearing off to their own country, burning and pillaging as they went, and that it would be impossible to fight with them in these mountains without a manifest disadvantage, supposing they should overtake them, which they could not, but, as they must repass the Tyne, it was determined in full council that if they were to get themselves ready about midnight and hasten their march next day, they might cut off the passage of the river and force them to fight to a disadvantage or remain shut up prisoners in England. After this resolution had been entered into, each retired to his quarters to eat and drink what he could find there and they desired their companions to be silent in order that the trumpets might be heard. 
at the first sounding of which the horses were to be saddled and made ready. At the second, every one was to arm himself without delay, and at the third, to mount their horses immediately and join their banners. Each was to take only one loaf of bread with him, slung behind him after the manner of hunters. All unnecessary arms, harness and baggage were ordered to be left behind. As they thought they should for a certainty give battle the next day, whatever might be the consequences, whether they should win or lose all. As it had been ordered, so it was executed, and all were mounted and ready about midnight. Some had but little rest, notwithstanding they had laboured hard the day before. Day began to appear as the battalions were assembled at their different posts. The banner-bearers then hastened on over heaths, mountains, valleys, rocks, and many dangerous places, without meeting any level country. On the summits of the mountains and in the valley were large marshes and bogs, and of such extent that it was a miracle many were not lost in them, for each galloped forward without waiting for either commander or companion. Those who fell into them found difficulty in getting any to help them. Many banners remained there, and several baggage and sumpter horses never came out again. In the course of the day there were frequent cries of alarm, as if the foremost ranks were engaged with the enemy, which those behind believing to be true, they hurried forward as fast as possible, over rocks and mountains, sword in hand, with their helmets and shields prepared for fighting, without waiting for father, brother or friend. When they had hastened about half a league toward the place from which the noise came, they found themselves disappointed, as the cries proceeded from some herds of deer or other wild beasts, which abounded in these heaths and desert places, and which fled before the banners, pursued by the shouts of the army, which made them imagine it was something else. In this manner, the young king of England, agreeably to the advice of his council, rode all that day over mountains and deserts, without keeping to any fixed road or finding any town. About Vespers, and sorely fatigued, they reached the Tyne, which the Scots had already crossed, though the English supposed they had it still to repass. Accordingly, they went over the ford, but with great difficulty owing to the large stones that were in the river. When they had passed over, each took up his lodging on its bank as he could, and at this time the sun was set. There were few among them that had any hatchets, wedges, or other instruments to cut down trees to make themselves huts. Many of them had lost their companions, and even the foot had remained behind, not knowing what road to ask for. Those who were best acquainted with the country said that they had travelled that day twenty English leagues on a gallop without stopping, except to arrange the furniture of their horses when it had been loosened by the violent exercise. They were forced to lie this night on the banks of the river in their armour, and at the same time hold their horses by their bridles, for there was not any place where they could tie them. Thus the horses had nothing to eat, neither oats nor any forage, and the men had only their loaf that was tied behind them, which was wetted by the sweat of the horses. They had no other beverage but the water of the river, except some great lords who had bottles among their baggage. Nor had they fire or light, not having anything to make them of, except some few lords who had some torches, which they had brought on sumpter horses. In such a melancholy manner did they pass the night, without taking the saddles from their horses, or disarming themselves. And when the long-expected day appeared, when they hoped to find some comfort for themselves and horses, or to fight the Scots, which they very much wished for, to get out of their disagreeable situation, it began to rain, and continued all the day, 
insomuch that the river was so increased by noon that no one could pass over, nor could any one be sent to know where they were, or to get forage and litter for their horses, or bread or wine for their own sustenance. They were therefore obliged to fast another night, the horses had nothing to subsist on but the leaves of the trees and grass. They cut down with their swords young trees and tied their horses to them. They also cut down brushwood to make huts for themselves. Some poor peasants coming that way in the afternoon informed them that they were fourteen leagues from Newcastle upon Tyne and eleven from Carlisle and that there was not a town nearer whence they could get any accommodation. When this intelligence was brought to the king and the principal lords, they directly sent off messengers with horses to bring them provision. And they caused a proclamation to be made in the king's name in Newcastle, that whoever wished to get money, he had only to bring provision, wine, etc., for which he would be instantly paid and a safe conduct granted him. They were also informed that they should not move from their present quarters until they had information where the Scots were. The next day, the messengers which the lords had sent for provision returned about noon, with what they had been able to procure for them and their households. But it was not much. And with them came people of the country, to take their advantage of the situation of the army, and brought with them on mules and small horses, bread badly baked in baskets, and poor thin wine in large barrels, and other kinds of provision to sell, with which the army was tolerably refreshed, and their discontent appeased. This was the case during the seven days that they remained on the banks of this river, among the mountains, expecting the return of the Scots, who knew no more of the English than they did of them. Thus they had remained for three days and three nights, without bread, wine, candles, oats, or any other forage, and they were afterwards for four days obliged to buy badly baked bread at the price of sixpence a loaf, which was not worth more than a penny, and a gallon of wine for six groats, scarcely worth sixpence. Hunger, however, was still felt in the camp, notwithstanding this supply, and frequent quarrels happened from their tearing the meat out of each other's hands. To add to their unpleasant situation, it had rained all the week, by which all their saddles and girths were rotted, and the greater part of the cavalry were worn down. They had not wherewithal to shoe their horses that wanted it, nor had they anything to clothe themselves or preserve them from the rain and cold but their jerkins or armour and the green huts, nor had they any wood to burn, except what was so green and wet as to be of small service. Having continued for a whole week without hearing any tidings of the Scots, who they imagined must pass that way or very near it in their return home, great murmurs arose in the army, and many laid the fault on those who had given such advice, adding that it was done in order to betray the king and his host, upon which the lords of council ordered the army to make ready to march and cross the river seven leagues higher up where the ford was better and it was proclaimed that every one was to be in readiness to march the next day and to follow his banners. There was another proclamation made that whoever chose to take pains and find out where the Scots were and should bring certain intelligence of it to the king, the messenger of such news should have one hundred pounds a year in land and be made a knight by the king himself. When this was made known among the host, many knights and esquires, to the number of fifteen or sixteen, eager to gain such rewards, passed the river with much danger, ascended the mountains, and then separated, each taking different routes. The next day the army dislodged, marched tolerably well, considering that they were but ill-clothed, and exerted themselves so much that they repassed the river, 
though with much danger from its being swollen by the rains. Many were well washed, and many drowned. When they had crossed over, they remained there for that night, finding plenty of forage in the fields near to a small village, which the Scots had burnt as they passed. The next day they marched over hill and dale till about noon, when they came to some burnt villages, and some fields where there were corn and hay, so that the host remained there for that night. The third day they marched in the same manner, but many were ignorant where they were going, nor had they any intelligence of the enemy. They continued their route the fourth day in this order, when about three o'clock an esquire, galloping up hastily to the king, said, Sire, I bring you news of the Scots. They are three leagues from this place, lodged on a mountain, where they have been this week waiting for you. They knew no more where you were than you did of them, and you may depend on this as true. For I approached so near to them that I was taken, and led a prisoner to their army before their chiefs. I informed them where you were, and that you were seeking them to give them battle. The lords gave me up my ransom and my liberty, when I informed them that you had promised one hundred pounds a year to whoever should first bring intelligence of them, upon condition that he rested not until he brought you this information. And I now tell you that you will find them in the place I have mentioned, as eager to meet you in battle as you yourself can be. As soon as the king heard this news, he ordered his army to be prepared, and turned his horses to feed in the fields, near to a monastery of white monks which had been burned, and which was called in King Arthur's time Blancheland. Then the king confessed himself, and each made his preparations according to his abilities. The king ordered plenty of masses to be said, to housel such as were devoutly inclined. He assigned one hundred pounds value of land, yearly, to the esquire, according to his promise, and made him a knight with his own hands in the presence of the whole army. When they had taken some repose and breakfasted, the trumpets sounded, and all being mounted, the banners advanced as the young knight led them on but each battalion marched by itself in regular array, over hill and dale, keeping their ranks according to order. Thus they continued marching, when about twelve o'clock they came within sight of the Scots' army. As soon as the Scots perceived them, they issued forth from their huts on foot, and formed three good battalions upon the descent of the mountain on which they lodged. A strong rapid river ran at the foot of this mountain, which was so full of large rocks and stones that it was dangerous to pass it in haste. If the English had passed the river, there was not room between it and the mountain for them to draw up their line of battle. The Scots had formed their first two battalions on the two sides of the mountain and on the declivity of the rock, which was not easy to climb to attack them but they themselves were posted so as to annoy them with stones if they crossed the river, which, if the English affected, they would not be able to return. There were skirmishes by both parties, but no regular engagements. At length the Scots moved to a second mountain, and the English camped on one directly opposite. Day after day both armies waited for something to be done, and behold... At last something was done. Toward daybreak, two Scots trumpeters fell in with one of the patrols, who took them and brought them before the lords of the council, to whom they said, My lords, why do you watch here? You are losing your time, for we swear by our heads that the Scots are on their march home since midnight, and are now four or five leagues off and they left us behind that we might give you the information. The English said that it would be in vain to follow them, as they could never overtake them. But fearing deceit, the lords ordered the trumpeters to close confinement, 
and did not alter the position of the battalions until four o'clock. When they saw that the Scots were really gone, they gave permission for each to retire to his quarters, and the lords held a council to consider what was to be done. Some of the English, however, mounted their horses, passed the river, and went to the mountain which the Scots had quitted, and found more than five hundred large cattle, which the enemy had killed, as they were too heavy to carry with them, and too slow to follow them, and they wished not to let them fall into the hands of the English alive. They found there were also more than three hundred cauldrons, made of leather with the hair on the outside, which were hung on the fires full of water and meat, ready for boiling. There were also upward of a thousand spits with meat on them prepared for roasting, and more than ten thousand pairs of old worn-out shoes made of undressed leather, which the Scots had left there. There were found five poor English prisoners whom the Scots had bound naked to the trees, and some of them had their legs broken. They untied them and sent them away, and then returned to the army, just as they were setting out on their march to England, by orders from the king and council. They followed all that day the banners of the marshals, and halted at an early hour in a beautiful meadow, where there was plenty of forage for their horses. And much need was there of it, for they were so weakened by famine that they could scarce move. The next day they decamped betimes, and took up their quarters still earlier, at a large monastery within two leagues of Durham. The king lay there that night, and the army in the fields around it, where they found plenty of grass, pulse, and corn. They remained there quiet the next day, but the kings and lords went to see the church of Durham. The king paid his homage to the church and the bishopric, which he had not before done, and gave largesses to the citizens. They found there all their carriages and baggage which they had left in a wood thirty-two days before at midnight, as has been related. The inhabitants of Durham, finding them there, had brought them away at their own cost and placed them in empty barns. Each carriage had a little flag attached to it, that it might be known. The lords were much pleased at finding them again. The kings and nobles reposed two days at Durham, and the army in its environs, for there would not have been sufficient room to lodge them in that city. They had all their horses well shod, and set out on the march towards York. They made such haste that in three days they arrived there, and found the Queen Mother, who received the king and nobles with great joy, as did all the ladies of the court and city. The king disbanded the army, and gave permission for every one to return to his home, and made many acknowledgments to the earls, barons, and knights, for the services they had rendered him by their advice and prowess. He kept near his person, Sir John de Hainault, and his company, who were much feasted by the Queen and all the ladies. The knights made out their accounts for horses which had been ruined, or lost, or had died, and gave them in to the council, and also a statement of their own expenses, which Sir John de Hainault took upon him as his own debt towards his followers, for the king and his ministers could not immediately collect such a sum as their horses amounted to but he gave them sufficient for their own expenses and to carry them back to their own country. They were afterwards all paid within the year the full amount of their losses. End of section 46 Read by Jane Bennett Section 47 of England Read for LibriVox.org by Sandra Schmidt. Wycliffe on Trial by Ford Maddox Brown, English painter, 1821 to 1893. Painting, page 350. In 1377, John Wycliffe, the morning star of the Reformation, 
was bidden by the authorities of the church to appear before the convocation in st paul's london and give an account of the new doctrines he was teaching he appeared in due season but with an escort that was hardly expected for john duke of gaunt son of the king and in reality exerciser of the powers of prime minister was with him lord percy earl marshal and a band of soldiers also accompanied him the trial so called resolved itself into a violent quarrel between the bishop of london and the king's son this soon became a general riot and to quiet the disturbance wycliffe was allowed to retire to his church at lutterworth in the picture courtney bishop of london sits on the dice at the extreme right at wycliffe's feet sit the five friars who have been appointed as his counsel john of gaunt naked sword in hand is apparently snapping his fingers at the bishop and making so threatening a speech that his wife the princess constance seizes him by the robe lest he turn his sword against that dignitary chaucer another friend of the duke's sits in the background at the right with inkstand and quill pen quietly taking notes wycliffe stands before the bar lord percy has just ordered a stool to be brought for him and you must answer for all these books doctor you will need a soft seat he says whereat the wrath of the bishop increases wycliffe however remains standing end of section forty seven this recording is in the public domain section forty eight of england this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world's story volume nine england edited by eva march tappan section forty eight the revolt of the peasants thirteen eighty one by augustin thierry towards the year thirteen eighty one all those in england who were called bonds that is to say all the cultivators were serfs of body and goods obliged to pay heavy aids for the small portion of land which supported their family and unable to quit this portion of land without the consent of the lords whose tillage gardening and cartage of every kind they were compelled to perform gratuitously the lord might sell them with their house their oxen their tools their children and their posterity as is thus expressed in the deeds know that i have sold such a one my naif nativum meum and all his progeny born or to be born resentment of the misery caused by the oppression of the noble families combined with an almost entire oblivion of the events which had elevated these families whose members no longer distinguished themselves by the name of normans but by the term gentlemen had led the peasants of england to contemplate the idea of the injustice of servitude in itself independently of its historical origin in the southern counties whose population was more numerous and especially in kent the inhabitants of which had preserved a vague tradition of a treaty concluded between themselves and william the conqueror for the maintenance of their ancient rights and liberties great symptoms of popular agitation appeared in the commencement of the reign of richard the second it was a time of excessive expense with the court and all the gentlemen on account of the wars in france which all attended at their own cost and wherein each vied with the other in the magnificence of his train and his armour the proprietors of the lordships and manors overwhelmed their farmers and serfs with taxes and exactions alleging for every fresh demand the necessity of going to fight the french on their own ground in order to prevent their making a descent upon england but the peasants said we are taxed to aid the knights and squires of the country to defend their heritages 
we are their slaves the sheep from whom they shear the wool all things considered if england were conquered we should lose much less than they these and similar thoughts murmuringly exchanged on the road when the serfs of the same or of neighbouring domains met each other on their return from labour became after a while the theme of earnest speeches pronounced in a sort of club where they collected in the evening some of the orators were priests and they derived from the bible their arguments against the social order of the period good people they said things may not go on in england and shall not until there be no more villeins or gentlemen among us but we be all equal and the lords no more masters than we where is their greater worth that they should hold us in serfage we all come from the same father and mother adam and eve they are clothed in fine velvet and satin lined with ermine and miniver they have meat and spices and good wines we the refuse of the straw and for drink water they have ease and fine mansions we pain and hard labour the rain and the wind in the open fields hereupon the whole assembly would exclaim tumultuously there shall be no more serfs we will no longer be treated as beasts if we work for the lords it shall be for pay these meetings held in many parts of kent and essex were secretly organized and sent deputies into the neighboring counties to seek the counsel and aid of men of the same class and opinion a great association was thus formed for the purpose of forcing the gentlemen to renounce their privileges a remarkable feature of the confederation is that written pamphlets in the form of letters were circulated throughout the villages recommending to the associates in mysterious and proverbial terms perseverance and discretion these productions several of which have been preserved by a contemporary author are written in a pure english that is to say less mixed up with french than our other pieces of the same period destined for the amusement of the rich citizens except as facts however these pamphlets of the fourteenth century have nothing curious about them the most significant of them is a letter addressed to the country people by a priest named john ball which contains the following passage john ball greeteth you all well and doth give you to understand he hath rung your bell now right and might will and skill god speed every idle one stand manfully in truth and helping if the end be well then all is well notwithstanding the distance which then separated the condition of the peasants from that of the citizens and more especially from that of the london citizens the latter it would appear entered into close communication with the serfs of essex and even promised to open the gates of the city to them and to admit them without opposition if they would come in a body to make their demands to king richard this king had just entered his sixteenth year and the peasants full of simple good faith and a conviction in the justice of their cause imagined that he would enfranchise them in a legal manner without their needing to resort to violence it was the constant theme of their conversations let us go to the king who is young and show him our servitude let us go together and when he shall see us he will grant us his grace of his own accord if not we will use other means the association formed round london was rapidly extending when an unforeseen incident in compelling the associates to act before they had attained sufficient strength and organization destroyed their hopes and left to the progress of european civilization the gradual abolition of servitude in england in the year thirteen eighty one the necessities of the government arising from the prosecution of the war and the luxury of the court occasioned the levy of a poll tax of twelve pence for every person of whatever station who had passed the age of fifteen the collection of this tax not having produced as much as had been expected commissioners were sent to inquire into the subject 
in their examination of the nobles and rich they were courteous and considerate but towards the lower classes they were excessively rigorous and insolent the indignation caused by these outrages created an insurrection headed by a tyler named walter or familiarly watt and surnamed from his trade tyler this movement created others in sussex bedfordshire and kent of which the priest john ball and one jack straw were appointed leaders the three chiefs and their band augmented on its march by all the labourers and serfs it met proceeded towards london to see the king said the simpler among the insurgents who expected everything from the mere interview they marched armed with iron-tipped staves and rusty swords and axes in disorder but not furious singing political songs two verses of which have been preserved when adam delved and eve span who was then the gentleman they plundered no one on their way but on the contrary paid scrupulously for all they needed the kentish men went first to canterbury to seize the archbishop who was also chancellor of england not finding him there they continued their march destroying the houses of the courtiers and those of the lawyers who had conducted suits brought against serfs by the nobles they also carried off several persons whom they kept as hostages among others a knight and his two sons they halted on blackheath where they entrenched themselves in a kind of camp they then proposed to the knight whom they had brought with them to go as messenger from them to the king who on the news of the insurrection had withdrawn to the tower of london the knight dared not refuse taking a boat he proceeded to the tower and kneeling before the king most dread lord he said deign to receive without displeasure the message i am fain to bring for dear lord it is by force i come deliver your message answered the king i will hold you excused sire the commons of your kingdom entreat you to come and speak with them they will see no one but yourself have no fear for your safety for they will do you no evil and will always hold you their king they will show you they say many things it is necessary for you to know and which they have not charged me to tell you but dear lord deign to give me an answer that they may know i have been with you for they hold my children as hostages the king having consulted with his advisers said that if on the following morning the peasants would come as far as rotherhithe he would meet them and speak with them this answer greatly delighted them they passed the night in the open air as well as they could for they were nearly sixty thousand in number and most of them fasted for want of food next day the twelfth of june the king heard mass in the tower and then despite the entreaties of the archbishop of canterbury who urged him not to compromise himself with shoeless vagabonds he proceeded in a barge accompanied by some knights to the opposite shore where about ten thousand men from the camp at blackheath had collected when they saw the barge approach they says foissart set up shouts and cries as if all the devils from hell had come in their company which so terrified the king's escort that they entreated him not to land and kept the barge at a distance from the bank what would you have said the king to the insurgents i am here to speak with you land and we will show you more readily what we would have the earl of salisbury answering for the king said sirs you are not in fit order for the king to come to you and the barge returned to the tower the insurgents went back to blackheath to tell their fellows what had occurred and there was now but one cry among them to london to london let us march upon london they marched accordingly to london destroying several manor houses on their way but without plundering them of anything arrived at london bridge they found the gates closed they demanded admission and urged the keepers not to drive them to use violence the mayor william walworth a man of english origin as his name indicates wishing to ingratiate himself to the king and the gentry was at first resolved to keep the gates shut and to post armed men on the bridge to stop the peasants but the citizens especially those of the middle and lower classes 
so decidedly opposed this project that he was fain to renounce it why said they why are we not to admit these good folk they are our people and whatever they do is for us the gate was opened and the insurgents overrunning the city distributed themselves among the houses in search of food which every one readily gave them from good will or from fear those who were first satisfied hastened to the palace of the duke of lancaster called the savoy and set fire to it out of hatred to this lord the king's uncle who had recently taken an active part in the administration of public affairs they burned all his valuable furniture without appropriating a single article and threw into the flames one of their party whom they detected carrying something away actuated by the same sentiments of political vengeance unmixed with other passion they put to death with a fantastic mockery of judicial form several of the king's officers they did no harm to men of the citizen and trading class whatever their opinions except to the lombards and flemings who conducted the banks in london under the protection of the court and several of whom as farmers of the taxes had rendered themselves accomplices in the oppression of the poor in the evening they assembled in great numbers in st catherine's square near the tower saying they would not leave the place until the king had granted them what they required they passed the night here from time to time sending forth loud shouts which terrified the king and the lords in the tower the latter held counsel with the mayor of london as to the best course to be pursued in so pressing a danger the mayor who had deeply compromised himself with the insurgents was for violent measures he said nothing could be easier than to defeat by a direct attack with regular forces a set of people running in disorder about the streets and scarce one in ten of whom was well armed his advice was not followed the king preferring the counsel of those who said if you can appease these people by good words it were best and most profitable for if we begin a thing we cannot achieve we shall never regain our ground in the morning the insurgents who had passed the night in st catherine's square set themselves in motion and declared that unless the king came to them forthwith they would take the tower by assault and put to death all that were within it the king sent word that if they would remove to mile end he would meet them there without fail and shortly after their departure he accordingly followed them accompanied by his two brothers by the earls of salisbury warwick and oxford and by several other barons as soon as they had quitted the tower those insurgents who had remained in the city entered it by force and running from chamber to chamber seized the archbishop of canterbury the king's treasurer and two other persons whom they decapitated and then stuck their heads upon pikes the main body of the insurgents numbering fifty thousand men was assembled at mile end when the king arrived at sight of the armed peasants his two brothers and several barons were alarmed and left him but he young as he was boldly advanced and addressing the rioters in the english tongue said good people i am your king and sire what want you what would you have from me those who were within hearing of what he said answered we would have you free us for ever us our children and our goods so that we be no longer called serfs or held in serfage be it so said the king return to your houses by villages as you came and only leave behind you two or three men of each place i will have forthwith written and sealed with my seal letters which they shall carry with them and which shall freely secure unto you all you ask and i forgive you all you have done hitherto but you must return every one of you to your houses as i have said the letters were distributed and the men started for their homes john ball and wat tyler however felt little confidence in the letters they brought together several thousand men and declared that they should remain in london until the king had given them far more definite concessions and also security that these concessions would be kept their firmness produced its effect upon the lords of the court who not venturing as yet to employ force advised the king to have an interview with the chiefs of the revolt in smithfield the peasants having received this notification repaired thither to await the king who came escorted by the mayor and aldermen of london and by several courtiers and knights he drew up his horse at a certain distance from the insurgents and sent an officer to say that he was present and that the leader who was to speak for them might advance that leader am i answered wat tyler and heedless of the danger to which he exposed himself he ordered his men not to move hand or foot until he should give them a signal and then rode boldly up to the king approaching him so near 
that his horse's head touched the flank of richard's steed without any obsequious forms he proceeded explicitly to demand certain rights the natural result of the enfranchisement of the people namely the right of buying and selling freely in towns and out of towns and that right of hunting in all forests parks and commons and of fishing in all waters which the men of english race had lost at the conquest the king hesitated to reply and meantime wat tyler whether from impatience or to show by his gestures that he was not intimidated played with a short sword he had in his hand and tossed it to and fro the mayor of london william walworth who rode beside the king thinking that wat tyler menaced richard or simply carried away by passion struck the insurgent a blow on the head with his mace and knocked him from his horse the king's suite surrounded him to conceal for a moment what was passing and a squire of norman birth named philpot dismounting thrust his sword into tyler's heart and killed him the insurgents perceiving that their chief was no longer on horseback set themselves in motion exclaiming they have slain our captain let us kill them all and those who had bows bent them to shoot upon the king and his train king richard displayed extraordinary courage he quitted his attendants saying remain and let none follow me and then advanced alone towards the peasants forming in battle array whom he thus addressed my lieges what are you doing what want you you have no other captain than i tyler was a traitor i am your king and will be your captain and guide remain at peace follow me into the fields and i will give you what you ask astonishment at this proceeding and the impression ever produced on the masses by him who possesses the sovereign power induced the main body of the insurgents to follow the king as it were by a mechanical instinct while richard withdrew talking with them the mayor hastened into the city rung the alarm bell and had it cried through the streets they are killing the king they are killing the king as the insurgents had quitted the city the english and foreign gentlemen and the rich citizens who sided with the nobles and who had remained in arms in their houses with their people fearful of pillage all came forth and several thousand in number the majority being on horseback and completely armed and hastened towards the open fields about islington whither the insurgents were marching in disorder expecting no attack as soon as the king saw them approach he galloped up to them and joining their ranks ordered an attack upon the peasants who taken by surprise and seized with a panic terror fled in every direction most of them throwing down their arms great carnage was made of them and many of the fugitives re-entering london concealed themselves in the houses of their friends not in london alone but throughout the land there was uproar and rebellion the poorly armed peasants were met by the nobles who had weapons and armour and castles the result was of course the suppression of the revolt the leaders were put to death and the villeins were driven back to their former condition of servitude as the king's proclamation to them declared the lions you were and are and in bondage you shall remain End of section forty eight this recording is in the public domain section forty nine of england this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patrick Seaman. The World Story, Volume 9, England. Edited by Ava March Tappan. Section 49. The Hunting of the Cheviot, 1388. In the times of disagreement between England and Scotland, there were continual border forays, about which stirring ballads were afterwards written the best of these is chevy chase or the hunting of the cheviot which sir philip sidney said moved his heart more than the sound of a trumpet this contest was fought between the douglas family who dwelt on the scottish side and the percys whose home was on the english one family would start out with all the retainers for a day's hunting on the other side of the border then if they met the other family a thing that both parties hoped would come to pass there was a fight the ballad is a spirited account of this foray and fight the editor the percy out of northumberland and a vow to god may he that he would hunt in the mountains of cheviot within days three and the maugre of doughty douglas 
and all that ever with him be. The fattest hearts in all Cheviot, he said he would kill and carry them away. By my face at the doughty Dulles again, I will let that hunting if I may. And the Percy of Bamboro came, with him a mighty meanie, with fifteen hundred archers bold of blood and bone. They were chosen out of Shire's three. This began on a Monday at morn, in Cheviot the hills so high. The child may ruin that is unborn, it was more the pity. The drivers through the woods went, for to raise the deer. Bowmen bickered upon the bent, with their broad arrows clear. Then the wild Thoreau the woods went, on every side sheer. Greyhounds Thoreau the greaves glent, for to kill their deer. They began in Cheviot, the hills above, early on Munnan day. By that it drew to the hour of noon, a hundred fat hearts dead there lay. They blew a mort upon the bent, they assembled on sides sheer. To the quarry then the Percy went, to the brittling of the deer. He said, it was the Douglas's promise this day to meet me here, but I wist he would fail betterment. A great oath the Percy swear. At the last, a squire of Northumberland looked at his hand full nigh. He was aware of the doughty Douglas coming, with him a mighty meanie. Both with spear, bill, and brand, it was a mighty sight to see. Hardier men, both of heart nor hand, were not in Christianity. There were twenty hundred spearmen good, without him any fail. They were borne along by the water of Tweed, in the bounds of Tiddydale. Leave off the brittling the deer, he said, to your bows look ye take good heed, for never since ye were on your mother's born had ye never so mickle need. The doubtly Douglas on a steed he rode at his men for form, his armor glinted as a gleed, a bolder bairn was never born. Tell me who ye are, he says, or whose men that ye be, who gave you leave to hunt in the Cheviot chase, in the spite of me. The first man that ever him an answer made, it was the good Lord Percy. He would not tell thee whose men we are, he says, nor whose men that we be, but we will hunt here in this chase, in the spite of thine and of thee. The fattest hearts in all Cheviot, we have killed and cast to carry them away. By my troth of the doughty Douglas again, therefore the one of us shall die this day. Then said the doughty Douglas unto the Lord Percy, To kill all these guiltless men, alas, it were great pity. But Percy, thou art a lord of land, I am an earl called within my country. Let all our men upon a party stand, and do the battle of thee and of me. Now a curse on his crown, said the Lord Percy. Whoever thereto says nay, by my troth, doughty Douglas, he says, thou shalt never see that day. Neither in England, Scotland, nor France, nor for no man of a woman born, but in fortune be my chance. I dare meet him, one man for one. Then bespake of squire of Northumberland, Richard Witherington was his name. It shall never be told in South England, he says, to King Henry the Fourth for shame. I what ye been, great lord, is too. I am a squire of land. I will never see my captain fight on a field, and stand myself and look on. But while I may my weapon wield, I will not fail both heart and hand. That day, that day, that dreadful day, the first fit here I find. And you will hear any more o' oh, the hunting, o' oh, the Cheviot, yet is there more behind. The Englishmen had their bows e bent, their hearts would good, and now, the first of arrows that they shot off, seven score spearmen they slew. Yet bides the Earl Douglas upon the bent, a captain good and now, and that was seen verament, for he wrought them both woe and woe. The Douglas parted his host in three, like a chief chieftain of pride. 
with sure spears of mighty tree, they came in on every side. Through our English archery gave many a wound full wide, many a doughty they guard to die, which gained them no pride. The Englishmen let their bows be, and pulled out brands that were bright. It was a heavy sight to see, bright swords on bastards light. Through rich mail and manipole, many stern they stroke down straight, many a freak that was full free, their under foot did light. At last the Douglas and the Percy met, like the captains of might and of main. They swapped together till they both swept, with swords that are fine Malin. These worthy freaks for to fight, their two they were full fain, till the blood out of their bastards sprent, as ever did hail or rain. Hold thee, Percy, said the Douglas, and I, faith, I'll she thee bring, where thou shalt have an earl's wages. Of Jamie, our Scottish king, thou shalt have thy ransom free. I hight thee here this thing, for the manfullest man yet art thou, that ever I conquered in field fighting. Nay, said the Lord Percy, I told it thee before, that I would never yield it thee to no man of a woman born. With that there came an arrow hastily forth of a mighty wane. And hath stricken the Earl Douglas in at the breast bay. Thorough liver and lungs bath, the sharp arrow is gone, that never after in all his live days he spake no words but one, that was, Fight ye, my merry men, or ye may, for my life days be gone. The Percy leaned on his brand and saw the Douglas die. He took the dead man by the hand and said, Woe is me for thee. To have saved thy life I have parted with my lands for years three. For a better man of heart nor of hand was not in all the north country. Of all that saw a Scottish knight was called Sir Hugh Montgomery. He saw the Douglas to the death was dight. He spended a spear, a trusty tree. He rode upon a courser, Thoreau a hundred archery. He never stinted, nor never blamed, till he came to the good Lord Percy. He said upon the Lord Percy a dint that was full sore, with a sure spear of a mighty tree, clean through the body he the Percy bore. And to other side, that a man might see, a large cloth yard and mare, two better captains were not in Christianity, than that day slain were there. An archer of Northumberland saw slain was the Lord Percy. He bare a bent bow in his hand, was made of trusty tree. An arrow that a cloth yard was long, to the hard steel held he. A dint that was both sad and sore, he set on Sir Hugh Montgomery. The dint it was both sad and sore, yet he on Montgomery set. The swan feathers that his arrow bore, with his heart blood they were wet. There was never a freak when foot would flee, but still in our store did stand, hewing on each other while they might dree with many a baleful brand. This battle began in Cheviot, an hour before the noon, and when even song bell was rung, the battle was not half done. They took on either hand by the light of the moon. Many had no strength for to stand in Cheviot, the hills of Boone. Of fifteen hundred archers of England went away but fifty and three. Of twenty hundred spearmen of Scotland but even five and fifty. But all were slain Cheviot within. They had no strength to stand on high. The child may rue that is unborn. It was the more pitié. There was slain with the Lord Percy, Sir John of Argerstone, Sir Roger behind Hartley, Sir William, the bold heron, Sir George, the worthy Lovell, a knight of great renown, Sir Ralph, the rich rugby, with dints were beaten down. For Witherington my heart was woe, that ever he slain should be. For when both his legs were hewn in two, yet he kneeled and fought on his knee. 
There was slain with the doughty Douglas, Sir Hugh Montgomery, Sir Davy Ledow, that worthy was, his sister's son was he. Sir Charles O'Murray in that place, that never a foot would flee. Sir Hugh Maxwell, a lord he was, with the Douglas did he dee. So on the morrow they made them beers, of birch and hazel so grey. Many widows with weeping tears came to fetch their mates away. Tivydale may carp of care, Northumberland may make great moan, for two such captains as slain were there, on the march party shall never be none. Word has come to Edinburgh, to Jamie the Scottish king, the doughty Douglas, lieutenant of the marshes, he they slain Cheviot within. He hands did he wheel and ring, he said, Alas, and woe is me, such and another captain Scotland within, he said, in faith should never be. What is come to lovely London, to the fourth Harry, our king, that Lord Percy, lieutenant of the marches, he lay slain Cheviot within? God have mercy on his soul, said King Harry. Good Lord, if thy will it be, I have a hundred captains in England, he said as good as ever was he. But Percy, as I brook my life, thy death will quit shall be. As our noble king made his avow, like a noble prince of renown, for the death of the Lord Percy, he did the battle of Hommeldown. Where six and thirty Scottish knights on the day were beaten down, Glendale glittered on their armor bright over castle, tower, and town. This was the hunting of the Cheviot, that tear began this spurn. Old men that know the ground wheel and now, call it the Battle of Otterburn. At Otterburn began this spurn, upon a monon day, there was the doughty Douglas slain, the Percy never went away. There was never a time on the march parties, since the Douglas and the Percy met, but it was marvel and the red blood ran not, as the rain does in the street. And now may heaven amend us all, and to the bliss us bring. Thus was the hunting of the Cheviot. God send us all good ending. End of section 49. This recording is in the public domain. Section 50 of England this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 9, England, edited by Eva March Tapin, Section 50. The Mystery Plays by Eva March Tapin Long before the Middle Ages, the priests in various countries often acted stories from the Bible, such as the birth of Christ, in order to impress them upon the minds of the people. These were acted in the church, then on platforms in the churchyard. But so many came to see them that the graves were trampled upon and it was decreed that they should be acted on other ground. These plays did not always follow the Bible narrative strictly, but added old legends or any incidents that it was thought would interest the people. For instance, in one of the plays of The Garden of Eden, when Adam took the apple, he apparently tried to swallow it whole, for the play says that it stuck in his throat, causing the Adam's apple. In the play of the slaughter of the innocents, an old tradition is brought in that by mistake Herod's own baby son was slain. In the play of the shepherds, the honest men talk together about how to care for their sheep. They sit down and eat their supper, bread, butter, pudding, onions, garlic and likes, green cheese and a sheep's head soused in oil a noble supper, as one of them calls it. 
After supper, masters and boys are wrestling together when a bright star blazes out. They kneel down and pray to God to tell them why it was sent. Then the angel Gabriel appears to them and sings, Glory to God in the highest, on earth peace, good will toward men. This is sung in Latin, of course, as it would not have seemed to a writer in the Middle Ages at all respectful to represent an angel as singing in English. The shepherds have rather a hard time with the Latin, but they make out some of the words. They talk about the singing. One of them says of the angel, he had a much better voice than I have. Then they sing together a merry song. The angel appears again and tells them that Christ is born in Bethlehem. After they have gone to find him, the three shepherd boys set out to follow their masters. They wish that they had something to carry to the child, but they have only the few things that they use themselves. One therefore gives the child his water bottle, which he says is good, only it needs a stopper. The second takes off his own hood for a gift, and the third presents him with a nut hook to pull down apples, pears and plums. In almost all of these plays there was considerable fun making and horse play. Just as the good folks of the Middle Ages saw no harm in making a pilgrimage, a merry and entertaining little journey, so in the mystery plays they demanded to be amused as well as instructed. In the play of The Flood, Noah's wife is indignant that her husband has worked on the ark so many years without telling her. She declares that she will not enter it, and she finally has to be dragged in by Noah and his sons. Herod struts about the stage. He boasts how mighty a king he is, and how easily he can destroy the child who has been born in Bethlehem. Then there must have been loud guffaws of laughter from the audience when the devil rushed in and carried him off. Satan was the clown, the fun maker, and whenever he appeared people watched eagerly to see him fooled and cheated by some good spirit. He always wore a dress of leather, ending in claws at the fingers and toes. The souls of the good were dazzling in their white coats, while the wicked were robed in black and yellow, with sometimes a touch of crimson. When Satan and his evil spirits made their appearance, they came by way of hell mouth. This was a great pair of gaping jaws made of painted linen and worked by two men. A fire was lighted to look as if Hellmouth were full of flame. Some of the items in the old expense accounts are amusing reading. For the mending of Hellmouth, for keeping up the fire at Hellmouth, sound rather alarming. One item was for a barrel to make an earthquake, another was for a beard for St. Peter, and yet another for a quart of wine to pay for hiring a gown for the wife of Herod. Long before the plays became so elaborate as to demand so many properties, they passed into the hands of the craft guilds. In the early part of the 13th century, most of the guilds fixed upon Corpus Christi Day for their chief celebration. They marched in procession, carrying sacred pictures and images of the saints. Often members of the guild took the parts of Bible characters and at length the whole Bible stories were acted. These were played in pageants or great lumbering wagons two or three stories high. The lower part was covered with a curtain and here the actors dressed. The second floor was the stage upon which the acting took place. The third floor, if there was one, represented heaven. An attempt was made to have each scene as realistic as possible. For instance, the stage directions for the play of The Creation ordered that as many animals as could be obtained should be suddenly let loose. Each guild has its own special play. One would play The Three Kings, another The Crucifixion, another The Murder of Abel, and so on. 
In England they were so arranged that the main stories of the Bible were played in the biblical order, beginning with the creation and ending with the last judgment. Early in the morning the ponderous pageants were dragged out to the different streets of the town. Sometimes men of means paid a good price to have them stop in front of their houses. As soon as a play had been acted, each one moved on and acted the same play in another place. This was usually continued through three days, and a person who remained in one place could see the whole cycle of plays, while if he cared to see any one of them repeated, he had only to follow the pageant to the next street. The plays were entertaining, and that was reason enough for bringing together a good audience. Moreover, to attend them was thought to be particularly good for one's soul, and to do something religious and be entertained while doing it was regarded by the good folk of the Middle Ages as a most excellent arrangement. As for the guilds, at first they looked upon presenting these plays as an honour and also a religious privilege. They chose the actors from their members and paid them in proportion to the length of their speeches and the amount of stage business for which they were responsible. In the play of St. Peter in Coventry, the man who did the crowing was paid four pence, but when he also attended to the hanging of Judas, he received ten pence more. The guild had to pay these charges, buy costumes and keep them in order, and provide good provisions for the actors at rehearsals. It is true that collections were taken up in the street to help pay expenses, but the burden was still a heavy one. Then, too, trades changed with the changing fashions. Sometimes one trade was divided into two. In 1492, the blacksmiths and the bladesmiths in a town separated. This resulted in two weak guilds instead of one strong one, and the whole expense of a pageant was a serious tax on each. As time passed, the guilds made strenuous objections to keeping up the plays. But now the law stepped in, and in many towns they were required to produce their pageants or else pay a large fine. In London a number of guilds still exist, but the procession which takes place whenever a Lord Mayor is to be inducted into office is the last reminder of the old trade pageants. End of section 50. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Alan Mapstone in Oxford, England. Section 51 of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 9, England, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 51, Country Life in the Days of the Plantagenets, by Eva March Tappan. During the greater part of the Middle Ages, most of the land was held by feudal tenure, that is, on condition of service. Everybody needed service of some sort. A king might own vast areas of land, but unless the nobles would fight for him, he could not keep it from his enemies. The nobles might hold wide estates, but they were worthless unless men could be found to cultivate them. As for the common people, their first and foremost need was protection. So it was that the feudal system grew up. The king would agree to grant land to a noble provided the noble would become his vassal. To do this, the noble was obliged to go to the king's court and kneel before him. The king then held the clasped hands of the noble in his own and asked, Do you wish to become my man? The noble replied, I do. The king then kissed him in token of confidence and acceptance and the noble took a solemn oath on the Gospels or relics of the saints to be faithful. This ceremony was called doing homage. It bound the king to aid and protect the noble, and not to interfere with his control of the land in his hands. 
it bound the noble to be faithful to the king and to fight for him when fighting was necessary and to provide at his own expense a fixed number of followers for the king to demand money and for the noble to pay it would have seemed to both of them somewhat humiliating but to follow his king in battle and to be loyal to him was quite in accordance with the taste and training of the noble even in later times as the demand for military force increased the king did not venture to suggest paying wages to knights to fight for him instead of that money fiefs were invented that is a fixed sum was paid to vassals yearly on condition of their performing military service this was practically the same thing as hiring soldiers but calling the arrangement a fief the name given to a grant of land saved the pride of the knights and gave the king his soldiers the military service required of a vassal was generally limited to forty days in a year if more was needed the king must pay all expenses if the military service was to be rendered in a foreign country the noble was free to come home at the end of forty days he must also help the king by his advice and must submit in any lawsuit of his own to the decision of the king and his fellow vassals and he must provide entertainment for the king when on a journey on free occasions he was expected to assist the king with money but this was never called payment or rent for land it was always spoken of as aid these occasions were one when the king's eldest son was made a knight two when the king's eldest daughter was married three when the king had been taken prisoner by some foreign power it was necessary to ransom him in theory the king had a right to take back the grant of land but unless a vassal was unfaithful it was sold into his advantage to do so if one vessel was wronged by another he might appeal to their king but it was in most cases a long way to the royal court it was dangerous to leave one's castle exposed to an enemy and it was more simple and direct for the two nobles to fight it out if a vassal died, it was generally for the gain of both parties that his eldest son should take the father's place as vassal. The lord imposed a tax, however, called Harriet, usually the best beast of the dead man. The son, too, was required to pay a tax or relief on taking possession of the land in his father's stead. The accepted belief was that every fief should supply to the king the service of a man. If the vassal's son was a child at his father's death, the king brought him up. But to make good the loss of a fighting man, he kept the income of the fief until the boy was old enough to perform a knight's service. If the vassal left only a widow or a daughter, she must pay a fine to the king if she did not wish to marry. If she was willing to marry, the king had the right to select her husband. This was to prevent her from choosing a man who might perhaps be an enemy to the king. This was the feudal system, or rather it was the beginning of it. It is quite probable that in many countries at some time in their history, land has been held by this method. Of course, it was not decided upon, and the land divided in a moment in any country, but the custom grew up gradually. The system was in reality a perfect network of lords and vassals, for not only were the nobles vassals of the king, but they themselves had vassals and those vassals had others who paid homage to them. Indeed, a man might do homage to a number of men for separate pieces of land. In that case, however, he owed military service to but one of them, and this one was known as his liege lord. The vassal was not looked upon as in any degree inferior to the lords. A king might rule one country, and yet pay homage to the ruler of another for his fief in that land. When William the Norman conquered England, he took possession of the country much as if it had been his own big farm. He allowed those who yielded to him to retain their land on payment of large fees. The rest of it he divided among his followers as fiefs. But William was Duke of Normandy, and therefore he himself paid homage to the French king for his Norman land. This descended from one English ruler to another. But when John came to the throne, the French king Philip II, declared that he was a disobedient and unfaithful vassal, and took it away by capturing the Chateau Gallard and his other strongholds. There were several ways in which smaller amounts of land came into the hands of the nobles. The church held large areas. 
but the clergy were forbidden to wield the sword. Therefore parts of their holdings were sometimes let to knights on condition of their providing the required number of soldiers. Again, this was a time of fighting and bloodshed, of danger and violence, and many a man who owned a bit of freehold could not protect it. In that case, he would often commend himself to some powerful man. That is, he would promise to be faithful to him and be his loyal vassal. He now had a strong arm to defend him, and he was sure of food and clothes. The result of all this was that by the 13th century, it might almost be said, no land without a lord. But manors were of small value, unless they were cultivated. In these days, if a man owns a large farm, he hires labourers to work on it. But in the Middle Ages, the cultivation of the land was managed in quite a different fashion. Nothing has been said as yet of the common folk, the many thousand people who were neither clergy nor nobles. They were the ones who did the work of the manors. They were of various ranks. A few were slaves and were looked upon as having no more rights than a horse or a cow. Above these were the villains, they could not be sold like slaves, but if the manor passed from one law to another, they went with it. Each villian held a definite amount of land, and was required to pay for its use partly in money or in produce, and partly in labour. The villians were divided into several classes, each having some special rights or some exemption from undesirable duties, which was of great value to them. Above these were the free tenants. They paid for the use of their land sometimes in service and sometimes entirely in money. The buildings on a manor were the manor house, in which either the lord or his agent lived, the tiny cottages of the tenants, a church, a windmill, and the various barns and other outbuildings needed. The manor house was a little apart from the others. It was usually of stone, but its character depended in great degree upon the location. In England, for instance, the important houses near the Scottish border were built strong enough to serve as forts, and indeed most of the larger houses in the more level parts of the country were surrounded by moats and had various means of defence. In the simpler houses there was a hall, and adjoining it a kitchen. On the other side of the hall and up a flight of stairs was the solar. This was the bedroom and parlour of the lord and his wife. The rest of the household and their guests slept in the hall or in the stables, or in any other place where they would be under a roof even one thatched with reeds from the pond. As time passed, houses were built with more rooms, often enough to enclose a courtyard and three sides, while the fourth was shut in by a wall. Around the whole structure was a moat with a drawbridge. The windows were small. There were turrets and other places from which arrows might be shot in safety. In short, these manor houses were in many respects almost as well fortified as real castles. The cottages were ranged along the one street of the manor, miserable little one-room sheds of clay, the roofs thatched with straw stubble and having neither windows nor chimneys. The land of the manor was cultivated in three large fields. Usually one produced wheat or barley, and one oats, while the third lay fallow. The second year, the field that had lain fallow was planted, and another field had a time of rest. This was an extravagant manner of farming, for one third of the land was always idle, but men had not fully learned how to enrich the soil, and therefore they were forced to allow it to rest. Each tenant had a larger or smaller share in these fields, but the land was divided in a peculiar fashion. It was marked off into long narrow strips, generally about forty rods long and four rods wide, separated from one another by strips of unploughed turf called bulks. The holdings of the different tenants were scattered over the manor, and much time must have been wasted in going from one to another. A man who held thirty acres, or a burgate, would have to care for land in thirty or more different places. Even the land which the lord of the manor reserved for himself was scattered in the same way. The use of clover and the grasses which can be cultivated in dry places and stored away for winter was not known. Therefore, the meadow land of the manor was of great value. There was always a common pasture in which sheep and cattle might range, and there was a woodland wherein the tenants' pigs might find food for themselves. 
the tenants were obliged to grind their grain in the Lord's mill, bake their bread in his oven, press their grapes in his wine press, and of course pay a good price for the privileges. They must pay for letting their pigs run in the forest, for cutting wood and often for catching fish, and for the use of their Lord's weights and measures. They paid him a share of what they raised, and they paid one-tenth of their income to the church, besides fees at every birth, baptism, marriage and death. Even what was left of their produce they were forbidden to sell, until the produce of their Lord's land had been sold. This land, or the Demesne, they were obliged to cultivate, each villian doing an amount of work in proportion to the area which he held. The lists of the men and the work required of each were called extents. An extent usually stated, first the size of the manor and how it was divided, how many acres of arable land, pasture, meadow and woodland it contained, and how often the manor court was accustomed to meet. Then came the list of the tenants, what rent they paid and what work was required of them. On one of the English manors, for instance, there were seven free tenants. One of them was the son of a knight. He held 18 acres and paid for his land 36 pence a year. Apparently these free tenants were not obliged to do any work on the Mesne. Some of the villian tenants, however, had to do so many kinds of work that it is a wonder how they knew when it was finished. One poor man had to work for his land three days a week for 11 months of the year, save for a week at Christmas, Easter and Whitsuntide and find his own food. He must weed, help plough and mow, carry in hay, reap and haul grain. It was carefully stated just when the Lord would provide food for him, and how much and what kind. When this man and the other villians were mowing, they were allowed three bushels of wheat, one ram worth eighteen pence, one jar of butter, and one cheese next to the best from the dairy of the Lord and salt and oatmeal for their porridge and all the morning milk. They had also several definite prerequisites while they were doing this work. For instance, at the close of each day, every man might have as much green grass as he could carry on the point of his scythe, and when the hay was in, he might have a cartful. At harvest time, each worker might have three handfuls for every load of grain that he brought in besides the weekly work during the greater part of the year. There were also boon works in time of ploughing, planting and harvest. For these the tenant must leave his own land, often when it needed him most, and give his time to that of his lord. In short, more than one half of the time of the average villian had to be given to the lord of the manor. Just how some of the Jews were paid is a little confusing, one tenant, for instance, was bound to pay the Lord every Christmas one hen and a half, the hen being of the price of one and a half pence. Several women held lands on the same terms as the men. The extent also stated the value of the rents, the hens given to the Lord, the use of the mill, the right to fish, and all the service performed by the tenants, and it told where the pillory and ducking stool stood. In this case, there was more than one reason to avoid these instruments of punishment, for they were placed next to the Lord's pigsty. Legal questions often arose on a manor. Land was transferred from one person to another. Fines were to be imposed, crimes were to be punished, and to decide these matters a court was held regularly. This was convenient for the tenants, but it can hardly have been invariably just for the Lord or his agent was the judge, and he generally had a personal interest in the case. Moreover, the various fines and fees went straight into his own purse. That must have made it a temptation to inflict as heavy ones as would be borne. In theory, there could be an appeal to the king, but the king was usually a long way off. Travel was not safe, and in any case, the word of a villain would count little when opposed to the word of a noble. A manor did not run itself. It had three chief officials besides its lord. First was the reeve. He was one of the tenants, and his business was to carry on the cultivation of the lord's land. Then there was the bailiff, who took charge of the whole manor, 
saw that the work was done and the produce sold. But a noble often held a number of manors, and so a steward was also required, who went from one manor to another to examine the accounts of each, held court, and take general charge of the estates. So it was that the reeve watched the tenants, the bailiff watched the reeve, the steward watched the bailiff, and finally an accountant, sometimes a relative of the lord, watched the steward, and collected the money from the different manors. Over them all was the lord himself. He and his family and servants went from one manor to another, partly to use up what they could of produce on the spot, and partly, it is whispered, because so little attention was paid to cleanliness, that it was the part of comfort as well as wisdom to allow a house to sweeten after it had been occupied for some weeks, a manor required far less from the outside world than any village or city in these days. Food with the exception of salt and delicacies brought for the use of the Lord grew on the land. Hemp and wool were raised, spun into yarn, woven and made into clothes on the spot. Sandals could be made by anyone, and rough shoes could be put together by the shoemaker of the manor. There was also a carpenter, who could easily put up the wattled huts of the tenants. If anything more elaborate was to be undertaken, like the building of a church, Builders were sent for from away. The blacksmith mended the tools and farming implements and often made them. Clumsy, inconvenient things they were. The sides were short and straight, and the sickles small and heavy. The great wooden ploughs were so big and cumbersome that even with eight oxen to pull them, they cut into the ground only a little way, and a second ploughing was usually necessary. Enriching the land and draining the soil were rarely practised during the early part of the Middle Ages. Crops at best were small, often not more than one-third of what the same amount of land would produce today. Frequently they failed altogether, because so little was known of agriculture, and even when there was a year of plenty, it was hardly safe to sell the surplus, for it might all be needed during the following year. The tenant had a hard life, but he was sure of as much protection as his lord could give, of a place to stay in, and of an opportunity to raise something to eat. He had no freedom, but in the times when freedom meant danger, one does not grieve so sorely over the loss of liberty. William Langland, who wrote Piers Plowman, tells how constantly the women worked. They must spin and card and comb wool, he says, trying to earn enough to pay the rent and the cost of milk and meal to feed their little ones. They must mend and wash and reel and peel rushes, so that it is a sad story to read the sufferings of the women who live in cottages. But as the years passed, the times changed. The tenants took little interest in the forced cultivation of their lord's land, and with all the watching it sold and brought in as much income as it might certainly not as much as the lords desired, for many luxuries were now imported. People were interested in building, and they developed a taste for living comfortably. These changes had been caused in great degree by the crusades or military expeditions to rescue the Holy Land from the Saracens. But whatever was the cause, the nobles wanted money. The villains, on the other hand, wanted to get rid of forced labour, Buying a release and disagreeable duties was quite in fashion. Even nobles often brought themselves free from entertaining the king. In many cases, the peasants were permitted to buy a release from the services that they especially disliked. In some instances, where the lord was in pressing need of money, he insisted upon a tenant's buying his freedom. If a lord had a good supply of workmen, a tenant was sometimes allowed to leave the manor on condition of paying a tax. The church was the friend of the tenant. It taught that to free a serf was a deed pleasing to God, and if the son of the poorest serf showed intellectual ability and aptitude for the priesthood, it demanded his release. It is thought that William Langland was a villain and became free on entering the church. A tenant could sometimes escape to some city and find friends who would conceal him, and in England there was a law that if a man could succeed in remaining hidden for a year and a day, he was forever free. 
Many of these runaways knew some trade by which they could support themselves. They were tanners, carpenters, saddlers, shoemakers, blacksmiths, and tailors among them. Early in the 14th century, the weaving of fine woollens was introduced into England, and at this trade especially, a man could earn a good support. Little by little, then, the villains were discovering that the lords needed them quite as much as they needed the lords. If a lord did not treat his labourers well, he would be likely to lose some of them. As time passed, more and more of the tenants paid rent instead of giving service, and the lords could not always get as much service as they needed. More and more men became free to go from one manor to another as hired labourers. Villainage would probably have slowly disappeared in any case, but in the 14th century the system received two great shocks. One was the fact that when England fought France at the Battle of Crecy, the day was won for the English, not by knights in steel armour, but by yeomen with their bows and arrows. The other was the terrible Black Death, a pestilence which swept over Europe, it is thought to have destroyed nearly one-third as many people as there are in the United States. Then the lords or their heirs were in difficulties. They received a heriot on the death of a villain, and the usual leaf from his heir. But so many had died that few manners had men enough left to do the necessary work. The success at Creasy had shown the common folk that were able to protect themselves, and now that labourers were few, they began to see that they were an important part of the population. In England occurred an uprising known as the Peasants' Revolt. The chief demand of these peasants was to be free from villainage, and although the revolters were severely punished, villainage rapidly disappeared. France, too, had learned a lesson from her defeats at Crecy and elsewhere, for she had found that her knights in all their armour could not protect their country. People began to question if knights cannot even guard their own land, what is the use of knighthood? And both knighthood and the manor system gradually disappeared. But although the system has vanished, it still influences the law. For instance, the belief of the Middle Ages was that the land of a country belonged to the king and was granted by him to his vassals for life. And today, if a man in England dies into state and without heirs, his land goes to the king. In America it goes to the state, so it is that the people of the 20th century are affected by the beliefs and customs of the people who lived on manners many hundred years ago. End of section 51England, Part Eight, Lancaster and York. Historical Note: Opposition to the arbitrary government of Richard II, thirteen seventy-seven to thirteen ninety-nine, the last of the Plantagenet kings, resulted in the giving of the crown to his cousin, the Duke of Lancaster, who ascended the throne as Henry the Fourth by his son henry v the old claim to the crown of france was renewed and the english king was so successful that it was promised to him when the french king should die after henry's death this claim was pressed in behalf of the baby king of england henry the sixth but a great popular rising of the french people inspired by joan of arc stripped england of all her conquests in france except calais and guienne there were many in england who believed that the crown should have been given to richard of york rather than to henry of lancaster the result was the breaking out of civil war in fourteen fifty five the badge of the house of lancaster was a red rose that of the house of york a white rose therefore the struggle which now commenced was called the wars of the roses during the thirty years of civil war the crown was held successively by edward the fourth of york henry the sixth of lancaster lifted to the throne by the earl of warwick the king maker edward the fifth of york and richard the third his uncle in fourteen eighty five richard was defeated and killed on bosworth field by henry tudor of the lancaster family and the long struggle was at last ended in fourteen seventy one in the midst of the civil war 
william caxton established at westminster the first english printing press end of section fifty two this recording is in the public domain section fifty three of england this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world story volume nine england edited by eva marsh tappan section number fifty three the coronation of henry the fourth thirteen ninety nine by sir john froissart on a wednesday the last day of september thirteen ninety nine henry duke of lancaster held a parliament at westminster at which were assembled a greater part of the clergy and nobility of england and a sufficient number of deputies from the different towns according to their extent and wealth in this parliament the duke of lancaster challenged the crown of england and claimed it as his own for three reasons first by conquest secondly from being the right heir to it and thirdly from the pure and free resignation of it to him by king richard in the presence of the prelates dukes and earls in the hall of the tower of london these three claims being made he required the parliament to declare their opinion and will upon this they unanimously replied that it was their will he should be king for they would have no other he again asked if they were positive in this declaration when they said they were he seated himself on the royal throne the throne was elevated some feet from the floor with a rich canopy of cloth and gold so that he could be seen by all present on the king's taking his seat the people clapped their hands for joy and held them up promising him fealty and homage the parliament was then dissolved and the day of coronation appointed for the feast of st edward which fell on a monday the thirteenth of october on the saturday before the coronation the new king went from westminster to the tower of london attended by great numbers and those squires who were to be knighted watched their arms that night they amounted to forty-six each squire had his chamber and bath in which he bathed the ensuing day the duke of lancaster after mass created them knights and presented them with long green coats with straight sleeves lined with miniver after the manner of prelates these knights had on their left shoulders a double cord of white silk with white tufts hanging down the duke of lancaster left the tower this sunday after dinner on his return to westminster he was bareheaded and had round his neck the order of the king of france the prince of wales six dukes six earls eighteen barons accompanied him and there were of knights and other nobility from eight to nine hundred horse in the procession the duke was dressed in a jacket after the german fashion of cloth of gold mounted on a white courser with a blue garter on his left leg he passed through the streets of london which were all handsomely decorated with tapestries and other rich hangings there were nine fountains in cheapside and other streets he passed through which perpetually ran with white and red wines he was escorted by prodigious numbers of gentlemen with their servants in liveries and badges and the different companies of london were led by their wardens clothed in their proper livery and with ensigns of their trade the whole cavalcade amounted to six thousand horse which escorted the duke from the tower to westminster that same night the duke bathed and on the morrow confessed himself as he had good need to and according to his custom heard three masses the prelates and clergy who had been assembled then came in a large body in procession from westminster abbey to conduct the king thither and returned in the same manner the king and his lords following them the dukes earls and barons wore long scarlet robes with mantles trimmed with ermine and large hoods of the same the dukes and earls had three bars of ermine on the left arm a quarter of a yard long or thereabout the barons had but two all the knights and squires had uniform cloaks of scarlet lined with miniver in the procession to the church the duke had borne over his head a rich canopy of blue silk supported on silver staves with four golden bells that rang at the corners 
by four burgesses of dover who claimed it as their right on each side of him were the sword of mercy and the sword of justice the first was borne by the prince of wales and the other by the earl of northumberland constable of england for the earl of rutland had been dismissed the earl of westmoreland marshal of england carried the sceptre the procession entered the church about nine o'clock in the middle of which was a scaffold covered with crimson cloth and in the centre a royal throne of cloth of gold when the dukes entered the church he seated himself on the throne and was thus in regal state except having the crown on his head the archbishop of canterbury proclaimed from the four corners of the scaffold how god had given them a man for their lord and sovereign and then asked the people if they were consenting to his being consecrated and crowned king they unanimously shouted ay and held up their hands promising fealty and homage after this the duke descended from his throne and advanced to the altar to be consecrated this ceremony was performed by two archbishops and ten bishops he was stripped of all his royal state before the altar naked to his shirt and was then anointed and consecrated at six places that is to say on the head the breast the two shoulders before and behind on the back and hands then they placed a bonnet on his head and while this was doing the clergy chanted the litany or the service that is performed to hallow a font the king was now dressed in a churchman's clothes like a deacon and they put on him shoes of crimson velvet after the manner of a prelate then they added spurs with a point but no rowel and the sword of justice was drawn blessed and delivered to the king who put it into the scabbard when the archbishop of canterbury girded it about him the crown of st edward which is arched over like a cross was next brought and blessed and placed by the archbishop on the king's head when mass was over the king left the church and returned to the palace in the same state as before there was in the courtyard a fountain that constantly ran with white and red wine from various mouths the king went first to his closet and then returned to the hall to dinner at the first table sat the king at the second the five great peers of england at the third the principal citizens of london at the fourth the new created knights at the fifth all knights and squires of honour the king was served by the prince of wales who carried the sword of mercy and on the opposite side by the constable who bore the sword of justice at the bottom of the table was the earl of westmoreland with the sceptre there were only at the king's table the two archbishops and seventeen bishops when dinner was half over a knight of the name of dinoch entered the hall completely armed and mounted on a handsome steed richly barbed with crimson housings the knight was armed for wager of battle and was preceded by another knight bearing his lance he himself had his drawn sword in one hand and his naked dagger by his side the knight presented the king with a written paper the contents of which were that if any knight or gentleman should dare to maintain that king henry was not a lawful sovereign he was ready to offer him combat in the presence of the king when and where he should be pleased to appoint the king ordered this challenge to be proclaimed by heralds in six different parts of the town and the hall to which no answer was made after king henry had dined and partaken of wine and spices in the hall he retired to his private apartments and all the company went to their homes thus passed the coronation day of king henry End of section 53. This recording is in the public domain. Section 54 of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia as the narrator. Alan Mapstone as Sir John Falstaff thomas peter as prince hal and king henry v monica as host jim locke as warwick adrian stevens as chief justice todd as lancaster sarah hill as gloucester and sandra schmidt as clarence the world story volume nine 
england edited by eva march tappan section fifty four two scenes in the life of henry v by william shakespeare according to tradition henry v in his youthful days as prince hal was wild and riotous his favorite boon companion was sir john falstaff a lying heart-drinking good-tempered witty old knight when prince hal became king however the responsibility of his position sobered him and he became an able and energetic sovereign the editor one when falstaff played the king fourteen o three well thou wilt be horribly chid to-morrow when thou comes to thy father if thou love me practice an answer do thou stand for my father and examine me upon the particulars of my life shall i content this chair shall be my state this dagger my sceptre and this cushion my crown thy stage is taken for a joined stool thy golden sceptre for a leaden dagger and thy precious rich crown for a pitiful bald crown well and the fire of grace be not quite out of thee thou shalt be moved give me a cup of sack to make my eyes look red that it may be thought that i have wept for i must speak in passion and i will do it in king canvas's vein well here is my leg and here is my speech stand aside nobility oh jeez this is excellent sport i fave weep not sweet queen for trickling tears are vain oh the father how he hides his countenance for god's sake lords convey my tristful queen for tears do stop the floodgates of her eyes oh jeez he doth it as like one of these harlotry players as ever i see peace good pint pot peace good tickle brain harry i do not only marvel where thou spendest thy time but also how thou art accompanied for though the camomile the more it is trodden on the faster it grows yet youth the more it is wasted the sooner it wears that thou art my son i have partly thy mother's word partly my own opinion but chiefly a villainous trick in thine eye and a foolish hanging of thy nether lip that doth warrant me if then thou be son to me here lies the point why being son to me art thou so pointed at shall the blessed son of heaven prove a milcher and eat blackberries a question not to be asked shall the son of england prove a thief and take purses a question to be asked there is a thing harry which thou hast often heard of and it is known to many in our land by the name of pitch this pitch as ancient writers do report doth defile so doth the company thou keepest for harry now i do not speak to thee in drink but in tears not in pleasure but in passion not in words only but in woes also and yet there is a virtuous man who i have often noted in thy company but i know not his name what manner of men and it like your majesty a goodly portly man e faith and a corpulent of a cheerful look a pleasing eye and a most noble carriage and as i think his age some fifty or by our lady 
inclining to three score and now i remember me his name is falstaff if that man should be lewdly given he deceiveth me for harry i see virtue in his looks if then the tree may be known by the fruit as the fruit by the tree then peremptorily i speak it there is virtue in that false staff him keep with the rest banish and tell me now thou naughty varlet tell me where hast thou been this month dost thou speak like a king do thou stand for me and i'll play my father depose me if thou dost it half so gravely so majestically both in word and matter hang me up by my heels for a rabbit sucker or a poulter's hare well here i am set and here i stand judge my masters now harry whence come you my noble lord from east cheap the complaints i hear of thee are grievous splood my lord they are false nay i'll tickle ye for a young prince ye faith swearest thou ungracious boy henceforth ne'er look on me thou art violently carried away from grace there is a devil haunts thee in the likeness of an old fat man a ton of man is thy companion why dost thou converse with that trunk of humours that bolting hutch of beastliness that swollen parcel of dropsies that huge bombard of sack that stuffed cloak-bag of guts that roasted manning-tree ox with the pudding in his belly that reverend vice that grey iniquity that father ruffian that vanity in years wherein is he good but to taste sack and drink it wherein neat and cleanly but to carve a cape on and eat it wherein cunning but in craft wherein crafty but in villainy wherein villainous but in all things wherein worthy but in nothing i would your grace would take me with you who means your grace that villainous abominable misleader of youth falstaff that old white-bearded satan my lord the man i know i know thou dost but to say i know more harm in him than in myself were to say more than i know that he is old the more the pity his white hairs do witness it but that he is saving your reverence a whoremaster that i utterly deny if sack and sugar be a fault god help the wicked if to be old and merry be a sin then many an old host that i know is damned if to be fat be to be hated then pharaoh's lean kine are to be loved no my good lord banish pito banish bardolf <laughs> banish poins but for sweet jack falstaff kind jack falstaff true jack falstaff valiant jack falstaff and therefore more valiant being as he is old jack falstaff banish not him thy harry's company banish not him thy harry's company banish plump jack and banish all the world i do i will two when prince hal became king fourteen thirteen westminster the palace and the warwick and the lord chief justice meeting how now my lord chief justice whither away how doth the king exceeding well his cares are now all ended 
i hope not dead he's walked the way of nature and to our purposes he lives no more i would his majesty had called me with him the service that i truly did his life hath left me open to all injuries indeed i think the young king loves you not i know he doth not and do arm myself to welcome the condition of the time which cannot look more hideously upon me than i have drawn it in my fantasy enter lancaster clarence gloucester westmoreland and others here come the heavy issue of dead harry oh that the living harry had the temper of him the worst of these three gentlemen how many nobles then should hold their places that must strike sail to spirits of vile sort o oh god i fear all will be overturned good morrow cousin warwick good morrow good, good morrow, morrow cousin. cousin we meet like men that had forgot to speak we do remember but our argument is all too heavy to admit much talk well peace be with him that has made us heavy peace be with us lest we be heavier oh good my lord you have lost a friend indeed and i dare swear you borrow not that face of seeming sorrow it is sure your own though no man be assured what grace to find you stand in coldest expectation i am the sorrier would were otherwise well you must now speak sir john felt's that fair which swims against your stream of quality sweet princes what i did i did in honour led by the impartial conduct of my soul and never shall you see that i will beg a ragged and forestalled remission if truth and upright innocency fail me i'll to the king my master that is dead and tell him who hath sent me after him here comes the prince enter king henry v attended good morrow and god save your majesty this new and gorgeous garment majesty sits not so easy on me as you think brothers you mix your sadness with some fear this is the english not the turkish court not amarath and amarath exceeds but harry harry yet be sad good brothers for by my faith it very well becomes you sorrow so royally in you appears that i will deeply put the fashion on and wear it in my heart why then be sad but entertain no more of it good brothers than a joint burden laid upon us all for me by heaven i bid you be assured i'll be your father and your brother too let me but bear your love i'll bear your cares yet weep that harry is dead and so will i but harry lives that shall convert those tears by number into hours of happiness we, we hope, hope no other, other from your majesty. majesty you all look strangely on me and you most you are i think assured i love you not i am assured if i be measured rightly your majesty hath no just cause to hate me no how might a prince of my great hopes forget so great indignities you laid upon me what rate rebuke and roughly send to prison the immediate heir of england was this easy may this be washed in leith and forgotten i then did use the person of your father the image of his power lay then in me and in the administration of his law whilst i was busy for the commonwealth your highness pleased to forget my place the majesty and power of law and justice the image of the king whom i presented and struck me in my very seat of judgment whereon as an offender to your father i gave bold way to my authority and did commit you if the deed were ill be you contented wearing now the garland to have a son set your decrees at naught to pluck down justice from your awful bench to trip the course of law and blunt the sword that guards the peace and safety of your person nay more to spurn at your most royal image and mock your workings in a second body question your royal thoughts make the case yours be now the father and propose a son 
Hear your own dignity so much profaned, See your most dreadful laws so loosely slighted, Behold yourself so by a son disdained, And then imagine me taking your part, And in your power soft silencing your son, After this cold considerance sentence me, And, as you are a king, speak in your state, What I have done that misbecame my place, My person, or my liege's sovereignty. You are right, Justice, and you weigh this well. Therefore, still bear the balance in the sword, And I do wish your honours may increase, Till you do live to see a son of mine Offend you and obey you as I did. So shall I live to speak my father's words. Happy am I that have a man so bold That dares do justice on my proper son, And not less happy having such a son That would deliver up his greatness so Into the hands of justice. You did commit me, for which I do commit into your hand the unstained sword that you have used to bear, with this remembrance, that you use the same with the like bold, just, and impartial spirit as you have done against me. There is my hand. You shall be as a father to my youth. My voice shall sound as you do prompt mine ear, and I will stoop and humble mine intents to your well-practised wise directions. And, princes, all believe me, I beseech you, my father is gone wild into his grave, for in his tomb lie my affections, and with his spirit sadly I survive, to mock the expectation of the world, to frustrate prophecies, and to raise out rotten opinion, who hath written me down after my seeming. The tide of blood in me hath proudly flowed in vanity till now. Now doth it turn and ebb back to the sea where it shall mingle with the state of floods and flow henceforth in formal majesty now call we our high court of parliament and let us choose such limbs of noble counsel that the great body of our state may go in equal rank with the best governed nation that war or peace or both at once may be as things acquainted and familiar to us in which you father should have foremost hand. Our coronation done, we will recite, as I before remembered, all our state. And God consigning to my good intents, no prince, no peer shall have just cause to say, God shorten Harry's happy life one day. Exeunt. End of section 54. This recording is in the public domain. Section 55 of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 9, England. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 55. The Ballad of Agincourt. 1415 by Michael Drayton Fair stood the wind for France when we our sails advance nor now to prove our chance longer will tarry but putting to the main at Co the mouth of Seine with all his martial train landed King Harry and taking many a fort furnished in warlike sort marcheth towards agincourt in happy hour skirmishing day by day with those that stop the way where the french general lay with all his power which in his height of pride king henry to deride his ransom to provide to the king sending which he neglects the while, as from a nation vile, yet with an angry smile, their fall portending. And turning to his men, quoth our brave Harry then, though they be one to ten, be not amazed. Yet we have well begun, battles so bravely won, have ever to the sun, by fame being raised. And for myself, quoth he, 
this my full rest shall be england ne'er mourn for me nor more esteem me victor i will remain or on this earth lie slain never shall she sustain loss to redeem me poitiers and cressy tell where most their pride did swell under our swords they fell no less our skill is than when our grandsire great claiming the regal seat by many a warlike feat lopped the french lilies the duke of york so dread the eager varward led with the main harry sped among his henchmen exeter had the rear a braver man not there o oh, lord how hot they were on the false frenchman they now to fight are gone armour on armour shone drum now to drum did groan to hear was wonder that with the cries they make the very earth did shake trumpet to trumpet spake thunder to thunder well it thine age became o noble erpingham which didst the signal aim to our hid forces when from a meadow by like a storm suddenly the english archery struck the french horses with spanish yew so strong arrows a cloth yard long that like to serpents stung piercing the weather none from his fellow starts but playing manly parts and like true english hearts stuck close together when down their bows they threw and forth their bilbos drew and on the french they flew not one was tardy arms were from shoulders sent scalps to the teeth were rent down the french peasants went our men were hardy this while our noble king his broadsword brandishing down the french host did ding as to o'erwhelm it and many a deep wound lent his arms with blood besprent and many a cruel dent bruised his helmet gloucester that duke so good next of the royal blood for famous england stood with his brave brother clarence in steel so bright though but a maiden knight yet in that furious fight scarce such another warwick in blood did wade oxford the foe invade and cruel slaughter made still as they ran up suffolk his axe did ply beaumont and willoughby bear them right doughtily ferrers and fanhope upon st crispin's day fort was this noble fray which fame did not delay to england to carry o oh, when shall english men with such axe fill a pen or england breed again such a king harry end of section fifty five this recording is in the public domain Recording by Alan Mapstone in Oxford, England. Section 56 of England. Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone. Morning of the Battle of Agincourt by Sir John Gilbert. English painter, 1817 to 1897 painting page 410 on the morning of the battle of agincourt the english troops were in a pitiable condition they were weakened by illness and exhausted by the five weeks siege of harfleur food was scanty and henry was endeavouring to fall back to calais this was at best a long and dangerous march at the river somme he succeeded in going a long way around and so crossing the stream but when he came to the little village of agincourt the french were lined up against him only a quarter of a mile away 
They had three or four times his numbers, and battle could not be avoided. The English could have had little hope of success, but the result was a repetition of the story of Cressy. The French had learned little of warfare since that day, and they still encased themselves in heavy armour. Terror-stricken as they were at the tempests of yard-long arrows of the English bowmen, they fought bravely. In a final charge, they struggled to gallop their horses through the clinging muddy clay, but were thrust back by the stern English pikes. The English lost a few hundred, the French perhaps ten thousand. Sad reports went over France, for their princes and nobles, and the very flower of their chivalry, were either slain or taken prisoners. This picture shows the English forces just before the battle. At this solemn moment, when their destruction seemed imminent, the host is raised in the sight of all the army, and the soldiers bowed their heads in prayer. End of section 56. This recording is in the public domain. Section 57 of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. The World's Story, Volume 9, England. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 57. Queen Margaret and the Robber, 1463. By Agnes Strickland. Because of Henry the Sixth's periods of insanity, much responsibility of protecting his right to the crown during the Wars of the Roses fell upon his queen, Margaret of Anjou. One of her adventures is here described. The editor. In the spring of 1463, England was again set afield. At the fatal Battle of Hexham, King Henry, says Hall, was the best horseman of his company that day for he fled so fast no one could overtake him. Yet he was so closely pursued that three of his horsemen, or bodyguard, with their horses, trapped in blue velvet, were taken, one of them wearing the unfortunate monarch's cap of state called a bicocket, embroidered with two crowns of gold, and ornamented with pearls. Margaret succeeded in effecting her escape with the prince and a few of her people. They fled towards the Scotch border, taking with them as many of the crown jewels and other treasures as they could secure. Among these, as the unfortunate heroine afterwards told her cousin, the Duchess of Bourbon, were some large vessels of silver and gold, which she hoped to have carried safely into Scotland. But while thus laden, she and her company were overtaken by a party of plunderers, who robbed them of everything, and even despoiled her and the little Prince of Wales of their ornaments and rich array fatal trappings of state which being of fashion color and material rigorously forbidden by the sumptuary laws to persons of lower degree of course betrayed the rank of the royal fugitives and subjected the unfortunate queen to very barbarous treatment they dragged her she said with brutal violence and furious menaces before their leader held a drawn sword in readiness to cut her throat and threatened her with all sorts of tortures and indignities, whereupon she threw herself on her knees with clasped hands, weeping and crying aloud for mercy, and implored them by every consideration, human or divine, and for the honor of nobility, of royalty, and above all, for the sake of womanhood, to have pity on her, and not to mangle or disfigure her unfortunate body, so as to prevent it from being recognized after death. For although, continued she, I have had the ill luck to fall into your hands. I am the daughter and the wife of a king, and was in past time recognized by yourselves as your queen. Wherefore, if now you stain your hands with my blood, your cruelty will be held in abhorrence by all men throughout all ages. She accompanied these words with floods of tears, and then began to recommend herself with earnest prayers to the mercy of God. While Margaret was engaged in these agonizing supplications, some of the ruffians began to quarrel about the division of the rich booty of which they had despoiled her. 
from angry words they fell to furious fighting one with another a dreadful slaughter ensued which proved a providential diversion in favor of the royal prisoners for the men who had been preparing to put the queen to a cruel death ran to take part in the conflict in order to secure their share of the plunder and paid no further heed to her or her son margaret took advantage of their attention being thus withdrawn to address herself to a squire who was the only person remaining near her and conjured him by the passion of our lord and saviour jesus christ to have pity on her and do what he could to assist her to make her escape this squire whose heart god had touched with compassion for her distress and who was luckily provided with a horse with which he was able and willing to carry not double but threefold responded to her appeal in these encouraging words madam mount behind me and you my lord prince before and i will save you or perish in the attempt margaret and her boy promptly complied and with this direction and made off unpursued the ruffians being too much occupied in rending each other like savage beasts over their prey to observe the escape of their prisoners the scene occurred in the neighborhood of hexham forest and thither the fugitives directed their flight as offering the best facilities for concealment such was the decision of the squire who was the conductor of the party as for margaret she was in no condition to form a judgment as to what course to take for as she afterwards declared not only her brain but every nerve and vein in her whole body retained so terrible an impression of the frightful peril with which she had been menaced that when they plunged into the dark depths of the forest she fancied every tree she saw was a man with a naked sword in his hand who kept crying to her a la mort in this piteous state of excitement maternal solicitude for her boy being the master of feeling she kept repeating that it was not for herself she feared but for her son her death would be a matter of little moment but his would be too great a calamity utter ruin to every one for being the true heir of the crown all might go right again if his life could but be preserved then she again abandoned herself to paroxysms of terror for that precious child not believing it possible that they should ever get clear of the forest without falling a second time into the hands of the pitiless foes from whom they had escaped by scarcely less than a miraculous intervention of providence margaret had indeed only too much cause for alarm although the danger which appeared still present to her was over for perils no less frightful surrounded her on every side hexam forest was then a sort of dead man's ground which few travellers ventured to cross except in large parties well armed for it was the resort of the ferocious banditti of the northern marches who were the scourge and terror of both the scotch and english border and whose rapacity and cruelty had placed them out of the pale of humanity the night which succeeded a day so fatal to the cause of lancaster closed over the fugitive queen and her boy while they were wandering in the tangled mazes of hexham forest neither of them had tasted food since an early hour in the morning but the pangs of hunger and thirst were probably bravely borne by the princely child who had been early inured to hardships and disregarded by the hapless mother while clinging in her despair to that last frail plank of the foundered bark which she had labored for the past twelve years to steer through seas too stormy for a female pilot's skill to add to her distress margaret was uncertain whether the king her husband was dead or alive as they had fled in different directions while she was lamenting over the calamitous events of that disastrous day she suddenly perceived by the light of the rising moon an armed man of gigantic stature and stern aspect advancing towards her with threatening gestures at first she imagined that he belonged to the band of pitiless ruffians from whom she had fled but a second glance at his dress and equipments convinced her that he must be one of the forest outlaws of whose remorseless cruelty of two travellers she had heard many frightful instances her courage rose with the greatness of the danger and perceiving that there was no possibility of escape except through god's mercy maternal love impelled her to make an effort for the preservation of her son and she called the robber to her there is something in the tone and manner of those whose vocation is to command which generally speaking ensures the involuntary respect of attention 
but robert drew near and listened to what margaret had to say the popular version of the story is that she took the little prince by the hand and presented him to the outlaw with these words here my friend save the son of your king but if margaret's own account of this memorable passage of her life is to be credited she was not quite so abrupt in making a communication attended with such imminent danger to her son nor before she had in some degree felt her way by an eloquent impassioned appeal to the compassion of the unknown outlaw she commenced the parley by telling him that if he were in quest of booty she and her little son had already been rifled by others of all they possessed showing him that they had been despoiled even of their upper garments and had nothing now to lose but their lives yet although she supposed he was accustomed to shed the blood of travellers she was sure he would have pity on her when she told him who she was then bending her eyes upon him she pathetically added it is the unfortunate queen of england thy princess who hath fallen into thine hands in her desolation and distress and if she continued o oh man thou hast any knowledge of god i beseech thee for the sake of his passion who for our salvation took our nature on him to have compassion on my misery but if you slay me spare at least my little one for he is the only son of thy king and if it please god the true heir of this realm save him then i pray thee and make thine arms his sanctuary he is thy future king and it will be a glorious deed to preserve him one that shall efface the memory of all thy crimes and witness for thee when thou shalt stand hereafter before almighty god o man win god's grace to-day by succoring an afflicted mother and giving life to the dead then perceiving that the robber was moved by her tears and earnest supplications she put the young prince into his arms with these words i charge thee to preserve from the violence of others that innocent royal blood which i do consign to thy care take him and conceal him from those who seek his life give him a refuge in thine obscure hiding-place and he will one day give thee free access to his royal chamber and make thee one of his barons if by thy means he is happily preserved to enjoy the splendour of the crown which doth of right pertain to him as his inheritance the outlaw whose heart to use the impressive words of the royal heroine of this strange romance of history the holy ghost had softened when he understood that the afflicted lady who addressed these moving words to him was indeed the queen of the land threw himself at her feet and wept with her declaring withal that he would die a thousand deaths and endure all the tortures that could be inflicted on him rather than abandon much betray the noble child he also besought the queen to pardon all his offences against the law with no less humility than if she had borne the sceptre of sovereign authority in london and his life depended on her fiat one of margaret's french biographers affirms that this outlaw was a ruined lancastrian gentleman but this statement receives no confirmation from margaret's own account of the matter who spoke with anguish of this dire necessity which had constrained her to entrust her only child to the protection of a robber no belted knight however could have acquitted himself more nobly of the trust the unfortunate queen had confided to his honour raising the weary prince in his arms he led the way followed by the queen and the squire to his secret retreat a cave in a secluded spot on the south bank of the rapid little stream which washes the foot of black hill where the royal fugitives were refreshed and received all the comfort and attention his wife was able to bestow the local traditions of hexham and tyndale preserved a lively remembrance of this incident the robber's den which afforded shelter in their utmost need to the lancastrian queen and prince of wales is still known by the name of queen margaret's cave and seems to have been well adapted to the purpose the entrance to it is very low behind the bank of the rivulet or bourne and was formerly concealed from sight and surrounded by wild wood its dimensions are thirty-four by fourteen feet the height will barely allow a full-grown person to stand upright a massive pillar of rude masonry in the centre of the cave seems to mark the boundary of a wall which it is said once divided it into two distinct apartments then warmed and cheered by fire and lamp it would not appear quite so dismally din as at present 
such was the retreat in which the queen and prince remained perdue for two days of agonizing suspense on the third morning their host encountered sir pierre de brise and an english gentleman who having escaped the robbers at hexham had been making anxious search for her and the prince from these devoted friends margaret learned the escape of her royal husband and the terrible vengeance that had been executed on somerset and her faithful adherents the lords hungerford and ruse margaret received these tidings with floods of tears a few hours later the english gentleman by whom brise was accompanied having gone into the neighboring villages to gather tidings of public events recognized the duke of exeter and edmund beaufort the brother and successor of the unfortunate duke of somerset he conducted them to the retreat of the proscribed queen and the youthful hope of lancaster margaret's spirits revived at the sight of these princes whom she had numbered with the slain of hexham and she determined to send them to their powerful kinsman the duke of burgundy to solicit an asylum at the court of dijon for herself and the prince of wales while she once more proceeded to the court of scotland where she imagined king henry had found refuge on quitting the dwelling of the generous outlaw from whom she had received such providential succour in her dire distress she accorded all she had to bestow her grateful thanks the dukes of somerset and exeter offered a portion of their scanty supply of money as a reward to his wife for the services she had rendered to the queen but with a nobility of soul worthy of a loftier station she refused to receive any portion of that which might be so precious to them at a time of need of all i have lost exclaimed the queen i regret nothing so much as the power of recompensing such virtue accompanied by brise and the squire and attended by the outlaw of hexham in the capacity of a guide margaret and the young prince her son took the road to carlisle from whence she once more proceeded to her old quarters at kirkedbright end of section fifty seven this recording is in the public domain section fifty eight of england this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Daniel Howard Hurt of Vancouver, British Columbia, on Monday, October 28th, 2019. The World's Story, Volume 9, England, edited by Ava March Tepan. Section 58. When the King Returned from Holland, 1470, by Edward Bulwer Lytton. Henry the Sixth was thrust from the throne chiefly by the power of the kingmaker, the Earl of Warwick, and Edward the Fourth became king in his place. Edward, however, failed to be as obedient as Warwick had expected, and the mighty Earl promptly changed sides. Edward fled to Holland, but soon returned with strong forces. The editor. And the winds still blew and the storm was on the tide, and Margaret came not, when, in the gusty month of March, the fishermen of the Humber beheld a single ship, without flag or pennon, and sorely stripped and reveled by adverse blasts, gallantly struggling towards the shore. The vessel was not of English build, and resembled, in its bulk and fashion, those employed by the Easterlings in their trade half merchantman, half warship. The villagers of Raven Spur, the creek of which the vessel now rapidly made to, imagining that it was some trading craft in distress, grouped round the banks and some put out their boats. But the vessel held on its way, and, as the water was swelled by the tide and unusually deep, silently cast anchor close to shore, a quarter of a mile from the crowd. The first who leapt on land was a knight of lofty stature, and in complete armor, richly inlaid with gold arabesques. To him succeeded another, also in mail, and though well built and fair proportioned, of less imposing presence. And then, one by one, 
the womb of the dark ship gave forth a number of armed soldiers, infinitely larger than it could have been supposed to contain, till the knight who first landed stood at the center of the group of five hundred men. Then were lowered from the vessel, barbed and caparisoned some five score of horses, and finally the sailors and rowers, armed but with steel caps and short swords, came ashore, till not a man was left on board. Now praise, said the chief knight, to God and St. George, that we have escaped the water, and not with invisible winds, but with bodily foes must our war be waged. Be you, sire, cried one knight, who had debarked immediately after the speaker, and who seemed, from his bearing and equipment, of higher rank than those that followed. Be you, sire, this is a slight army to reconquer a king's realm. Pray heaven that our bold companions have also escaped the deep. Why, verily, we are not enough at the best to spare one man, said the chief knight gaily. But lo, we are not without welcomers. And he pointed to the crowd of villagers who now slowly neared the warlike group, but halted at a little distance, continued to gaze at them in some anxiety and alarm. Ho there, good fellows, cried the leader, striding towards the throng. What name give you to this village? Ravenspur, please, your worship, answered one of the peasants. Ravenspur? Hear you that, lords and friends? Except the omen. On this spot landed from exile Henry of Bolingbroke, known afterwards for in our annals as King Henry the Fourth. Bare is the soil of corn and trees. It disdains meaner fruit. It grows kings. Hark! The sound of a bugle was heard at a little distance, and in a few moments a troop of about a hundred men were seen rising above an undulation in the ground, and as the two bands recognized each other, a shout of joy was given and returned. As this new reinforcement advanced, the peasantry and fishermen, attracted by curiosity and encouraged by the peaceable demeanor of the debarkers, drew nearer and mingled with the first comers. What manner of men be ye, and what want ye? asked one of the bystanders, who seemed of better nurturing than the rest, and who indeed was a small Franklin. No answer was returned by those he more immediately addressed, but the chief knight heard the question, and suddenly, unbuckling his helmet and giving it to one of those beside him, he turned to the crowd a countenance of singular beauty, at once animated and majestic, and said in a loud voice, We are Englishmen like you, and we come here to claim our rights. Ye seem tall fellows and honest. Standard bearer, unfurl our flag. And, as the ensign suddenly displayed the device of a sun in a field azure, the chief continued, March under this banner, and for every day ye serve, ye shall have a month's hire. Mary, quoth the Franklin, with a suspicious, sinister look. These be big words. And who are you, Sir Knight, who would levy men in King Henry's kingdom? Your knees, fellows, cried the second knight. Behold your true liege and Cesarein, Edward the Fourth. Long live King Edward. The soldiers caught up the cry, and it was re-echoed lustily by the smaller detachment that now reached the spot. But no answer came from the crowd. They looked at one another in dismay, and retreated rapidly from their place amongst the troops. In fact, the whole of the neighboring district was devoted to Warwick, and many of the peasantry about had joined the former rising under Sir John Conyers. The Franklin alone retreated not with the rest. He was a bluff, plain, bold fellow, with good English blood in his veins. And when the shout ceased, he said shortly, We hereabouts know no king but King Henry. We fear you would impose upon us. We cannot believe that a great lord like him you call Edward the Fourth would land with a handful of men 
to encounter the armies of Lord Warwick. We forewarn you to get into your ship and go back as fast as ye came. For the stomach of England is sick of brawls and blows, and what ye devise is treason. Forth from the new detachment stepped a youth of small stature, not in armor and with many a weather stain on his gorgeous dress. He laid his hands upon the Franklin's shoulder. Honest and plain dealing fellow, said he, you are right. Pardon the foolish outburst of these brave men who cannot forget as yet that their chief has worn the crown. We come back not to disturb this realm, nor to effect aught against King Henry, whom the saints have favored. No, by St. Paul, we come back to claim our lands unjustly forfeit. My noble brother here is not King of England, since the people will it not. But he is Duke of York, and he will be contented if assured of the style and lands our father left him. For me, called Richard of Gloucester, I ask nothing but leave to spend my manhood where I have spent my youth, under the eyes of my renowned godfather, Richard Neville, Earl of Warwick. So report of us. Whither leads yon road? To York, said the Franklin, softened despite his judgment, by the irresistible suavity of the voice that addressed him. Thither will we go, my lord, duke, and brother, with your leave, said Prince Richard, peaceably and as petitioners. God save ye, friends and countrymen. Pray for us that King Henry and the Parliament may do us justice. We are not over-rich now, but better times may come. Largesse and filling both hands with coins from his gibsire, he tossed the bounty amongst the peasants. Mille tonnerre, what means he with this humble talk of King Henry in the Parliament, whispered Edward to the Lord Say, while the crowd scrambled for the largesse, and Richard smilingly mingled amongst them, and conferred with the Franklin. Let him alone, I pray you, my liege. I guess his wise design. And now for our ships. What orders for the master? For the other vessels, let them sail or anchor as they list. But for the bark that has borne Edward, king of England, to the land of his ancestors, there is no return. The royal adventurer then beckoned the Flemish master of the ship, who, with every sailor aboard, had debarked, and the loose dresses of the mariners made a strong contrast to the mail of the warriors with whom they mingled. Friend, said Edward in French, thou hast said that thou wilt share my fortunes, and that thy good fellows are no less free of courage and leal in trust. It is so, sire. Not a man who has gazed on thy face and heard thy voice, but longs to serve one whose brow nature has written king. And trust me, said Edward, no prince of my blood shall be dearer to me than you and yours, my friends in danger and in need. And since it be so, the ship that hath borne such hearts and such hopes should, in sooth, know no meaner freight. Is all prepared? Yes, sire, as you ordered. The train is laid for the Brennan. Up then with a fiery signal and let it tell from cliff to cliff, from town to town, that Edward the Plantagenet, once returned to England, leaves it but for the grave. The master bowed and smiled grimly. The sailors who had been prepared for the burning, arranged before between the master and the prince, and whose careless hearts Edward had thoroughly won to his person and his cause, followed the former towards the ship and stood silently grouped around the shore. The soldiers, less informed, gazed idly on, and Richard now regained Edward's side. Reflect, he said, as he drew him apart, that when on this spot landed Henry of Bolingbroke, he gave not out that he was marching to the throne of Richard II. He professed but to claim his duchy, and men were influenced by justice, till they became agents of ambition. This be your policy, 
With two thousand men, you are but Duke of York. With ten thousand men, you are King of England. In passing hither, I met with many, and sounding the temper of the district, I find it not ripe to share your hazard. The world soon ripens when it hath to hail success. O young boy's smooth face, O old man's deep brain, said Edward admiringly, what a king hadst thou made? A sudden flush passed over the prince's pale cheek, and ere it died away, a flaming torch was hurled aloft in the air. It fell whirling into the ship. A moment, and a loud crash. A moment, and a mighty blaze. Up sprung from the deck, along the rails, the sheeted fire. A giant beard of flame. It reddened the coast, the skies from far and near. It glowed on the faces and the steel of the scanty army. It was seen miles away by the warders of many a castle, manned with the troops of Lancaster. It brought the steed from the stall, the courier to the cell. It sped, as of old, the beacon fire that announced to Clytemnestra the return of the Argive king. From post to post rode the fiery news, till it reached Lord Warwick in his hall, King Henry in his palace, Elizabeth in her sanctuary. The iron step of the dauntless Edward was once more pressed upon the soil of England. End of section 58. This recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Daniel Howard Hurt of Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, on Monday, October 28th, 2019. Section 59 of England Read for LibriVox.org by Monica M.C. The Children of Edward IV By Paul de la Roche French painter, 1797 until 1856 Painting, page 430 Edward IV died in 1483, leaving a son as rightful heir to the throne. However, Richard, brother of Edward IV, who had been made protector, contrived to get possession of the child, and also of his younger brother, and to make himself king. In order to make his crown more secure, he determined to murder the two boys, and the business was put into the hands of Sir James Tyrrell. The governor of the tower where the princes were confined was ordered by letter of the king to give the keys to Sir James. The unscrupulous man chose his agents, and at midnight, when the boys were asleep, the murderers stole into their room and smoothed them with the bedclothes. Sir James came to make sure that they were dead, and ordered that their bodies should be buried at once in the courtyard. He is said to have received from the king a most extravagant reward, for this villainy, the boys are here represented in their gloomy apartment in the tower. They are trying to read, but the faces show plainly the fear that is upon them. The face of the younger manifests merely dread of something. He knows not what, but on that on the older is reflected a knowledge of the fate that must be expected. The dusk of evening is already closing about them. A few hours and they will be no more. End of section 59. This recording is in the public domain. Section 60 of England. Read for LibriVox.org. England, Part 9. The Tudor Kings. Historical Note. The most momentous result of the Wars of the Roses was the destruction of the old nobility and the great increase in the power of the crown, which grew so wealthy on the plunder of confiscated estates that Parliament could safely be ignored. This condition of affairs enabled the Tudor monarchs to turn the English sovereignty into a despotism that endured for a century. Henry the Seventh. 1485 to 1509, the first of the Tudors, strengthened his claim to the throne by marrying Elizabeth of York, daughter of Edward IV, 
and thus united the two houses of York and Lancaster. He passed many useful laws, promoted commerce and industry, and lessened the power of the nobles. He was succeeded by Henry the Eighth, fifteen o nine to fifteen forty seven, and never did prince ascend the throne under more favorable circumstances. He was eighteen years of age, handsome, accomplished, and beloved by his people. He developed, however, into a merciless tyrant, but Parliament and people submitted to the powerful Tudor will with hardly a protest. The most important event of his reign was the separation of England from the Church of Rome, a separation occasioned by the refusal of the Pope Clement the Seventh to annul his marriage with Catherine of Aragon, aunt of the Emperor Charles V of Spain. By the Act of Supremacy, passed by Parliament in 1534, the King was made the protector and only supreme head of the Church of England. Soon after the monasteries were suppressed, and their wide domains scattered among the King's favorites, creating a new aristocracy. One notable characteristic of the eighth Henry was his variability. Of his three great ministers, Wolsey, Moore, and Thomas Cromwell, the first died in disgrace, the last two were executed. Henry was six times married, to Catherine of Aragon, divorced, Anne Boleyn, beheaded, Jane Seymour, died, Anne of Cleves, divorced, Catherine Howard, beheaded, and Catherine Parr, who outlived him. End of section 60. This recording is in the public domain. Section 61 of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. The World's Story, Volume 9, England. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 61. The Impostor Who Claimed the Crown of Henry the Seventh. 1488 through 1499 by charles dickens there were several insurrections against the rule of henry and at different times two young men appeared who claimed the throne the story of one of these named perkin warbeck is told in the following selection the editor all of a sudden there appeared at cork in a vessel arriving from portugal a young man of excellent abilities a very handsome appearance and most winning manners who declared himself to be richard duke of york the second son of king edward the fourth oh said some even of these ready irish believers but surely that young prince was murdered by his uncle in the tower it is supposed so said the engaging young man and my brother was killed in that gloomy prison but i escaped it don't matter how at present and have been wandering about the world for seven long years. This explanation being quite satisfactory to numbers of the Irish people, they began again to shout and to hurrah, and to drink his health, and to make the noisy and thirsty demonstrations all over again. And the big chieftain in Dublin began to look out for another coronation, and another young king to be carried home on his back. Now, King Henry being then on bad terms with France, the French king, Charles the Eighth, saw that, by pretending to believe in the handsome young man, he could trouble his enemy sorely. So he invited him over to the French court, and appointed him a bodyguard, and treated him in all respects as if he really were the Duke of York. Peace, however, being soon concluded between the two kings, the pretended duke was turned adrift and wandered for protection to the Duchess of Burgundy. She, after feigning to inquire into the reality of his claims, declared him to be the very picture of her dear departed brother, gave him a bodyguard at her court of thirty halbert heirs, and called him by the sounding name of the White Rose of England. The leading members of the White Rose party in England sent over an agent named Sir Robert Clifford to ascertain whether the white rose's claims were good the king also sent over his agents to inquire into the rose's history the white roses declared the young man to be really the duke of york 
the king declared him to be Perkin Warbeck, the son of a merchant of the city of Tournay, who had acquired his knowledge of England, its language and manners from the English merchants who traded in Flanders. It was also stated by the royal agents that he had been in the service of Lady Brompton, the wife of an exiled English nobleman, and that the Duchess of Burgundy had caused him to be trained and taught expressly for this deception. The king then required the Archduke Philip, who was the sovereign Burgundy, to banish this new pretender, or to deliver him up. But, as the Archduke replied, that he could not control the Duchess in her own land, the king, in revenge, took the market of English cloth away from Antwerp, and prevented all commercial intercourse between the two countries. He also, by arts and bribes, prevailed on Sir Robert Clifford to betray his employers, and he, denouncing several famous English noblemen as being secretly the friends of Perkin Warbeck, the king had three of the foremost executed at once. Whether he pardoned the remainder because they were poor, I do not know, but it is only too probable that he refused to pardon one famous nobleman, against whom the same Clifford soon afterwards informed separately, because he was rich. This was no other than Sir William Stanley, who had saved the king's life at the Battle of Bosworth Field. It is very doubtful whether his treason amounted to much more than his having said that, if he were sure the young man was the Duke of York, he would not take arms against him. Whatever he had done in, he admitted, like an honorable spirit, and he lost his head for it, and the covetous king gained all his wealth. Perkin Warbeck kept quiet for three years, but as the Flemings began to complain heavily of the loss of their trade by the stoppage of the Antwerp market on his account, and as it was not unlikely that they might even go so far as to take his life or give him up, he found it necessary to do something. Accordingly, he made a desperate sally and landed, with only a few hundred men, on the coast of Deal. But he was soon glad to get back to the place from whence he came, for the country people rose against his followers, killed a great many, and took a hundred and fifty prisoners, who were all driven to London, tied together with ropes like a team of cattle. Every one of them was hanged on some part or other of the seashore, in order that if any more men should come over with Perkin Warbeck, they might see the bodies as a warning before they landed. Then the wary king, by making a treaty of commerce with the Flemings, drove Perkin Warbeck out of the country, and by completely gaining over the Irish to his side, deprived him of that asylum too. He wandered away to Scotland and told his story at that court. King James the Fourth of Scotland, who was no friend to King Henry, and had no reason to be, for King Henry had bribed his Scotch lords to betray him more than once, but had never succeeded in his plots, gave him a great reception, called him his cousin, and gave him in marriage the Lady Catherine Gordon, a beautiful and charming creature related to the royal house of Stuart. Alarmed by the successful reappearance of the pretender, the king still undermined, and bought, and bribed, and kept his doings, and Perkin Warbeck's story in the dark, when he might, one would imagine, have rendered the matter clear to all England. But, for all of this bribing of the Scotch lords at the Scotch king's court, he could not procure the pretender to be delivered up to him. James, though not very particular in many respects, would not betray him, and the ever-busy Duchess of Burgundy so provided him with arms, and good soldiers, and with money besides, that he had soon a little army of fifteen hundred men of various nations. With these, and aided by the Scottish king in person, he crossed the border into England, and made a proclamation to the people, in which he called the king Henry Tudor, offered large rewards to any who should take or distress him, and announced himself King Richard the Fourth, come to receive the homage of his faithful subjects. His faithful subjects, however, cared nothing for him, and hated his faithful troops, who, being of different nations, quarreled also among themselves. Worse than this, if worse were possible, they began to plunder the country, upon which the White Rose said that he would rather lose his rights than gain them through the miseries of the English people. The Scottish king made a jest of his scruples, but they and their whole forts went back again without fighting a battle. The worst consequence of this attempt was that a rising took place among the people of Cornwall, who considered themselves too heavily taxed to meet the charges of the expected war. 
stimulated by Flamock, a lawyer, and Joseph, a blacksmith, and joined by Lord Audley and some other country gentlemen, they marched on all the way to Detford Bridge, where they fought a battle with the king's army. They were defeated, though the Cornishmen fought with great bravery, and the lord was beheaded, and the lawyer and the blacksmith were hanged, drawn, and quartered. The rest were pardoned. The king, who believed every man to be as avaricious as himself, and thought that money could settle anything, allowed them to make bargains for their liberty with the soldiers who had taken them. Perkin Warbeck, doomed to wander up and down, and never to find rest anywhere, a sad fate, almost a sufficient punishment for an imposture, which he seems in time to have believed himself, lost his Scottish refuge, through a truce being made between the two kings, and found himself once more without a country before him in which he could lay his head. But James, always honorable and true to him, alike when he melted down his plate, and even the great gold chain he had been used to wear, to pay soldiers in his cause, and now, when that cause was lost and hopeless, did not conclude the treaty until he had safely departed out of the Scottish dominions. He and his beautiful wife, who was faithful to him under all reverses, and left her state and home to follow his poor fortunes, were put aboard ship with everything necessary for their comfort and protection, and sailed for Ireland. But the Irish people had had enough of counterfeit earls of, of Warwick and Dukes of York for one while, and would give the White Rose no aid. So the White Rose, encircled by thorns indeed, resolved to go with his beautiful wife to Cornwall as a forlorn resource, and see what might be made of the Cornishmen, who had risen so valiantly a little while before, and who had fought so bravely at Deptford Bridge. To Whitson Bay, in Cornwall, accordingly, came Perkin Warbeck and his wife, and the lovely lady he shut up for safety in the castle of St. Michael's Mont, and then marched into Devonshire at the head of three thousand Cornishmen. These were increased to six thousand by the time of his arrival in Exeter. But there the people made a stout resistance, and he went on to Taunton, where he came in sight of the king's army. The stout Cornishmen, although they were few in number and badly armed, were so bold that they never thought of retreating, but bravely looked forward to a battle on the morrow. Unhappily for them, the man who was possessed of so many engaging qualities, and who attracted so many people to his side when he had nothing else with which to tempt them, was not as brave as they. In the night when the two armies lay opposite to each other, he mounted a swift horse and fled. When morning dawned, the poor confiding Cornishmen, discovering that they had no leader, surrendered to the king's power. Some of them were hanged, and the rest were pardoned, and went miserably home. Before the king pursued Perkin Warbeck to the sanctuary of Bolo, in the New Forest, where it was soon known that he had taken refuge, he sent a body of horsemen to St. Michael's Mount to seize his wife. She was soon taken and brought as a captive before the king. But she was so beautiful and so good and so devoted to the man in whom she believed that the king regarded her with compassion, treated her with great respect, and placed her at court, near the queen's person. And many years after, Perkin Warbeck was no more. And when his strange story had become like a nursery tale, she was called the White Rose by the people in remembrance of her beauty. The sanctuary at Bolia was soon surrounded by the king's men, and the king, pursuing his usual dark artful ways, sent pretended friends to Perkin Warbeck to persuade him to come out and surrender himself. This he soon did, the king having taken a good look at the man of whom he had heard so much from behind a screen, directed him to be well mounted and to ride behind him at a little distance, guarded but not bound in any way. So they entered London with the king's favorite show a procession, and some of the people hooted as the pretender rode slowly through the streets to the tower, but the greater part were quiet, and very curious to see him. From the tower he was taken to the palace at Westminster, and there lodged like a gentleman, though closely watched. He was examined every now and then as to his imposture, but the king was so secret in all he did that even then he gave it a consequence which it cannot be supposed to have in itself deserved. At last, Perkin Warbeck ran away, and took refuge in another sanctuary near Richmond in Surrey. From this he was again persuaded to deliver himself up, and being conveyed to London, he stood in the stocks for a whole day outside Westminster Hall, and there read a paper purporting to be his full confession, and relating his history as the king's agents had originally described it. 
he was then shut up in the tower again, in the company of the Earl of Warwick, who had now been there for fourteen years, ever since his removal out of Yorkshire, except when the king had had him at court, and had shown him to the people to prove the imposture of the baker's boy. It is but too probable, when we consider the crafty character of Henry the Seventh, that these two were brought together for a cruel purpose. A plot was soon discovered between them and the keepers, to murder the governor, get possession of the keys, and proclaim Perkin Warbeck as King Richard the Fourth. That there was some such plot is likely. That they were tempted into it is at least as likely. That the unfortunate Earl of Warwick, last male of the Plantagenet line, was too in use to the world, and too ignorant and simple to know much about it. Whatever it was is perfectly certain, and that it was the king's interest to get rid of him is no less so. He was beheaded on Tower Hill, and Perkin Warbeck was hanged at Tyburn. End of section 61. This recording is in the public domain. Section 62 of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 9, England, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 62. The Funeral of Elizabeth of York, Wife of Henry the Seventh, 1503, by Agnes Strickland. When the news of Elizabeth's decease spread through the city, the utmost sorrow was manifested among all ranks of her subjects. The bells of St. Paul's tolled dismally, and were answered by those of every church and religious house in the metropolis or its neighborhood. Meantime, the queen was embalmed at the tower. For this purpose were allowed sixty ells of Holland cloth, ell broad, likewise gums, balms, spices, sweet wine, and wax, with which, being seared, the king's plumber clothed her in lead, with an epitaph likewise in lead, showing who and what she was. The whole was chested in boards, covered with black velvet, with a cross of white damask. The day after the queen's demise, Sunday, February the twelfth, her corpse was removed from the chamber where she died, to the chapel within the tower, under the steps of which then reposed, unknown to all, the bodies of the queen's two murdered brothers, Edward V and Richard, Duke of York. Far different was the order of their sister's royal obsequies to that dark and silent hour when the trembling old priest, who had belonged to this very chapel, raised the princely victims from their unconsecrated lair and deposited them secretly within its hallowed verge. Could the ladies and officers of arms, who watched around the corpse of their royal mistress in St. Mary's Chapel within the tower, during the long nights which preceded her funeral, have known how near was the mysterious resting place of her murdered brothers, many a glance of alarm would have fathomed the beautiful arches, and many a start of terror would have told when the wintry wind from the Thames waved the black draperies which hung around. The tower chapel was on this occasion what the French call a chapelle ardente. The windows were railed about with burning lights, and a lighted hearse stood in the choir of the chapel. In this hearse was deposited the royal corpse, which was carried by persons of the highest rank, with a canopy borne over it by four knights, followed by Lady Elizabeth Stafford and all the maids of honour, and the Queen's household, two and two, dressed in their plainest gowns, or, according to another journal, in the saddest and simplest attire they had, with threaded handkerchiefs hanging down and tied under their chins. The Princess Catherine, led by her brother-in-law, the Earl of Soray, then entered the chapel, and took her place at the head of the corpse. A true mourner was she, for she had lost her best friend and only protectess. When mass was done and offerings made, the princess retired. During the watch of the night, an officer at arms said in a loud voice, 
a paternoster for the soul of the queen at every kiri eleison, and an oremus before the collect. On the twelfth day after the queen's death, mass was said in the chapel early in the morning. Then the corpse was put in a carriage covered with black velvet, with a cross of white cloth of gold, very well fringed, and an image exactly representing the queen was placed in a chair above in her rich robes of state, her very rich crown on her head, her hair about her shoulders, her sceptre in her right hand, her fingers well garnished with rings and precious stones, and on every end of the chair sat a gentlewoman, usher kneeling on the coffin, which was in this manner drawn by six horses, trapped with black velvet, from the tower to Westminster. On the four horses rode two chariotmen, and on the four others four henchmen in black gowns. On the horses were lozenges with the queen's escutcheons. By every horse walked a person in a mourning hood. At each corner of the chair was a banner of Our Lady of the Assumption, of the Salutation, and of the Nativity, to show the queen died in childbed. Next, eight palfreys saddled with black velvet, bearing eight ladies of honour, who rode singly after the corpse in their slops and mantles. Every horse led by a man on foot, bareheaded, but in a morning gown, followed by many lords. The Lord Mayor and citizens, all in mourning, brought up the rear, and at every door in the city a person stood bearing a torch. In Fenchurch and Cheapside were stationed groups of thirty-seven virgins, the number corresponding with the Queen's age, all dressed in white, wearing chaplets of white and green, and bearing lighted tapers. From Mark Lane to Temple Bar alone were five thousand torches, besides lights burning before all the parish churches, while processions of religious persons singing anthems and bearing crosses met the royal corpse from every fraternity in the city. The Earl of Derby, the Queen's old friend, led a procession of nobles who met the funeral at Temple Bar. The abbots of Westminster and Bermondsey, in black copes and bearing censers, met and sends the corpse, and then proceeded it to the churchyard of St. Margaret, Westminster. Here the body was removed from the car and carried into the abbey. It was placed on a grand hearse streaming with banners and bannerals, and covered with a close of majesty, the valance fringed and wrought with the queen's motto, humble and reverent, and garnished with her arms. All the ladies and lords in attendance retired to the queen's great chamber in Westminster Palace to supper. In the night, ladies, squires, and heralds watched the body in the abbey. The next morning, the remains of Elizabeth were committed to the grave, her sister Catherine attended as chief mourner. The queen's ladies offered thirty-seven poles, first kissing them, and then laying them on the body. Four of these poles were presented by her sisters, who were all present as mourners. A funeral sermon was preached by Fitzjames, Bishop of Rochester, from the text in Job, Miseremini mei, miseremini mei, saltem vos amici mei, Quia manus domini te tigit me. Footnote. Have pity, have pity on me, my friends, for the hand of God has touched me. End footnote. These words, he said, he spake in the name of England, on account of the great loss the country had sustained of that virtuous queen, her noble son, the Prince Arthur, and the Archbishop of Canterbury. The poles were then removed from the coffin, the queen's effigy placed on St. Edward's shrine, and the ladies quitted the abbey. The prelates, with the king's chaplains, approached the hearse, and the grave was hallowed by the Bishop of London. After the usual rites, the body was placed in it. End of section 62section 63 of england this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by april 6090 california united states of america the world's story 
Volume 9, England, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 63. The Field of the Cloth of Gold, 1520, by Gustav Mason. Henry the Eighth of England was a powerful king, and both the German emperor, Charles V, and the French sovereign, Francis I, were anxious to secure his influence and aid. In May 1420, Charles went to England to visit Henry, and Francis invited Henry to visit him during the following month. Calais was then in the hands of England, and the meeting of the two kings was held on a plain between the English castle and one belonging to the French. The dress and entertainment were so magnificent that this plain was afterwards called the Field of the Cloth of Gold. The Editor The courtiers who attended the two sovereigns felt bound to almost rival them in sumptuousness. Insomuch, says the contemporary Martin du Bellay, that many bore thither their mills, their forests, and their meadows on their backs. Henry the Eighth had employed eleven hundred workmen, the most skillful of Flanders and Holland, in building a quadrangular palace of wood, one hundred and twenty-eight feet long every way. On one side of the entrance gate was a fountain, covered with gilding, and surmounted by a statue of Bacchus, round which there flowed through subterranean pipes all sorts of wines, and which bore in letters of gold the inscription, Make good cheer who will and on the other side a column supported by four lions was surmounted by a statue of cupid armed with bow and arrows opposite the palace was erected a huge figure of a savage wearing the arms of his race with this inscription chosen by henry the eighth he who my back wins the frontage was covered outside with canvas painted to represent freestone and the inside was hung with rich tapestries Francis I, emollious of equaling his royal neighbor in magnificence, had ordered to be erected close to Ardres, an immense tent, upheld in the middle by a colossal pole, firmly fixed in the ground, and with pegs and cordage all around it. Outside the tent, in the shape of a dome, was covered with cloth of gold, and inside it represented a sphere with a ground of blue velvet and studded with stars like the firmament. At each angle of the large tent, there was a small one equally richly decorated. But before the two sovereigns exchanged visits, in the midst of all these magnificent preparations, there arose a violent hurricane, which tore up the pegs and split the cordage of the French tent, scattered them over the ground, and forced Francis I to take up his quarters in an old castle near Ardres, when the two king's chief counsellors, Cardinal Woolsey on one side, and Admiral Bonnevy on the other, had regulated the formalities on the 7th of June, 1520. Francis I and Henry VIII set out on their way at the same hour and at the same pace for their meeting in the Valley of Ardres, where a tent had been prepared for them. As they drew near, some slight anxiety was manifested by the escort of the King of England, amongst whom a belief prevailed that that of the king of France was more numerous, but it was soon perceived to be nothing of the sort. The two kings, mounted upon fine horses and superbly dressed, advanced toward each other, and Henry the Eighth's horse stumbled, which his servants did not like. The two kings saluted each other with easy grace, exchanged embraces without getting off their horses, dismounted and proceeded arm in arm to the tent where Wolsey and Bonnevet were awaiting them. My dear brother and cousin, immediately said Francis with his easy grace, I am come a long way and not without trouble to see you in person. I hope that you hold me for such as I am, ready to give you aid with the kingdoms and lordships that are in my power. Henry, with a somewhat cold reserve, replied, It is not your kingdoms or your diverse possessions that I regard but the soundness and the loyal observance of the promises set down in the treaties between you and me. My eyes never beheld a prince who could be dear to my heart, and I have crossed the seas at the extreme boundary of my kingdom to come and see you. The two kings entered the tent and signed a treaty, whereby the Dauphin of France was to marry Princess Mary, only daughter at that time of Henry the Eighth. 
to whom francis i undertook to pay annually a sum of one hundred thousand livres two million eight hundred thousand francs or one hundred and twelve thousand pound in the money of our day until the marriage was celebrated which would not be for some time yet as the english princess was only four years old the two kings took wine together according to custom and reciprocally presented the members of their courts the same francis the french king says henry the eighth's favorite chronicler edward hall who was there is a goodly prince stately of countenance merry of chair brone colored great eyes high nose big lipped fair breasted and shoulders small legs and long fet titian's portrait gives a loftier and more agreeable idea of francis i when the two kings proceeded to sign in their tent the treaty they had just concluded the king of england according to florange's memoirs himself took up the articles and began to read them when he had read those relating to the king of france who was to have the priority and came to speak of himself he got as far as i henry king he would have said of france and england but he left out the title as far as france was concerned and said to king francis i will not put it in as you are here for i should lie and he said only i henry king of england but as monsieur minette very properly says if he omitted the title in his reading he left it in the treaty itself and shortly afterwards was ambitious to render it a reality when he invaded france and wished to reign over it after the diplomatic stipulations were concluded the royal meeting was prolonged for sixteen days which were employed in tourneys jousts and all manner of festivals the personal communication of the two kings was regulated with all the precautions of official mistrust and restraint and when the king of england went to ards to see the queen of france the king of france had to go to guines to see the queen of england for the two kings were hostages for one another the king of france who was not a suspicious man says florange's was mighty vexed at there being so little confidence in one another he got up one morning very early which is not his habit took two gentlemen and a page the first three he could find mounted his horse and went to visit the king of england at the castle of guines when he came on to, to the castle bridge all the english were mighty astonished as he rode amongst them the king gaily called upon them to surrender to him and asked them the way to the chamber of the king his brother the which was pointed out to him by the governor of guines who said to him sir he is not awake but king francis passed on all the same went up to the said chamber knocked at the door awoke the king of england and walked in never was man more dumbfounded than king henry who said to king francis brother you have done me a better turn than ever man did to another and you show me the great trust i ought to have in you i yield myself your prisoner from this moment and i proffer you my parole he undid from his neck a collar worth fifteen thousand angels and begged the king of france to take it and wear it that very day for his prisoner's sake and lo the king who wished to do him in the same turn had brought with him a bracelet which was worth more than thirty thousand angels and begged him to wear it for his sake which thing he did and the king of france put what had been given him on his neck thereupon the king of england was minded to get up and the king of france said that he should have no other chamber attendant but himself and he warmed his shirt and handed it to him when he was up the king of france made up his mind to go back notwithstanding that the king of england would have kept him to dinner but inasmuch as there was to be jousting after dinner he mounted his horse and went back to ardors he met a many good folk who were coming to meet him amongst the rest l'adventurer a name given to florangis himself who said to him my dear master you are mad to have done what you have done i am very glad to see you back here and devil take him who counselled you whereupon the king said that never a soul had counselled him and that he knew well that there was not a soul in his kingdom who would have so counselled him and then he began to tell what he had done at the said guines and so returned conversing to ardors for it was not far then began the jousts which lasted a week and were wondrous fine both a foot and a horseback 
after all these pastimes the king of france and the king of england retired to a pavilion where they drank together and there the king of england took the king of france by the collar and said to him brother i should like to wrestle with you and gave him a feint or two and the king of france who is a mighty good wrestler gave him a turn and threw him on the ground and the king of england would have had yet another trial but all that was broken off and it was time to go to supper after this they had yet three or four jousts and banquets and then they took leave of one another with the greatest possible peace between the princes and princesses that done the king of england returned to guines and the king of france to france and it was not without giving great gifts at parting one to another End of section sixty three this recording is in the public domain Section sixty four of England read for LibriVox org by Alan Mapstone Cardinal Wolsey going in procession by Sir John Gilbert English painter eighteen seventeen to eighteen ninety seven painting page four hundred and fifty cardinal wolsey devoted himself for many years to carrying out every wish of his master henry the eighth as a reward wolsey was made archbishop and then lord chancellor and finally cardinal he lived in a beautiful palace with the richest of carpets and silken tapestries it is said that he had five hundred servants and that some of them wore heavy chains of gold and garments of satin and velvet as if they were noblemen cavendish thus describes the cardinals going forth from his house he would issue out to them apparelled all in red in the habit of a cardinal with a tippet of sable about his neck holding in his hand a very fair orange whereof the meat or substance within was taken out and filled up again with the part of a sponge wherein was vinegar or other confections against the pestilent airs the which he commonly smelt when passing among the press or else when he was pestered by many suitors then his gentlemen ushers cried out and said o oh, my lords and masters on before make way for my lord's grace and thus he passed down from his chamber through the hall in the illustration two churchmen precede the cardinal bearing crosses while behind them walks a noble carrying the cardinal's hat all about are poor people kneeling to present petitions for one thing or another one of them a guard is trying to restrain but she knows well the kindness of the great man to the poor and she pays no heed to the hand on her shoulder at the left is borne the pillar of silver which typifies the cardinal's position as a pillar of the church end of section sixty four this recording is in the public domain Section 65 of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia as the narrator, Jim Locke as Wolsey, and Alan Mapstone as Thomas Cromwell. The World Story, Volume 9, England. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 65. The Fall of Cardinal Wolsey, 1529, by William Shakespeare. When Henry VIII became bent upon annulling his marriage with Catherine and taking Anne Bullen for his queen, he demanded that his minister, Cardinal Wolsey, should win permission from the Pope. This was impossible, and the great minister fell into disgrace. He was deprived of wealth and office, and only his death prevented his being executed as a traitor. The Editor farewell a long farewell to all my greatness this is the state of man to-day he puts forth the tender leaves of hopes to-morrow blossoms and bears his blushing honours thick upon him the third day comes a frost 
a killing frost and when he thinks good easy man full surely his greatness is a ripening nips his root and then he falls as i do i have ventured like little wanton boys that swim on bladders this many summers in a sea of glory but far beyond my depth my high-blown pride at length broke under me and now has left me weary and old with service to the mercy of a rude stream that must for ever hide me vain pomp and glory of this world i hate ye i feel my heart new opened oh how wretched is that poor man that hangs on princes favours there is betwixt that smile we would aspire to that sweet aspect of princes and their ruin more pangs and fears than wars or women have and when he falls he falls like lucifer never to hope again and the cromwell and stands amazed why how now cromwell i have no power to speak sir what amazed at my misfortunes can thy spirit wonder a great man should decline nay and you weep i am fallen indeed how does your grace why well never so truly happy my good cromwell i know myself now and i feel within me a peace above all earthly dignities a still and quiet conscience the king has cured me i humbly thank his grace and from these shoulders these ruined pillars out of pity taken a load would sink a navy too much honour oh tis a burden cromwell tis a burden too heavy for a man that hopes for heaven i'm glad your grace has made the right use of it i hope i have i am able now methinks out of a fortitude of soul i feel to endure more miseries and greater far than my weak-hearted enemies dare offer what news abroad the heaviest and the worst is your displeasure with the king god bless him the next is that sir thomas more is chosen lord chancellor in your place that's somewhat sudden but he's a learned man may he continue long in his highness favour and do justice for truth's sake and his conscience that his bones when he has run his course and sleeps in blessings may have a tomb of orphans tears wept on him what more that cranmer is returned with welcome installed lord archbishop of canterbury that's news indeed last that the lady anne whom the king hath in secrecy long married this day was viewed in open as his queen going to chapel and the voice is now only about her coronation there was the weight that pulled me down o oh, cromwell the king is gone beyond me all my glories in that one woman i have lost for ever no son shall ever usher forth mine honours or gild again the noble troops that waited upon my smiles go get thee from me cromwell i am a poor fallen man unworthy now to be thy lord and master seek the king that sun i pray may never set i have told him what and how true thou art he will advance thee some little memory of me will stir him i know his noble nature not to let thy hopeful service perish too good cromwell neglect him not make use now and provide for thine own future safety o oh, my lord must i then leave you must i needs forego so good so noble 
and so true a master bear witness all that have not arts of iron with what sorrow cromwell leaves his lord the king shall have my service but my prayers for ever and for ever shall be yours cromwell i did not think to shed a tear in all my miseries but thou hast forced me out of thy honest truth to play the woman let's dry our eyes and thus far hear me cromwell and when i am forgotten as i shall be and sleep in dull cold marble where no mention of me more must be heard of say i taught thee say wolsey that once trod the ways of glory and sounded all the depths and shoals of honour found thee a way out of his wreck to rise in a sure and safe one though thy master missed it mark but my fall and that that ruined me cromwell i charge thee fling away ambition by that sin fell the angels how can man then the image of his maker hope to win by it love thyself last cherish those hearts that hate thee corruption wins not more than honesty still in thy right hand carry gentle peace to silence envious tongues be just and fear not let all the ends thou aim'st at be thy country's thy gods and truths then if thou fall'st o cromwell thou fall'st a blessed martyr serve the king and prithee lead me in there take an inventory of all i have to the last penny tis the king's my robe and my integrity to heaven is all i dare now call mine own o oh, cromwell cromwell had i but served my god with half the zeal i served my king he would not in mine age have left me naked to mine enemies end of section sixty five this recording is in the public domain Section 66 of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. The World's Story, Volume 9, England. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 66. The Trial of Sir Thomas More, 1535, by Anne Manning Rathbone sir thomas more who had succeeded wolsey as chancellor did not approve of henry's separation from the catholic church and refused to acknowledge him as the head of the church in england for this he was brought to trial on the charge of treason the following selection is taken from the supposed journal of more's daughter the editor july first by reason of wills minding to be present at the trial which for the concourse of spectators demanded his early attendance he committed the care of may with bess to dancy who got us places to see father on his way from the tower to westminster hall we could not come at him for the crowd but clambered on a bench to gaze our very hearts away after him as he went by sallow thin gray-haired yet in mien not a whit cast down wrapped in a coarse woolen gown and leaning on a staff which unwanted support when bess marked she hid her eyes on my shoulder and wept sore but soon looked up again though her eyes were so blinded i think she could not see him his face was calm but grave as he came up but just as he passed he caught the eye of some one in the crowd and smiled in his old frank way then glanced up towards the window with the bright look he hath so oft cast to me at my casement but saw us not i could not help crying father but he heard me not perchance twas so best i would not have had his face cloud at the sight of poor bessie's tears will tells me the indictment was the longest ever heard on four counts first his opinion on the king's marriage second his writing sundry letters to the bishop of rochester counselling him to hold out third refusing to acknowledge his grace's supremacy fourth his positive denial of it and thereby willing to deprive the king of his dignity and title 
When the reading of this was over, the Lord Chancellor saith, You see how grievously you have offended the King his grace, but, and yet, he is so merciful, as that if ye will lay aside your obstinacy and change your opinion, we hope ye may yet obtain pardon. Father makes answer, and at the sound of his dear voice all men hold their breaths. Most noble lords, I have great cause to thank your honours for this your courtesy, but I pray Almighty God I may continue in the mind I am in, through his grace, until death. They could not make good their accusation against him. T'was only on the last count he could be made out a traitor, and proof of it they had none. How could they have? He should have been acquitted out of hand. Stead of which his bitter enemy, my Lord Chancellor, called on him for his defence. Will saith there was a general murmur or sigh ran through the court. Father, however, answered the bidding by beginning to express his hope that the effect of long imprisonment might not have been such upon his mind and body as to impair his power of rightly meeting all the charges against him. When, turning faint with long standing, he staggered and loosed hold of his staff, whereon he was accorded a seat. Twas but a moment's weakness of the body, and he then proceeded frankly to avow his having always opposed the king's marriage to his grace himself, which he was so far from thinking high treason, that he should rather have deemed it treachery to have withholden his opinion from his sovereign king, when solicited by him for his counsel. His letters to the good bishop he proved to have been harmless. Touching his declining to give his opinion when asked, concerning the supremacy, he alleged there could be no transgression in holding his peace thereon, God only being cognizant of our thoughts. Nay, interposeth the Attorney General, your silence was the token of a malicious mind. I had always understood, answers father, that silence stood for consent. Qui tacet consentiri videtur, which made sundry smile. On the last charge, he protested he had never spoken word against the law unto any man. The jury are about to acquit him, when up starts the Solicitor General, offers himself as witness for the Crown, is sworn, and gives evidence of his dialogue with Father in the Tower, falsely adding, like a liar as he is, that on his saying, no Parliament could make a law that God should not be God, Father had enjoined, no more could they make the King supreme head of the Church. I marvel the ground opened not at his feet. Father briskly made answer, if I were a man, my lords, who regarded not an oath, ye know well I needed not stand now at this bar. And if the oath which you, Mr. Rich, have just taken be true, then I pray I may never see God in the face. In good truth, Mr. Rich, I am more sorry for your perjury than my peril. You and I once dwelt long together in one parish. Your manner of life and conversation from your youth up were familiar to me, and it paineth me to tell ye were ever held very light of your tongue, a great dicer and gamester, and not of any commendable fame, either there or in the temple, the inn to which ye have belonged. Is it credible, therefore, to your lordships, that the secrets of my conscience touching the oath, which I never would reveal after the statute once made, either to the king's grace himself, nor to any of you, my honourable lords, I should have thus lightly blurted out in private parley with Mr. Rich? In short, the villain made not good his point. Nevertheless, the issue of this black day was aforehand fixed. My lord Audley was primed with a virulent and venomous speech. The jury retired, and presently returned with a verdict of guilty, for they knew what the king's grace would have him do in that case. Up starts my lord Audley, commences pronouncing judgment, when, My lord, says father, in my time, the custom in these cases was ever to ask the prisoner before sentence whether he could give any reason why judgment should not proceed against him. My lord, in some confusion, puts the question. And then came the frightful sentence. Yes, yes, my soul, I know. There were saints of old sawn asunder, men of whom the world was not worthy. Then he spake unto them his mind, and bade his judges and accusers farewell hoping that like as St. Paul was present and consenting unto St. Stephen's death, and yet both were now holy saints in heaven, so he and they might speedily meet there, joint heirs of everlasting salvation. Meantime, poor Bess and Cecily, spent with grief and long waiting, were forced to be carried home by Heron, or ever father returned to his prison. 
was less feeling or more strength of body enabled me to bide at the tower wharf with Dancy. God knoweth. They brought him back by water. My poor sisters must have passed him. The first thing I saw was the axe, turned with its edge towards him, my first note of his sentence. I forced my way through the crowd. Someone laid a cold hand on mine arm. Twas poor Pattison, so changed I hardly knew him, with a rosary of gooseberries he kept running through his fingers. He saith, Bide your time, Mistress Meg. When he comes past, I'll make a passage for ye. Oh, brother, brother, what ailed thee to refuse the oath? I've taken it. In another moment, now, mistress, now, and flinging his arms right and left, made a breach, through which I darted, fearless of bills and halberds, and did cast mine arms about father's neck. He cries, My Meg, and hugs me to him as though our very souls should grow together. He saith, Bless thee, bless thee. Enough, enough, my child. What mean ye to weep and break mine heart? Remember, though I die innocent, tis not without the will of God, who could have turned mine enemy's hearts if t'were best. Therefore possess your soul in patience. Kiss them all for me, thus and thus. So gave me back into Dancy's arms, the guards about him all weeping, but I could not lose sight of him forever. So after a minute's pause did make a second rush, break away from Dancy, clave to father again, and again they had pity on me, and made pause while I hung upon his neck. This time there were large drops standing on his dear brow, and the big tears were swelling into his eyes. He whispered, Meg, for Christ's sake, don't unman me. Thou'lt not deny my last request. I said, Oh, no, and at once loosened mine arms. God's blessing be with you, he saith with a last kiss. I could not help crying, My father, my father. The chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof he vehemently whispers, pointing upwards with so passionate a regard that I look up, almost expecting a beatific vision. And when I turn about again, he's gone. And I have no more sense nor life till I find myself again in my own chamber, my sisters chafing my hands. July 5th. All's over now. They've done their worst, and yet I live. There were women could stand beneath the cross. The Maccabees' mother. Yes, my soul, yes, I know, naught but unpardoned sin, the chariot of Israel. Sixth, Dr. Clement hath been with us, saith he went up as blithe as a bridegroom to be clothed upon with immortality. Rupert stood it all out, perfect love casteth out fear, so did his. Seventeenth, my most precious treasure is this dear billet, writ with a coal, the last thing he set his hand to, wherein he saith, I never liked your manner towards me better than when you kissed me last. Nineteenth. They have let us bury his poor mangled trunk, but as sure as there's a sun in heaven, I'll have his head before another sun hath risen too. Footnote. It was the custom to expose on London Bridge the heads of those who had been executed for treason. End of footnote. If wise men won't speed me, I'll e'en content me with a fool. I do think men, for the most part, be cowards in their hearts, moral cowards. Here and there we find one like Father, and like Socrates, and like this one and that one, I mind not their names just now, but in the main, methinketh they lack the moral courage of women. Maybe I'm unjust to em just now, being crossed. July 20th. I lay down, but my heart was waking. Soon after the first cock crew, I heard a pebble cast against my lattice, knew the signal, rose, dressed, stole softly down and let myself out. I knew the touch of the poor fool's fingers, his teeth were chattering, twixt cold and fear, yet he laughed beneath his breath as he caught my arm and dragged me after him, whispering, Fool and fair lady will cheat him yet. At the stairs lay a whirry with a couple of boatmen, and one of them, stepping up to me, cries, Alas for Ruth, Mistress Meg, what is it you do? Art mad to go on this errand? I said, I shall be mad if I go not, and succeed, too. Put me in and push off. We went down the river quietly enough. At length reached London Bridge stairs. Pattison, starting up, says, Bide ye all as ye are, and springs a land, and runneth up to the bridge. Anon returns, and saith, Now, mistress, all's ready. Readier than you wist. Come up quickly, for the coast's clear. Hobson, for twas he, helps me forth, saying, God speed ye, mistress, and I dared I would go with ye. Thought I, there be others in that case. 
nor looked I up till aneath the bridge gate, when casting upward a fearsome look, I beheld the dark outline of the ghastly yet precious relic, and falling into a tremor, did wring my hands and exclaim, Alas, alas, that head hath lain full many a time in my lap. Would God, would God it lay there now? When, a sudden, I saw the pole tremble and sway towards me, and stretching forth my apron, I did, in an ecstasy of gladness, pity, and horror, catch its burthen as it fell. Pattison, shuddering, yet grinning, cries under his breath, Managed I not well, mistress? Let's speed away with our theft, for fools and their treasures are soon parted. But I think not they'll follow hard after us neither, for there are well-wishers to us on the bridge. I'll put ye in the boat, and then say, God speed ye, lady, with your burthen. End of section 66. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Section 67 of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. The World's Story, Volume 9, England. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 67. The Appeal of Anne Askew, 1546, by Louisa Mulebach, Clara M. Munt. Even after declaring himself supreme head of the church in England, Henry the Eighth still claimed to be a Catholic, and retained the title of Defender of the Faith, which the Pope had given him in his earlier years. The result of this peculiar condition of things was that if a man was a Protestant and agreed with Luther, he might be burned as a heretic, while if he was a Roman Catholic and acknowledged the Pope as the head of the church, he might be beheaded as a traitor. In the story from which the following scene is taken, Anne Askew, maid of honor to the queen, has burst into the royal presence to beg for mercy for several persons who are about to suffer death by fire. The Editor Mercy, repeated the king. Mercy, and for whom? Who are they that they are putting to death down there? Tell me, forsooth, my lord bishops, who are they that are led to the stake today? Who are the condemned? They are heretics who devote themselves to this new false doctrine which has come over to us from Germany, and who dare refuse to recognize the spiritual supremacy of our Lord and King, said Bishop Gardiner. They are Roman Catholics who regard the Pope of Rome as the chief shepherd of the Church of Christ, and will regard nobody but him as their Lord, said Bishop Cranmer. Ah, behold this young maiden accuses us of injustice, cried the King, and yet... You say that not heretics alone are executed down there, but also Romanists. It appears to me, then, that we have justly and impartially, as always, punished only criminals, and given over the guilty to justice. Oh, had you seen what I have seen, said Anne Askew, shuddering, then would you collect all your vital energies for a single cry, for a single word, mercy, and that word would you shout out loud enough to reach yon frightful place of torture and horror. "'What saw you, then?' asked the king, smiling. Anne Askew had stood up, and her tall, slender form now lifted itself like a lily between the sombre forms of the bishops. Her eye was fixed and glaring. Her noble and delicate features bore the expression of horror and dread. "'I saw,' said she, "'a woman whom they were leading to execution. Not a criminal, but a noble lady, whose proud and lofty heart never harbored a thought of treason or disloyalty,' but who, true to her faith and her convictions, would not forswear the God whom she served. As she passed through the crowd, it seemed as if a halo encompassed her head and covered her white hair with silvery rays. All bowed before her, and the hardest natures wept over the unfortunate woman who had lived more than seventy years, and yet was not allowed to die in her bed, but was to be slaughtered to the glory of God and the, the king. But she smiled, and graciously saluting the weeping and sobbing multitude, she advanced to the scaffold as if she were ascending a throne to receive the homage of her people. Two years of imprisonment had blanched her cheek, but had not been able to destroy the fire of her eye or the strength of her mind, and seventy years had not bowed her neck or broken her spirit. Proud and firm, she mounted the steps of the scaffold, and once more saluted the people, and cried aloud, I will pray to God for you. But as the headsman approached and demanded that she should allow her hands to be bound, and that she should kneel in order to lay her head upon the block, 
She refused and angrily pushed him away. Only traitors and criminals lay their heads on the block, exclaimed she with a loud, thundering voice. There is no occasion for me to do so, and I will not submit to your bloody laws as long as there is a breath in me. Take, then, my life if you can. And now began a scene which filled the hearts of the lookers-on with fear and horror. The countess flew like a hunted beast round and round the scaffold. Her white hair streamed in the wind. Her black grave clothes rustled around her like a dark cloud, and behind her, with uplifted axe, came the headsman, in his fiery red dress, he ever endeavouring to strike her with the falling axe, but she ever trying, by moving her head to and fro, to evade the descending stroke. But at length her resistance became weaker. The blows of the axe reached her and stained her white hair, hanging loose about her shoulders with crimson streaks. With a heart-rending cry, she fell, fainting. Near her, exhausted also, sank down the headsman, bathed in sweat. This horrible, wild chase had lamed his arm and broken his strength. Panting and breathless, he was not able to drag this fainting, bleeding woman to the block, or to lift up the axe to separate her noble head from the body. The crowd shrieked with distress and horror, imploring and begging for mercy, and even the Lord Chief Justice could not refrain from tears, and he ordered the cruel work to be suspended until the Countess and the headsman should have regained strength. For a living, not a dying person was to be executed, thus said the law. They made a pallet for the countess on the scaffold and endeavored to restore her. Invigorating wine was supplied to the headsman to renew his strength for the work of death, and the crowd turned to the stakes which were prepared on both sides of the scaffold, and at which four other martyrs were to be burnt. But I flew here like a hunted doe, and now, king, I lie at your feet. There is still time." Pardon, King, pardon for the Countess of Somerset, the last of the Plantagenets. Pardon, sire, pardon, repeated Catherine Parr, weeping and trembling, as she clung to her husband's side. Pardon, repeated Archbishop Cranmer, and a few of the courtiers re-echoed it in a timid and anxious whisper. The King's large, brilliant eyes glanced around the whole assembly with a quick, penetrating look. And you, my Lord Bishop Gardiner, asked he in a cold, sarcastic tone, Will you also ask for mercy, like all these weak-hearted souls here? The Lord our God is a jealous God, said Gardiner solemnly, and it is written that God will punish the sinner unto the third and fourth generation. And what is written shall stand true, exclaimed the king in a voice of thunder. No mercy for evildoers, no pity for criminals. The axe must fall upon the head of the guilty. The flames shall consume the bodies of the criminals. Sire, Think of your high vocation, exclaimed Anne Askew in a tone of enthusiasm. Reflect what a glorious name you have assumed to yourself in this land. You call yourself the head of the church, and you want to rule and govern upon earth in God's stead. Exercise mercy, then, for you entitle yourself king by the grace of God. No, I do not call myself king by God's grace. I call myself king by God's wrath, exclaimed Henry as he raised his arm menacingly. It is my duty to send sinners to God. May he have mercy on them there above, if he will. I am the punishing judge, and I judge mercilessly, according to the law, without compassion. Let those whom I have condemned appeal to God, and may he have mercy upon them. I cannot do it, nor will I. Kings are here to punish, and they are like to God, not in his love, but in his avenging wrath. Woe, then, woe to you and to all of us, exclaimed Anne Askew. Woe to you, King Henry, if what you now say is the truth. Then are they right, these men who are bound to yonder stakes, when they brand you with the name of tyrant. Then is the Bishop of Rome right when he upbraids you as an apostate and degenerate son, and hurls his anathemas against you. Then you know not God, who is love and mercy. Then you are no disciple of the Savior, who is said, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you. Woe to you, King Henry, if matters are really so bad with you, if— Silence, unhappy woman, silence, exclaimed Catherine, and as she vehemently pushed away the furious girl, she grasped the king's hand and pressed it to her lips. Sire, whispered she with intense earnestness, Sire, you told me just now that you love me. Prove it by pardoning this maiden and having consideration for her impassioned excitement. Prove it by allowing me to lead Anne Askew to her room and enjoin silence upon her. 
but at this moment the king was wholly inaccessible to any other feelings than those of anger and delight in blood. He indignantly repelled Catherine, and without moving his sharp penetrating look from the young maiden, he said in a quick hollow tone, Let her alone, let her speak, let no one dare to interrupt her. Catherine, trembling with anxiety and inwardly hurt at the harsh manner of the king, retired with a sigh to the embrasure of one of the windows. Anne Askew had not noticed what was going on about her. She remained in that state of exultation which cares for no consequences, and which trembles before no danger. She would at this moment have gone to the stake with cheerful alacrity, and she almost longed for this blessed martyrdom. "'Speak, Anne Askew, speak,' commanded the king. "'Tell me, do you know what the countess, for whose pardon you are beseeching me, has done? Know you why those four men are sent to the stake?' I do know, King Henry, by the wrath of God, said the maiden with burning passionateness. I know why you have sent the noble countess to the slaughterhouse, and why you exercise no mercy toward her. She is of noble, of royal blood, and Cardinal Pole is her son. You would punish the son through the mother, and because you cannot throttle the cardinal, you murder his mother. Oh, you are a very knowing child, cried the king, with an inhuman, ironical laugh. You know my most secret thoughts and my most hidden feelings. Without doubt, you are a good papist, since the death of the popish countess fills you with such heart-rending grief. Then you must confess, at the least, that it is right to burn the four heretics. Heretics! exclaimed Anne enthusiastically. Call you heretics, these noble men, who go gladly and boldly to death for their convictions and their faith? King Henry! King Henry, woe to you if these men are condemned as heretics. They alone are the faithful. They are the true servants of God. They have freed themselves from human supremacy. And as you would not recognize the Pope, so they will not recognize you as head of the church. God alone, they say, is Lord of the church and master of their consciences. And who can be presumptuous enough to call them criminals? I, exclaimed Henry the Eighth in a powerful tone, I dare do it. I say that they are heretics, and that I will destroy them, will tread them all beneath my feet, all of them, all who think as they do. I say that I will shed the blood of these criminals, and prepare for them torments at which human nature will shudder and quake. God will manifest himself by me in fire and blood. He has put the sword into my hand, and I will wield it for his glory. Like St. George, I will tread the dragon of heresy beneath my feet." and haughtily raising his crimsoned face and rolling his great bloodshot eyes wildly around the circle, he continued, Hear this, all of you who are here assembled. No mercy for heretics, no pardon for papists. It is I, I alone, whom the Lord our God has chosen and blessed as his hangman and executioner. I am the high priest of his church, and he who dares deny me denies God and he who is so presumptuous as to do reverence to any other head of the church is a priest of Baal, and kneels to an idolatrous image. Kneel down, all of you, before me, and reverence in me God, whose earthly representative I am, and who reveals himself through me in his fearful and exalted majesty. Kneel down, for I am sole head of the church and high priest of our God. And as if at one blow all knees bent, all those haughty cavaliers, those ladies sparkling with jewels and gold. Even the two bishops and the queen fell upon the ground. The king gazed for a moment on this sight, and with radiant looks and a smile of triumph, his eyes ran over this assembly, consisting of the noblest of his kingdom, humbled before him. Suddenly they were fastened on Anne Askew. She alone had not bent her knee, but stood in the midst of the kneelers, proud and upright as the king himself. A dark cloud passed over the king's countenance. "'You obey not my command?' asked he. She shook her curly head and fixed on him a steady, piercing look. "'No,' said she. "'Like those over yonder whose last death groan we even now hear, like them I say, to God alone is honor due, and he alone is lord of his church. If you wish me to bend my knee before you as my king, I will do it. But I bow not to you as the head of the holy church.' A murmur of surprise flew through the assembly, and every eye was turned with fear and amazement on this bold young girl, who confronted the king with a countenance smiling and glowing with enthusiasm. 
At a sign from Henry, the kneelers arose and awaited in breathless silence the terrible scene that was coming. A pause ensued. King Henry himself was struggling for breath and needed a moment to collect himself. Not as though wrath and passion had deprived him of speech. He was neither wrathful nor passionate, and it was only joy that obstructed his breathing. The joy of having again found a victim with which he might satisfy his desire for blood, on whose agony he might feast his eyes, whose dying sigh he might greedily inhale. The king was never more cheerful than when he had signed a death warrant, for then he was in full enjoyment of his greatness as lord over the lives and deaths of millions of other men, and this feeling made him proud and happy, and fully conscious of his exalted position. Hence, as he now turned to Anne Askew, his countenance was calm and serene, and his voice friendly, almost tender. Anne Askew, said he, do you know that the words you have now spoken make you guilty of high treason? I know it, sire. And you know what punishment awaits traitors. Death, I know it. Death by fire, said the king, with perfect calmness and composure. A hollow murmur ran through the assembly. Only one voice dared give utterance to the word mercy. It was Catherine, the king's consort, who spoke this one word. She stepped forward and was about to rush to the king and once more implore his mercy and pity, but she felt herself gently held back. Archbishop Cranmer stood near her, regarding her with a serious and beseeching look. Compose yourself, compose yourself, murmured he. You cannot save her, she is lost. Think of yourself and of the pure and holy religion whose protectress you are. Preserve yourself for your church and your companions in the faith. And must she die? asked Catherine, whose eyes filled with tears as she looked toward the poor young child, who was confronting the king with such a beautiful and innocent smile. Perhaps we may still save her, but this is not the moment for it. Any opposition now would only irritate the king the more, and he might cause the girl to be instantly thrown into the flames of the fires still burning yonder. So let us be silent. Yes, silence, murmured Catherine with a shudder as she withdrew again to the embrasure of the window. "'Death by fire awaits you, Anne Askew,' repeated the king. "'No mercy for the traitress who vilifies and scoffs at her king.'" End of section 67 This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Colleen McMahon Section 68 of England, read for LibriVox.org England Part 10 From Edward the Sixth to the Death of Mary Historical Note According to the will of Henry the Eighth, his son Edward was to succeed to the throne, and after him Edward's half sisters, first Mary, then Elizabeth. Edward, fifteen forty seven to fifteen fifty three, died at the age of sixteen. Before his death he had been persuaded by the protector, the Duke of Northumberland, that he had as good a right to bequeath the crown as his father had had, and that, in order to continue the Protestant power in the land, he ought to leave it to Lady Jane Grey, great-granddaughter of Henry the Seventh, who was a Protestant and who had married the protector's son. This Edward did. The result was that for twelve days Lady Jane Grey was queen. Then Mary got possession of her father's throne, and not only Northumberland, but also Lady Jane and her husband were executed. Mary, the daughter of Catherine of Aragon, was a Catholic, and when she came to the throne, the laws against the power of the Pope in England were repealed, and those for the burning of people whose religious belief differed from that of the sovereign were revived. The whole land was eager that Mary should marry but especially that she should choose an Englishman for her husband, but she had set her heart upon her cousin Philip of Spain. She was determined to marry him, and this she did. To please Philip, Mary took part in a war between Spain and France. In this war she lost Calais, the one possession which England still held in France. "'When I die,' declared the Queen, "'Calais will be found written on my heart.' Her reign ended in 1558, and Elizabeth, daughter of Anne Boleyn, ascended the throne. 
End of section 68. This recording is in the public domain. Section 69 of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. The World's Story, Volume 9, England. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 69. The Execution of the Twelve Days, Queen, 1554. By William Harrison Ainsworth. Monday, the 12th of February, 1554. The fatal day destined to terminate Jane's earthly sufferings, at length arrived. Excepting a couple of hours, which she was allowed to rest, at the urgent entreaty of her companion, she had passed the whole of the night in prayer. Angela kept watch over the lovely sleeper, and the effect produced by the contemplation of her features during this her last slumber was never afterwards effaced. The repose of an infant could not be more calm and holy. A celestial smile irradiated her countenance. Her lips moved as if in prayer. And if good angels ever permitted to visit the dreams of those they love on earth, they hovered that night over the couch of Jane. Thinking it cruelty to disturb her from such a blissful state, Angela let an hour pass beyond the appointed time. But observing a change come over her countenance, seeing her bosom heave, and tears gather beneath her eyelashes, she touched her, and Jane instantly arose. "'Is it four o'clock?' she inquired. "'It has just struck five, madam,' replied Angela. "'I have disobeyed you for the first and last time. But you seemed so happy.' that I could not find it in my heart to waken you. I was happy, replied Jane, for I dreamed that all was over, without pain to me, and that my soul was born to regions of celestial bliss by a troop of angels who had hovered above the scaffold. It will be so, madam, replied Angela fervently. You will quit this earth immediately for heaven, where you will rejoin your husband in everlasting happiness. I trust so, replied Jane in an altered tone. But in that blessed place, I searched in vain for him. Angela, you let me sleep too long, or not long enough. Your pardon, dearest madam, cried the other fearfully. Nay, you have given me no offense, returned Jane kindly. What I meant was that I had not time to find my husband. Oh, you will find him, dearest madam, returned Angela. Doubt it not. Your prayers would wash out his offenses, even if his own could not. I trust so, replied Jane, and I will now pray for him. And do you pray too? Jane then retired to the recess, and in the gloom, for it was yet dark, continued her devotions until the clock struck seven. She then arose, and assisted by Angela, attired herself with great care. I pay more attention to the decoration of my body. Now I am about to part with it, she observed. Then I would do it if it was to serve me longer. So joyful is the occasion to me that were I to consult my own feelings, I would put on my richest apparel to indicate my contentment of heart. I will not, however, so brave my fate, but array myself in these weeds. And she put on a gown of black velvet, without ornament of any kind, tying around her slender throat, so soon, alas, to be severed. A simple white falling collar. Her hair was left purposely unbraided and was confined by a call of black velvet. As Angela performed those sad services, she sobbed audibly. Nay, cheer thee, child, observed Jane. When I was clothed in the robes of royalty and had the crown placed upon my brow, nay, when arrayed on my wedding day, I felt not half so joyful as now. Ah, madam! exclaimed Angela, in a paroxysm of grief. My condition is more pitiable than yours. You go to certain happiness, but I lose you. Only for a while, dear Angela, returned Jane. Comfort yourself with that thought. Let my fate be a warning to you. Be not dazzled by ambition. Had I not once yielded, I had never thus perished. Discharge your duty strictly to your eternal and your temporal rulers and rest assured, we shall meet again, never to part. 
your counsel shall be graven on my heart madam returned angela and oh may my end be as happy as yours heaven grant it ejaculated jane fervently and now she added as her toilet was ended i am ready to die will you not take some refreshment madam asked angela no replied jane i have done with the body the morning was damp and dark a thaw came on a little before daybreak and a drizzling shower of rain fell this was succeeded by a thick mist and the whole of the fortress was for a while enveloped in vapour it brought to jane's mind the day on which she was taken to trial but a moral gloom likewise overspread the fortress every one within it save her few enemies and they were few indeed lamented jane's approaching fate her youth her innocence her piety touched the sternest breast and moved the pity even of her persecutors all felt that morning as if some dire calamity was at hand and instead of looking forward to the execution as an exciting spectacle for so such revolting exhibitions were then considered they wished it over many a prayer was breathed for the speedy release of the sufferer many a sigh heaved many a groan uttered and if ever soul was wafted to heaven by the fervent wishes of those on earth jane's was so it was late before there were any signs of stir and bustle within the fortress even the soldiers gathered together reluctantly and those who conversed spoke in whispers dudley who it has been stated was imprisoned in the beauchamp tower had passed the greater part of the night in devotion but towards morning he became restless and uneasy and unable to compose himself resorted to the customary employment of captives in such cases and with a nail which he found carved his wife's name in two places on the walls of his prison these inscriptions still remain at nine o'clock the bell of the chapel began to toll and an escort of halberdiers and arquebusiers drew up before the beauchamp tower while sir thomas bridges and feckman entered the chamber of the prisoner who received them with an unmoved countenance before you set out upon a journey from which you will never return my lord said feckenham i would ask you for the last time if any change has taken place in your religious sentiments and whether you are yet alive to the welfare of your soul why not promise me pardon if i will recant on the scaffold and silence me as you silenced the duke my father by the axe replied dudley sternly no sir i will have naught to do with your false and idolatrous creed i shall die a firm believer in the gospel and trust to be saved by it then perish body and soul replied feckenham harshly sir thomas bridges i commit him to your hands am i allowed no parting with my wife demanded dudley anxiously you have parted with her forever heretic and unbeliever rejoined feckenham that speech will haunt your deathbed sir retorted dudley sternly and he turned to the lieutenant and signified that he was ready the first object that met dudley's gaze as he issued from his prison was the scaffold on the green he looked at it for a moment wistfully it is for lady jane observed the lieutenant i know it replied dudley in a voice of intense emotion i thank you for letting me die first you must thank the queen my lord returned bridges it was her order shall you see my wife sir demanded dudley anxiously the lieutenant answered in the affirmative tell her i will be with her on the scaffold said dudley as he was about to set forward a young man pushed through the lines of halberdiers and threw himself at his feet it was chol mondile dudley instantly raised and embraced him at least i see one whom i love he cried my lord this interruption must not be observed the lieutenant if you do not retire he added to chalmondole i shall place you in arrest farewell my dear lord cried the weeping esquire farewell farewell for ever said dudley as chalmondole was forced back by the guard the escort then moved forward and the lieutenant accompanied the prisoner to the gateway of the middle tower where he delivered him to the sheriffs and their officers who were waiting there for him with a franciscan friar and then returned to fulfil his more painful duty a vast crowd was collected on tower hill and the strongest commiseration was expressed for dudley as he was led to the scaffold on which magour 
had already taken his, his station. On quitting the Beauchamp Tower, Feckenham proceeded to Jane's prison. He found her on her knees, but she immediately arose. Is it time? she asked. It is, madam, to repent, replied Feckenham sternly. A few minutes are all that now remain to you of life. Nay, at this moment, perhaps, your husband is called before his eternal judge. There is yet time. Do not perish like him in your sins. Heaven have mercy upon him, cried Jane, falling on her knees. And notwithstanding the importunities of the confessor, she continued in fervent prayer till the appearance of Sir Thomas Bridges. She instantly understood why he came and rising prepared for departure almost blinded by tears angela rendered her the last services she required this done the lieutenant who was likewise greatly affected begged some slight remembrance of her i have nothing to give you but this book of prayers sir she answered but you shall have that when i have done with it and may it profit you you will receive it only to cast it into the flames my son remarked feckenham on the contrary, I shall treasure it like a priceless gem, replied Bridges. You will find a prayer written in, in my own hand, said Jane, and again I say, may it profit you. Bridges then passed through the door, and Jane followed him. A band of halberdiers were without. At the sight of her, a deep and general sympathy was manifested. Not an eye was dry, and tears trickled down cheeks unaccustomed to such moisture. The melancholy train proceeded at a slow pace. Jane fixed her eyes upon the prayer book, which she read aloud to drown the importunities of the confessor, who walked on her right, while Angela kept near her on the other side, and so they reached the green. By this time the fog had cleared off, and the rain had ceased, but the atmosphere was humid, and the day lowering and gloomy. Very few spectators were assembled, for it required firm nerves to witness such a tragedy. A flock of carrion crows and ravens, attracted by their fearful instinct, wheeled around overhead, or settled on the branches of the bare and leafless trees, and by their croaking added to the dismal character of the scene. The bell continued tolling all the time. The sole person upon the scaffold was Wolfeet. He was occupied in scattering straw near the block. Among the bystanders was Seracald, leaning on his staff, and as Jane for a moment raised her eyes as she passed along, she perceived Roger Asham. Her old preceptor had obeyed her, and she repaid him with a look of gratitude. By the lieutenant's directions, she was conducted for a short time into the Beauchamp Tower, and here Feckenham continued his persecutions, until a deep groan arose among those without, and an officer abruptly entered the room. Madam, said Sir Thomas Bridges, after the newcomer had delivered his message, we must set forth. Jane made a motion of assent, and the party issued from the Beauchamp Tower, in front of which a band of halberdiers was drawn up. A wide open space was kept clear around the scaffold. Jane seemed unconscious of all that was passing, preceded by the lieutenant, who took his way toward the north of the scaffold, and attended on either side by Feckenham and Angela as before. She kept her eyes steadily fixed on her prayer book, arrived within a short distance of the fatal spot, she was startled by a scream from Angela, and looking up beheld four soldiers carrying a litter covered with a cloth, and advancing toward her. She knew it was the body of her husband, and unprepared for so terrible an encounter, uttered a cry of horror. The bearers of the litter passed on, and entered the porch of the chapel. While this took place, Mauger, who had limped back as fast as he could after his bloody work on Tower Hill, only tearing a moment to exchange his axe, ascended the steps of the scaffold and ordered Wolfit to get down. Sir Thomas Bridges, who was greatly shocked at what had just occurred, and would have prevented it if it had been possible, returned to Jane and offered her his assistance, but she did not require it. The force of the shock had passed away, and she firmly mounted the scaffold. When she was seen there, a groan of compassion arose from the spectators, and prayers were audibly uttered. She then advanced to the rail, and in a clear, distinct voice spoke as follows. I pray you all to bear me witness that I die a true Christian woman, and that I look to be saved by no other means except the mercy of God, and the merits of the blood of his only Son, Jesus Christ. I confess, when I knew the word of God, I neglected it, and loved myself and the world. And therefore this punishment, 
is a just return for my sins. But I thank God of his goodness, that he has given me a time and respite to repent. And now, good people, while I'm alive, I pray you assist me with your prayers. Many fervent responses followed, and several of the bystanders imitated Jane's example. As, on the conclusion of her speech, she fell on her knees and recited the miserere. At its close, Feckenham said in a loud voice, I ask you, madam, for the last time, will you repent? I pray you, sir, to desist, replied Jane meekly. I am now at peace with all the world and would die so. She then arose and giving the prayer book to Angela said, when all is over, deliver this to the lieutenant. These, she said, taking off her gloves and collar, I give to you. And to me, cried Mauger, advancing and prostrating himself before her according to custom. You give grace. And also my head, replied Jane. I forgive thee heartily, fellow. Thou art my best friend. What ails you, madam? remarked the lieutenant, observing Jane suddenly start and tremble. Not much, she replied, but I thought I saw my husband pale and bleeding. Where? demanded the lieutenant, recalling Dudley's speech. There, near the block, replied Jane. I see the figure still, but it must be mere fantasy. Whatever his thoughts were, the lieutenant made no reply, and Jane turned to Angela, who now began, with trembling hands, to remove her attire, and was trying to take off her velvet robe, when Mauger offered to assist her, but was instantly repulsed. He then withdrew, and stationing himself by the block, assumed his hideous black mask, and shouldered his axe. Partially disrobed, Jane bowed her head, while Angela tied a kerchief over her eyes, and turned her long tresses over her head to be out of the way. Unable to control herself, she then turned aside and wept aloud. Jane moved forward in search of the block, but fearful of making a false step, felt for it with her hands, and cried, what shall I do? Where is it? Where is it? Sir Thomas Bridges took her hand and guided her to it. At this awful moment, there was a slight movement in the crowd, some of whom pressed nearer the scaffold, and amongst others, Sorokold and Wolfett. The latter caught hold of the boards to obtain a better view. Angela placed her hands before her eyes and would have suspended her being, if she could, and even Feckenham veiled his countenance with his robe. Sir Thomas Bridges gazed firmly on. By this time, Jane had placed her head on the block, and her last words were, Lord, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And the axe then fell, and one of the fairest and wisest heads that ever sat on human shoulders fell likewise. End of section 69. This recording is in the public domain.